Chapter Twenty Five of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. The intercourse of the two families was at this period more nearly restored to what it had been in the autumn than any member of the old intimacy had thought ever likely to be again. The return of Henry Crawford and the arrival of William Price had much to do with it, but much was still owing to Sir Thomas's more than toleration of the neighbourly attempts at the parsonage. His mind, now disengaged from the cares which had pressed on him at first, was at leisure to find the Grants and their young inmates really worth visiting. And though infinitely above scheming or contriving for any the most advantageous matrimonial establishment that could be among the apparent possibilities of any one most dear to him, and disdaining even as a littleness the being quick-sighted on such points, he could not avoid perceiving in a grand and careless way that Mr. Crawford was somewhat distinguishing his niece, nor perhaps refrain, though unconsciously, from giving a more willing assent to invitations on that account. His readiness, however, in agreeing to dine at the parsonage, when the general invitation was at last hazarded, after many debates and many doubts as to whether it were worth while, because Sir Thomas seemed so ill-inclined, and Lady Bertram was so indolent, proceeded from good breeding and good will alone, and had nothing to do with Mr. Crawford but as being one in an agreeable group. For it was in the course of that very visit that he first began to think that any one in the habit of such idle observations would have thought that Mr. Crawford was the admirer of Fanny Price. The meeting was generally felt to be a pleasant one, being composed in a good proportion of those who would talk and those who would listen, and the dinner itself was elegant and plentiful, according to the usual style of the Grants, and too much according to the usual habits of all, to raise any emotion except in Mrs. Norris, who could never behold either the wide table or the number of dishes on it with patience, and who did always contrive to experience some evil from the passing of the servants behind her chair, and to bring away some fresh conviction of its being impossible among so many dishes, but that some must be cold. In the evening it was found, according to the predetermination of Mrs. Grant and her sister, that after making up the whist-table, there would remain sufficient for a round game, and everybody being as perfectly complying and without a choice as on such occasions they always are, speculation was decided on, almost as soon as whist, and Lady Bertram soon found herself in the critical situation of being applied to for her own choice between the games, and being required either to draw a card for whist or not. She hesitated. Luckily Sir Thomas was at hand. "'What shall I do, Sir Thomas? Whist and speculation! Which will amuse me most?' Sir Thomas, after a moment's thought, recommended speculation. He was a whist-player himself, and perhaps might feel that it would not much amuse him to have her for a partner. "'Very well,' was her ladyship's contented answer. "'Then speculation, if you please, Mrs. Grant. I know nothing about it, but Fanny must teach me.' Here Fanny interposed, however, with anxious protestations of her own equal ignorance. She had never played the game, nor seen it played in her life. And Lady Bertram felt a moment's indecision again. But upon everybody's assuring her that nothing could be so easy, that it was the easiest game on the cards, and Henry Crawford stepping forward with a most earnest request to be allowed to sit between her ladyship and Miss Price, and teach them both, it was so settled and Sir Thomas, Mrs. Norris, and Dr. and Mrs. Grant, being seated at the table of prime intellectual state and dignity, the remaining six, under Miss Crawford's direction, were arranged round the other. It was a fine arrangement for Henry Crawford, who was close to Fanny, and with his hands full of business, having two persons' cards to manage as well as his own, for though it was impossible for Fanny not to feel herself mistress of the rules of the game in three minutes, he had yet to inspirit her play, sharpen her avarice, and harden her heart, which, especially in any competition with William, was a work of some difficulty, and as for Lady Bertram he must continue in charge of all her fame and fortune through the whole evening, and if quick enough to keep her from looking at her cards when the deal began, must direct her in whatever was to be done with them to the end of it. He was in high spirits, doing everything with happy ease, and pre-eminent in all the lively turns, quick resources, and playful impudence that could do honour to the game and the round-table was altogether a very comfortable contrast to the steady sobriety and orderly silence of the other. Twice had Sir Thomas inquired into the enjoyment and success of his lady, but in vain. No pause was long enough for the time his measured manner needed, and very little of her state could be known till Mrs. Grant was able, at the end of the first rubber, to go to her and pay her compliments. 
I hope your ladyship is pleased with the game. Oh, dear, yes, very entertaining indeed. A very odd game. I do not know what it is all about. I am never to see my cards, and Mr. Crawford does all the rest. Bertram, said Crawford some time afterwards, taking the opportunity of a little languor in the game, I have never told you what happened to me yesterday in my ride home. They had been hunting together, and were in the midst of a good run, and at some distance from Mansfield, when his horse being found to have flung a shoe, Henry Crawford had been obliged to give up, and make the best of his way back. I told you I lost my way after passing that old farmhouse, with the yew-trees, because I can never bear to ask, but I have not told you, that with my usual luck, for I never do wrong without gaining by it, I found myself in due time in the very place which I had a curiosity to see. I was suddenly, upon turning the corner of a steepish downy field, in the midst of a retired little village between gently rising hills, a small stream before me to be forded, a church standing on a sort of knoll to my right, which church was strikingly large and handsome for the place, and not a gentleman or half a gentleman's house to be seen excepting one, to be presumed the parsonage, within a stone's throw of the said knoll and church. I found myself, in short, in Thornton Lacey. "'It sounds like it,' said Edmund. "'But which way did you turn after passing Sewell's farm?' "'I answer no such irrelevant and insidious questions. Though were I to answer all that you could put in the course of an hour, you would never be able to prove that it was not Thornton Lacey, for such it certainly was.' "'You inquired, then?' "'No, I never inquire. But I told a man mending a hedge that it was Thornton Lacey, and he agreed to it.' "'You have a good memory. I had forgotten having ever told you half so much of the place.' Thornton Lacey was the name of his impending living, as Miss Crawford well knew, and her interest in a negotiation for William Price's knave increased. "'Well,' continued Edmund, "'and how did you like what you saw?' "'Very much indeed. You are a lucky fellow. There will be work for five summers at least before the place is livable.' "'No, no, not so bad as that. The farmyard must be moved, I grant you, but I am not aware of anything else.' The house is by no means bad, and when the yard is removed, there may be a very tolerable approach to it. The farmyard must be cleared away entirely, and planted up to shut out the blacksmith's shop. The house must be turned to front the east instead of the north. The entrance and principal rooms, I mean, must be on that side, where the view is really very pretty. I am sure it may be done. And there must be your approach, through what is at present the garden. You must make you a new garden at what is now the back of the house, which will be giving it the best aspect in the world sloping to the south-east. The ground seems precisely formed for it. I rode fifty yards up the lane between the church and the house, in order to look about me, and saw how it might all be. Nothing can be easier. The meadows beyond what will be the garden, as well as what now is, sweeping round from the lane I stood in to the north-east, that is, to the principal road through the village, must be all laid together, of course. Very pretty meadows they are, finely sprinkled with timber. They belong to the living, I suppose. If not, you must purchase them." Then the stream—something must be done with the stream, but I could not quite determine what. I had two or three ideas." "'And I have two or three ideas also,' said Edmund. "'And one of them is that very little of your plan for Thornton Lacey will ever be put into practice. I must be satisfied with rather less ornament and beauty. I think the house and premises may be made comfortable, and given the air of a gentleman's residence without any very heavy expense, and that must suffice me. And I hope may suffice all who care about me." Miss Crawford, a little suspicious and resentful of a certain tone of voice, and a certain half-look, attending the last expression of his hope, made a hasty finish of her dealings with William Price, and securing his knave at an exorbitant rate, exclaimed, "'There! I will stake my last like a woman of spirit. No cold prudence for me. I am not born to sit still and do nothing. If I lose the game it shall not be from not striving for it.' The game was hers, and only did not pay her for what she had given to secure it. Another deal proceeded, and Crawford began again about Thornton Lacey. "'My plan may not be the best possible. I had not many minutes to form it. But you must do a good deal. The place deserves it, and you will find yourself not satisfied with much less than it is capable of. Excuse me, your ladyship must not see your cards. There, let them lie just before you. The place deserves it, Bertram. You talk of giving it the air of a gentleman's residence. That will be done by the removal of the farmyard, for, independent of that terrible nuisance, I never saw a house of the kind which had in itself so much the air of a gentleman's residence, so much the look of a something above a mere parsonage-house, above the expenditure of a few hundreds a year. 
It is not a scrambling collection of low, single rooms, with as many roofs as windows. It is not cramped into the vulgar compactness of a square farmhouse. It is a solid-walled, roomy, mansion-like looking house, such as one might suppose a respectable old country family had lived in from generation to generation, through two centuries at least, and were now spending from two to three thousand a year in. Miss Crawford listened, and Edmund agreed to this. The air of a gentleman's residence, therefore, you cannot but give it, if you do anything. But it is capable of much more. Let me see, Mary. Lady Bertram bids a dozen for that queen. No, no, a dozen is more than it is worth. Lady Bertram does not bid a dozen. She will have nothing to say to it. Go on, go on. By some such improvements as I have suggested, I do not really require you to proceed upon my plan, though, by the by, I doubt anybody's striking out a better. You may give it a higher character. You may raise it into a place. From being the mere gentleman's residence, it becomes, by judicious improvement, the residence of a man of education, taste, modern manners, good connections. All this may be stamped on it, and that house receive such an air as to make its owner be set down as the great landholder of the parish, by every creature travelling the road, especially as there is no real squire's house to dispute the point, a circumstance between ourselves to enhance the value of such a situation, in point of privilege and independence, beyond all calculation. You think with me, I hope," turning with a softened voice to Fanny. Have you ever seen the place?" Fanny gave a quick negative, and tried to hide her interest in the subject by an eager attention to her brother, who was driving as hard a bargain, and imposing on her as much as he could. But Crawford pursued with, "'No, no, you must not part with the Queen. You have bought her too dearly, and your brother does not offer half her value. No, no, sir, hands off, hands off. Your sister does not part with the Queen. She is quite determined. The game will be yours turning to her again. It will certainly be yours." "'And Fanny had much rather it were Williams,' said Edmund, smiling at her. "'Poor Fanny! Not allowed to cheat herself as she wishes!' "'Mr. Bertram,' said Miss Crawford a few minutes afterwards, "'you know Henry to be such a capital improver, that you cannot possibly engage in anything of the sort at Thornton Lacey, without accepting his help. Only think how useful he was at Southerton! Only think what grand things were produced there by our all going with him one hot day in August to drive about the grounds, and see his genius take fire. There we went, and there we came home again, and what was done there is not to be told." Fanny's eyes were turned on Crawford for a moment with an expression more than grave, even reproachful, but on catching his were instantly withdrawn. With something of consciousness he shook his head at his sister, and laughingly replied, I cannot say there was much done at Southerton, but it was a hot day, and we were all walking after each other and bewildered." As soon as a general buzz gave him shelter, he added, in a low voice directed solely at Fanny, "'I should be sorry to have my powers of planning judged of by the day at Southerton. I see things very differently now. Do not think of me as I appeared then.' Southerton was a word to catch Mrs. Norris, and being just then in the happy leisure which followed securing the odd trick by Sir Thomas's capital play and her own, against Dr. and Mrs. Grant's great hands, she called out in high good humour, "'Southerton! Yes, that is a place indeed, and we had a charming day there. William, you are quite out of luck, but the next time you come I hope dear Mr. and Mrs. Rushworth will be at home, and I am sure I can answer for your being kindly received by both.' Your cousins are not of a sort to forget their relations, and Mr. Rushworth is a most amiable man. They are at Brighton now, you know, in one of the best houses there, as Mr. Rushworth's fine fortune gives them a right to be. I do not exactly know the distance, but when you get back to Portsmouth, if it is not very far off, you ought to go over and pay your respects to them, and I could send a little parcel by you that I want to get conveyed to your cousins." "'I should be very happy, aunt. But Brighton is almost by Beachy Head, and if I could get so far, I could not expect to be welcome in such a smart place as that, poor scrubby midshipman as I am." Mrs. Norris was beginning an eager assurance of the affability he might depend on, when she was stopped by Sir Thomas's saying with authority, "'I do not advise your going to Brighton, William, as I trust you may soon have more convenient opportunities of meeting, but my daughters would be happy to see their cousins anywhere and you will find Mr. Rushworth most sincerely disposed to regard all the connections of our family as his own." "'I would rather find him private secretary to the First Lord than anything else,' was William's only answer, in an under-voice not meant to reach far, and the subject was dropped. As yet Sir Thomas had seen nothing to remark in Mr. Crawford's behaviour. 
But when the whist table broke up at the end of the second rubber, and leaving Dr. Grant and Mrs. Norris to dispute over their last play, he became a looker-on at the other. He found his niece the object of attentions, or rather of professions, of a somewhat pointed character. Henry Crawford was in the first glow of another scheme about Thornton Lacey, and, not being able to catch Edmund's ear, was detailing it to his fair neighbour with a look of considerable earnestness. His scheme was to rent the house himself the following winter, that he might have a home of his own in that neighbourhood. And it was not merely for the use of it in the hunting season, as he was then telling her, though that consideration had certainly some weight, feeling as he did, that in spite of all Dr. Grant's very great kindness, it was impossible for him and his horses to be accommodated where they were now, without material inconvenience. But his attachment to that neighbourhood did not depend upon one amusement, or one season of the year. He had set his heart upon having a something there that he could come to at any time, a little home-stall at his command, where all the holidays of his year might be spent, and he might find himself continuing, improving, and perfecting that friendship and intimacy with the Mansfield Park family, which was increasing in value to him every day. Sir Thomas heard, and was not offended. There was no want of respect in the young man's address, and Fanny's reception of it was so proper and modest, so calm and uninviting, that he had nothing to censure in her. She said little, assented only here and there, and betrayed no inclination, either of appropriating any part of the compliment to herself, or of strengthening his views in favour of Northamptonshire. Finding by whom he was observed, Henry Crawford addressed himself on the same subject to Sir Thomas, in a more everyday tone, but still with feeling. I want to be your neighbour, Sir Thomas, as you have perhaps heard me telling Miss Price. May I hope for your acquiescence, and for your not influencing your son against such a tenant?" Sir Thomas, politely bowing, replied, "'It is the only way, sir, in which I could not wish you established as a permanent neighbour. But I hope and believe that Edmund will occupy his own house at Thornton Lacey. Edmund, am I saying too much?' Edmund, on this appeal, had first to hear what was going on, but on understanding the question was at no loss for an answer. "'Certainly, sir. I have no idea but of residence. But, Crawford, though I refuse you as a tenant, come to me as a friend. Consider the house as half your own every winter, and we will add to the stables on your own improved plan, and with all the improvements of your improved plan that may occur to you this spring.' "'We shall be the losers,' continued Sir Thomas. His going, though only eight miles, will be an unwelcome contraction of our family circle. But I should have been deeply mortified if any son of mine could reconcile himself to doing less. It is perfectly natural that you should not have thought much on the subject, Mr. Crawford. But a parish has wants and claims which can be known only by a clergyman constantly resident, and which no proxy can be capable of satisfying to the same extent. Edmund might, in the common phrase, do the duty of Thornton, that is, he might read prayers and preach without giving up Mansfield Park, he might ride over every Sunday to a house nominally inhabited, and go through divine service, he might be the clergyman of Thornton Lacey every seventh day, for three or four hours, if that would content him, but it will not. He knows that human nature needs more lessons than a weekly sermon can convey and that, if he does not live among his parishioners, and prove himself by constant attention their well-wisher and friend, he does very little for either their good or his own." Mr. Crawford bowed his acquiescence. "'I repeat again,' added Sir Thomas, "'that Thornton Lacey is the only house in the neighbourhood in which I should not be happy to wait on Mr. Crawford as occupier.' Mr. Crawford bowed his thanks. "'Sir Thomas,' said Edmund, "'undoubtedly understands the duty of a parish priest. We must hope his son may prove that he knows it too." Whatever effect Sir Thomas's little harangue might really produce on Mr. Crawford, it raised some awkward sensations in two of the others, two of his most attentive listeners, Miss Crawford and Fanny. One of whom, having never before understood that Thornton was so soon and so completely to be his home, was pondering with downcast eyes on what it would be not to see Edmund every day and the other, startled from the agreeable fancy she had been previously indulging on the strength of her brother's description, no longer able, in the picture she had been forming of a future Thornton, to shut out the church, sink the clergyman, and see only the respectable, elegant, modernised, and occasional residence of a man of independent fortune, was considering Sir Thomas with decided ill-will, as the destroyer of all this, and suffering the more from that involuntary forbearance which his character and manner commanded, and from not daring to relieve herself by a single attempt at throwing ridicule on his cause. 
all the agreeable of her speculation was over for that hour. It was time to have done with cards if sermons prevailed, and she was glad to find it necessary to come to a conclusion, and be able to refresh her spirits by a change of place and neighbour. The chief of the party were now collected irregularly round the fire, and waiting the final break-up. William and Fanny were the most attached. They remained together at the otherwise deserted card-table, talking very comfortably, and not thinking of the rest, till some of the rest began to think of them. Henry Crawford's chair was the first to be given a direction towards them, and he sat silently observing them for a few minutes, himself in the meanwhile observed by Sir Thomas, who was standing in chat with Dr. Grant. "'This is the assembly night,' said William. "'If I were at Portsmouth I should be at it, perhaps.' "'But you do not wish yourself at Portsmouth, William?' "'No, Fanny, that I do not. I shall soon have enough of Portsmouth, and of dancing, too, when I cannot have you. And I do not know that there would be any good in going to the assembly, for I might not get a partner. The Portsmouth girls turn up their noses at anybody who has not a commission. One might as well be nothing as a midshipman. One is nothing, indeed. You remember the Gregories. They are grown up amazing fine girls, but they will hardly speak to me, because Lucy is courted by a lieutenant. Oh, shame, shame! But never mind it, William," her own cheeks in a glow of indignation as she spoke. "'It is not worth minding. It is no reflection on you. It is no more than what the greatest admirals have all experienced, more or less, in their time. You must think of that. You must try to make up your mind to it, as one of the hardships which fall to every sailor's share, like bad weather and hard living, only with this advantage, that there will be an end to it, that there will come a time when you will have nothing of that sort to endure. When you are a lieutenant! Only think, William, when you are a lieutenant, how little you will care for any nonsense of this kind!" "'I begin to think I shall never be a lieutenant, Fanny. Everybody gets made but me.' "'Oh, my dear William, do not talk so, do not be so desponding. My uncle says nothing, but I am sure he will do everything in his power to get you made. He knows, as well as you do, of what consequence it is.' She was checked by the sight of her uncle much nearer to them than she had any suspicion of, and each found it necessary to talk of something else. "'Are you fond of dancing, Fanny?' "'Yes, very. Only I am soon tired.' "'I should like to go to a ball with you and see you dance. Have you never any balls at Northampton? I should like to see you dance, and I'd dance with you if you would, for nobody would know who I was there, and I should like to be your partner once more. We used to jump about together many a time, did not we, when the hand-organ was in the street?' I am a pretty good dancer in my way, but I dare say you are a better." And turning to his uncle, who was now close to them, "'Is not Fanny a very good dancer, sir?' Fanny, in dismay at such an unprecedented question, did not know which way to look, or how to be prepared for the answer. Some very grave reproof, or at least the coldest expression of indifference, must be coming to distress her brother, and sink her to the ground. But on the contrary, it was no worse than— I am sorry to say that I am unable to answer your question. I have never seen Fanny dance since she was a little girl, but I trust we shall both think she acquits herself like a gentlewoman when we do see her, which perhaps we may have an opportunity of doing ere long." "'I have had the pleasure of seeing your sister dance, Mr. Price,' said Henry Crawford, leaning forward, "'and will engage to answer every inquiry which you can make on the subject, to your entire satisfaction. But I believe, seeing Fanny look distressed, it must be at some other time. There is one person in company who does not like to have Miss Price spoken of." True enough, he had once seen Fanny dance, and it was equally true that he would now have answered for her gliding about with quiet, light elegance, and in admirable time. But in fact, he could not for the life of him recall what her dancing had been, and rather took it for granted that she had been present, than remembered anything about her. He passed, however, for an admirer of her dancing and Sir Thomas, by no means displeased, prolonged the conversation on dancing in general, and was so well engaged in describing the balls of Antigua, and listening to what his nephew could relate of the different modes of dancing which had fallen within his observation, that he had not heard his carriage announced, and was first called to the knowledge of it by the bustle of Mrs. Norris. "'Come, Fanny, come, what are you about? We are going. Do not you see your aunt is going? Quick, quick! I cannot bear to keep good old Wilcox waiting. You should always remember the coachman and horses. My dear Sir Thomas, we have settled it that the carriage should come back for you and Edmund and William." Sir Thomas could not dissent, as it had been his own arrangement, previously communicated to his wife and sister, but that seemed forgotten by Mrs. Norris, who must fancy that she settled it all herself. 
Fanny's last feeling in the visit was disappointment, for the shawl which Edmund was quietly taking from the servant to bring and put round her shoulders was seized by Mr. Crawford's quicker hand, and she was obliged to be indebted to his more prominent attention. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen William's desire of seeing Fanny dance made more than a momentary impression on his uncle. The hope of an opportunity, which Sir Thomas had then given, was not given to be thought of no more. He remained steadily inclined to gratify so amiable a feeling, to gratify anybody else who might wish to see Fanny dance, and to give pleasure to the young people in general. And having thought the matter over, and taken his resolution in quiet independence, the result of it appeared the next morning at breakfast, when, after recalling and commending what his nephew had said, added, I do not like, William, that you should leave Northamptonshire without this indulgence. It would give me pleasure to see you both dance. You spoke of the balls at Northampton. Your cousins have occasionally attended them. But they would not altogether suit us now. The fatigue would be too much for your aunt. I believe we must not think of a Northampton ball. A dance at home would be more eligible, and if—' "'Ah, my dear Sir Thomas,' interrupted Mrs. Norris, "'I knew what was coming. I knew what you were going to say. If dear Julia were at home, or dearest Mrs. Rushworth at Southerton, to afford a reason, an occasion for such a thing, you would be tempted to give the young people a dance at Mansfield. I know you would. If they were at home to grace the ball, a ball you would have this very Christmas. Thank your uncle, William, thank your uncle.' "'My daughters,' replied Sir Thomas, gravely interposing, "'have their pleasures at Brighton, and I hope are very happy. But the dance which I think of giving at Mansfield will be for their cousins. Could we be all assembled, our satisfaction would undoubtedly be more complete, but the absence of some is not to debar the others of amusement.' Mrs. Norris had not another word to say. She saw decision in his looks, and her surprise and vexation required some minutes' silence to be settled into composure a ball at such a time his daughters absent and herself not consulted there was comfort however soon at hand she must be the doer of everything lady bertram would of course be spared all thought and exertion and it would all fall upon her she should have to do the honours of the evening and this reflection quickly restored so much of her good humour as enabled her to join in with the others before their happiness and thanks were all expressed Edmund, William, and Fanny did, in their different ways, look and speak as much grateful pleasure in the promised ball as Sir Thomas could desire. Edmund's feelings were for the other two. His father had never conferred a favour or shown a kindness more to his satisfaction. Lady Bertram was perfectly quiescent and contented, and had no objections to make. Sir Thomas engaged for its giving her very little trouble, and she assured him that she was not at all afraid of the trouble. Indeed, she could not imagine there would be any. Mrs. Norris was ready with her suggestions as to the rooms he would think fittest to be used, but found it all pre-arranged, and when she would have conjectured and hinted about the day, it appeared that the day was settled too. Sir Thomas had been amusing himself with shaping a very complete outline of the business, and as soon as she would listen quietly, could read his list of the families to be invited, from whom he calculated, with all necessary allowance for the shortness of the notice, to collect young people enough to form twelve or fourteen couple, and could detail the considerations which had induced him to fix on the twenty-second as the most eligible day. William was required to be at Portsmouth on the twenty-fourth. The twenty-second would therefore be the last day of his visit but where the days were so few it would be unwise to fix on any earlier mrs norris was obliged to be satisfied with thinking just the same and with having been on the point of proposing the twenty-second herself as by far the best day for the purpose the ball was now a settled thing and before the evening a proclaimed thing to all whom it concerned invitations were sent with dispatch and many a young lady went to bed that night with her head full of happy cares as well as fanny to her the cares were sometimes almost beyond the happiness for young and inexperienced with small means of choice and no confidence in her own taste the how she should be dressed was a point of painful solicitude and the almost solitary ornament in her possession a very pretty amber cross which william had brought her from sicily was the greatest distress of all for she had nothing but a bit of ribbon to fasten it to and though she had worn it in that manner once would it be allowable at such a time in the midst of all the rich ornaments which she supposed all the other young ladies would appear in and yet not to wear it william had wanted to buy her a gold chain too 
but the purchase had been beyond his means, and therefore not to wear the cross might be mortifying him. These were anxious considerations, enough to sober her spirits even under the prospect of a ball given principally for her gratification. The preparations meanwhile went on, and Lady Bertram continued to sit on her sofa without any inconvenience from them. She had some extra visits from the housekeeper, and her maid was rather hurried in making up a new dress for her. Sir Thomas gave orders, and Mrs. Norris ran about, but all this gave her no trouble, and as she had foreseen, there was, in fact, no trouble in the business. Edmund was at this time particularly full of cares, his mind being deeply occupied in the consideration of two important events now at hand, which were to fix his fate in life—ordination and matrimony, events of such a serious character as to make the ball, which would be very quickly followed by one of them, appear of less moment in his eyes than in those of any other person in the house. On the twenty-third he was going to a friend near Peterborough, in the same situation as himself, and they were to receive ordination in the course of the Christmas week. Half his destiny would then be determined, but the other half might not be so very smoothly wooed. His duties would be established, but the wife who was to share and animate and reward those duties might yet be unattainable. He knew his own mind, but he was not always perfectly assured of knowing Miss Crawford's. There were points on which they did not quite agree. There were moments in which she did not seem propitious, and, though trusting altogether to her affection, so far as to be resolved, almost resolved, on bringing it to a decision within a very short time, as soon as the variety of business before him were arranged, and he knew what he had to offer, he had many anxious feelings, many doubting hours as to the result. His conviction of her regard for him was sometimes very strong. He could look back on a long course of encouragement, and she was as perfect in disinterested attachment as in everything else. But at other times doubt and alarm intermingled with his hopes, and when he thought of her acknowledged disinclination for privacy and retirement, her decided preference of a London life, what could he expect but a determined rejection, unless it were an acceptance even more to be deprecated, demanding such sacrifices of situation and employment on his side as conscience must forbid? The issue of all depended on one question. Did she love him well enough to forego what had used to be essential points? Did she love him well enough to make them no longer essential? And this question, which he was continually repeating to himself, though oftenest answered with a yes, had sometimes its no. Miss Crawford was soon to leave Mansfield, and on this circumstance the no and the yes had been very recently in alternation. He had seen her eyes sparkle as she spoke of the dear friend's letter, which claimed a long visit from her in London, and of the kindness of Henry in engaging to remain where he was till January, that he might convey her thither. He had heard her speak of the pleasure of such a journey, with an animation which had no in every tone. But this had occurred on the first day of its being settled, within the first hour of the burst of such enjoyment, when nothing but the friend she was to visit was before her. He had since heard her express herself differently, with other feelings, more chequered feelings. He had heard her tell Mrs. Grant that she should leave her with regret, that she began to believe neither the friends nor the pleasure she was going to were worth those she left behind, and that though she felt she must go, and knew she should enjoy herself when once away, she was already looking forward to being at Mansfield again. Was there not a yes in all this? With such matters to ponder over and arrange and rearrange, Edmund could not, on his own account, think very much of the evening, which the rest of the family were looking forward to with a more equal degree of strong interest. Independent of his two cousins' enjoyment in it, the evening was to him of no higher value than any other appointed meeting of the two families might be. In every meeting there was a hope of receiving farther confirmation of Miss Crawford's attachment, but the whirl of a ballroom perhaps was not particularly favourable to the excitement or expression of serious feelings. To engage her early for the first two dances was all the command of individual happiness which he felt in his power, and the only preparation for the ball which he could enter into, in spite of all that was passing around him on the subject from morning till night. Thursday was the day of the ball and on Wednesday morning, Fanny, still unable to satisfy herself as to what she ought to wear, determined to seek the counsel of the more enlightened, and apply to Mrs. Grant and her sister, whose acknowledged taste would certainly bear her blameless. 
And as Edmund and William were gone to Northampton, and she had reason to think Mr. Crawford likewise out, she walked down to the parsonage without much fear of wanting an opportunity for private discussion. And the privacy of such a discussion was a most important part of it to Fanny, being more than half ashamed of her own solicitude. She met Miss Crawford within a few yards of the parsonage, just setting out to call on her, and as it seemed to her that her friend, though obliged to insist on turning back, was unwilling to lose her walk, she explained her business at once, and observed that if she would be so kind as to give her opinion, it might be all talked over as well without doors as within. Miss Crawford appeared gratified by the application, and after a moment's thought, urged Fanny's returning with her in a much more cordial manner than before and proposed their going up into her room, where they might have a comfortable cose without disturbing Doctor and Mrs. Grant, who were together in the drawing-room. It was just the plan to suit Fanny, and with a great deal of gratitude on her side for such ready and kind attention, they proceeded indoors and upstairs, and were soon deep in the interesting subject. Miss Crawford, pleased with the appeal, gave all her best judgment and taste, made everything easy by her suggestions, and tried to make everything agreeable by her encouragement. The dress being settled in all its grander parts, "'But what shall you have by way of necklace?' said Miss Crawford. "'Shall not you wear your brother's cross?' And as she spoke, she was undoing a small parcel, which Fanny had observed in her hand when they met. Fanny acknowledged her wishes and doubts on this point. She did not know how either to wear the cross, or to refrain from wearing it. She was answered by having a small trinket-box placed before her, and being requested to choose from among several gold chains and necklaces. Such had been the parcel with which Miss Crawford was provided, and such the object of her intended visit. And in the kindest manner she now urged Fanny's taking one for the cross, and to keep for her sake, saying everything she could think of to obviate the scruples which were making Fanny start back at first, with a look of horror at the proposal. "'You see what a collection I have,' said she, "'more by half than I ever use or think of. I do not offer them as new. I offer nothing but an old necklace. You must forgive the liberty, and oblige me.' Fanny still resisted, and from her heart. The gift was too valuable, but Miss Crawford persevered, and argued the case with so much affectionate earnestness, through all the heads of William and the cross, and the ball and herself, as to be finally successful. Fanny found herself obliged to yield, that she might not be accused of pride or indifference, or some other littleness, and having with modest reluctance given her consent, proceeded to make the selection. She looked and looked, longing to know which might be least valuable, and was determined in her choice at last, by fancying there was one necklace more frequently placed before her eyes than the rest. It was of gold, prettily worked, and though Fanny would have preferred a longer and a plainer chain, as more adapted for the purpose, she hoped, in fixing on this, to be choosing what Miss Crawford least wished to keep. Miss Crawford smiled her perfect approbation, and hastened to complete the gift by putting the necklace round her, and making her see how well it looked. Fanny had not a word to say against its becomingness, and accepting what remained of her scruples, was exceedingly pleased with an acquisition so very apropos. She would rather, perhaps, have been obliged to some other person, but this was an unworthy feeling. Miss Crawford had anticipated her once with a kindness which proved her a real friend. "'When I wear this necklace I shall always think of you,' said she, "'and feel how very kind you are.' "'You must think of somebody else, too, when you wear that necklace,' replied Miss Crawford. "'You must think of Henry, for it was his choice in the first place. He gave it to me, and with the necklace I make over to you all the duty of remembering the original giver. It is to be a family remembrancer. The sister is not to be in your mind without bringing the brother, too.' Fanny, in great astonishment and confusion, would have returned the present instantly. To take what had been the gift of another person, of a brother, too, impossible, it must not be, and with an eagerness and embarrassment quite diverting to her companion, she laid down the necklace again on its cotton, and seemed resolved either to take another, or none at all. Miss Crawford thought she had never seen a prettier consciousness. "'My dear child,' said she, laughing, "'what are you afraid of? Do you think Henry will claim the necklace as mine, and fancy you did not come honestly by it? Or are you imagining he would be too much flattered by seeing round your lovely throat an ornament which his money purchased three years ago, before he knew there was such a throat in the world? 
or perhaps, looking archly, you suspect a confederacy between us, and that what I am now doing is with his knowledge and at his desire." With the deepest blushes, Fanny protested against such a thought. "'Well, then,' replied Miss Crawford more seriously, but without at all believing her, "'to convince me that you suspect no trick, and are as unsuspicious of compliment as I have always found you, take the necklace, and say no more about it. Its being a gift of my brother's need not make the smallest difference in your accepting it, as I assure you it makes none in my willingness to part with it. He is always giving me something or other. I have such innumerable presents from him, that it is quite impossible for me to value, or for him to remember, half. And as for this necklace, I do not suppose I have worn it six times. It is very pretty, but I never think of it, and though you would be most heartily welcome to any other in my trinket-box, you have happened to fix on the very one which, if I have a choice, I would rather part with and see in your possession than any other. Say no more against it, I entreat you. Such a trifle is not worth half so many words." Fanny dared not make any further opposition, and with renewed but less happy thanks accepted the necklace again for there was an expression in Miss Crawford's eyes which she could not be satisfied with. It was impossible for her to be insensible of Mr. Crawford's change of manners. She had long seen it. He evidently tried to please her. He was gallant, he was attentive, he was something like what he had been to her cousins. He wanted, she supposed, to cheat her of her tranquillity, as he had cheated them. And whether he might not have some concern in this necklace, she could not be convinced that he had not, for Miss Crawford, complaisant as a sister, was careless as a woman and a friend. Reflecting and doubting, and feeling that the possession of what she had so much wished for did not bring much satisfaction, she now walked home again, with a change rather than a diminution of cares since her treading that path before. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen on reaching home, Fanny went immediately upstairs to deposit this unexpected acquisition, this doubtful good of a necklace in some favourite box in the East Room, which held all her smaller treasures. But on opening the door, what was her surprise to find her cousin Edmund there, writing at the table? Such a sight, having never occurred before, was almost as wonderful as it was welcome. "'Fanny,' said he directly, leaving his seat and his pen, and meeting her with something in his hand, "'I beg your pardon for being here.' I came to look for you, and after waiting a little while in hope of your coming in, was making use of your inkstand to explain my errand. You will find the beginning of a note to yourself, but I can now speak my business, which is merely to beg your acceptance of this little trifle, a chain for William's cross. You ought to have had it a week ago, but there has been a delay from my brother's not being in town by several days so soon as I expected, and I have only just now received it at Northampton. I hope you will like the chain itself, Fanny. I endeavoured to consult the simplicity of your taste, but, at any rate, I know you will be kind to my intentions, and consider it as it really is, a token of the love of one of your oldest friends." And so saying, he was hurrying away before Fanny, overpowered by a thousand feelings of pain and pleasure, could attempt to speak. But quickened by one sovereign wish, she then called out, "'Oh, cousin, stop a moment, pray stop!' He turned back. "'I cannot attempt to thank you,' she continued, in a very agitated manner. "'Thanks are out of the question. I feel much more than I can possibly express. Your goodness in thinking of me in such a way is beyond—' "'If this is all you have to say, Fanny,' smiling and turning away again, "'no, no, it is not. I want to consult you.' Almost unconsciously she had now undone the parcel he had just put into her hand, and seeing before her, in all the niceness of jeweller's packing, a plain gold chain, perfectly simple and neat, she could not help bursting forth again. "'Oh, this is beautiful indeed! This is the very thing, precisely what I wished for. This is the only ornament I have ever had a desire to possess. It will exactly suit my cross. They must and shall be worn together. It comes, too, in such an acceptable moment. Oh, cousin, you do not know how acceptable it is." "'My dear Fanny, you feel these things a great deal too much. I am most happy that you like the chain, and that it should be here in time for to-morrow, but your thanks are far beyond the occasion. Believe me, I have no pleasure in the world superior to that of contributing to yours. No, I can safely say I have no pleasure so complete, so unalloyed. It is without a drawback." Upon such expressions of affection, Fanny could have lived an hour without saying another word. 
But Edmund, after waiting a moment, obliged her to bring down her mind from its heavenly flight by saying, "'But what is it that you want to consult me about?' It was about the necklace, which she was now most earnestly longing to return, and hoped to obtain his approbation of her doing. She gave the history of her recent visit, and now her raptures might well be over, for Edmund was so struck with the circumstance, so delighted with what Miss Crawford had done, so gratified by such a coincidence of conduct between them, that Fanny could not but admit the superior power of one pleasure over his own mind, though it might have its drawback. It was some time before she could get his attention to her plan, or any answer to her demand of his opinion. He was in a reverie of fond reflection, uttering only now and then a few half-sentences of praise. But when he did awake and understand, he was very decided in opposing what she wished. "'Return the necklace? No, my dear Fanny, upon no account. It would be mortifying her severely. There can hardly be a more unpleasant sensation than having the thing returned on our hands, which we have given with a reasonable hope of its contributing to the comfort of a friend. Why should she lose a pleasure which she has shown herself so deserving of?" "'If it had been given to me in the first instance,' said Fanny, "'I should not have thought of returning it. But being her brother's present, is not it fair to suppose that she would rather not part with it, when it is not wanted?' She must not suppose it not wanted, not acceptable at least, and its having been originally her brother's gift makes no difference, for as she was not prevented from offering, nor you from taking it on that account, it ought not to affect your keeping it. No doubt it is handsomer than mine, and fitter for a ballroom. No, it is not handsomer, not at all handsomer in its way, and for my purpose not half so fit. The chain will agree with William's cross beyond all comparison better than the necklace. For one night, Fanny— for only one night, if it be a sacrifice, I am sure you will, upon consideration, make that sacrifice rather than give pain to one who has been so studious of your comfort. Miss Crawford's attentions to you have been not more than you were justly entitled to, I am the last person to think that could be, but they have been invariable, and to be returning them with what must have something the air of ingratitude, though I know it could never have the meaning, is not in your nature, I am sure." Wear the necklace, as you are engaged to do to-morrow evening, and let the chain, which was not ordered with any reference to the ball, be kept for commoner occasions. This is my advice. I would not have the shadow of a coolness between the two whose intimacy I have been observing with the greatest pleasure, and in whose characters there is so much general resemblance, in true generosity and natural delicacy, as to make the few slight differences, resulting principally from situation, no reasonable hindrance to a perfect friendship. I would not have the shadow of a coolness arise, he repeated, his voice sinking a little, between the two dearest objects I have on earth. He was gone as he spoke, and Fanny remained to tranquillise herself as she could. She was one of his two dearest. That must support her. But the other! The first! She had never heard him speak so openly before, and though it told her no more than what she had long perceived, it was a stab, for it told of his own convictions and views. They were decided. He would marry Miss Crawford. It was a stab, in spite of every long-standing expectation, and she was obliged to repeat again and again that she was one of his two dearest, before the words gave her any sensation. Could she believe Miss Crawford to deserve him, it would be—oh, how different it would be! How far more tolerable! But he was deceived in her. He gave her merits which she had not. Her faults were what they had ever been, but he saw them no longer. Till she had shed many tears over this deception, Fanny could not subdue her agitation, and the dejection which followed could only be relieved by the influence of fervent prayers for his happiness. It was her intention, as she felt it to be her duty, to try to overcome all that was excessive, all that bordered on selfishness in her affection for Edmund. To call or to fancy it a loss, a disappointment, would be a presumption, for which she had not words strong enough to satisfy her own humility. To think of him as Miss Crawford might be justified in thinking, would in her be insanity. To her he could be nothing under any circumstances, nothing dearer than a friend. Why did such an idea occur to her, even enough to be reprobated and forbidden? It ought not to have touched on the confines of her imagination. She would endeavour to be rational, and to deserve the right of judging of Miss Crawford's character, and the privilege of true solicitude for him, by a sound intellect and an honest heart. 
She had all the heroism of principle, and was determined to do her duty. But having also many of the feelings of youth and nature, let her not be much wondered at, if after making all these good resolutions on the side of self-government, she seized the scrap of paper on which Edmund had begun writing to her, as a treasure beyond all her hopes, and reading with the tenderest emotion these words, My very dear Fanny, you must do me the favour to accept, locked it up with the chain, as the dearest part of the gift. It was the only thing approaching to a letter which she had ever received from him. She might never receive another. It was impossible that she ever should receive another so perfectly gratifying in the occasion and the style. Two lines more prized had never fallen from the pen of the most distinguished author, never more completely blessed the researches of the fondest biographer. The enthusiasm of a woman's love is even beyond the biographer's. To her, the handwriting itself, independent of anything it may convey, is a blessedness. Never were such characters cut by any other human being, as Edmund's commonest handwriting gave. This specimen, written in haste as it was, had not a fault. There was a felicity in the flow of the first four words, in the arrangement of, My very dear Fanny, which she could have looked at for ever. Having regulated her thoughts and comforted her feelings by this happy mixture of reason and weakness, she was able, in due time, to go down and resume her usual employments near her Aunt Bertram, and pay her the usual observances without any apparent want of spirits. Thursday, predestined to hope and enjoyment, came, and opened with more kindness to Fanny than such self-willed, unmanageable days often volunteer for soon after breakfast a very friendly note was brought from mr crawford to william stating that as he found himself obliged to go to london on the morrow for a few days he could not help trying to procure a companion and therefore hoped that if william could make up his mind to leave mansfield half a day earlier than had been proposed he would accept a place in his carriage Mr. Crawford meant to be in town by his uncle's accustomary late dinner hour, and William was invited to dine with him at the Admiral's. The proposal was a very pleasant one to William himself, who enjoyed the idea of travelling post with four horses, and such a good-humoured, agreeable friend, and, in likening it to going up with dispatches, was saying at once everything in favour of its happiness and dignity, which his imagination could suggest. And Fanny, from a different motive, was exceedingly pleased for the original plan was that William should go up by the mail from Northampton the following night, which would not have allowed him an hour's rest, before he must have got into a Portsmouth coach, and though this offer of Mr. Crawford's would rob her of many hours of his company, she was too happy in having William spared from the fatigue of such a journey, to think of anything else. Sir Thomas approved of it for another reason. His nephew's introduction to Admiral Crawford might be of service. The Admiral, he believed, had interest— Upon the whole, it was a very joyous note. Fanny's spirits lived on it half the morning, deriving some accession of pleasure from its writer being himself to go away. As for the ball so near at hand, she had too many agitations and fears to have half the enjoyment and anticipation which she ought to have had, or must have been supposed to have, by the many young ladies looking forward to the same event in situations more at ease, but under circumstances of less novelty, less interest, less particular gratification than would be attributed to her. Miss Price, known only by name to half the people invited, was now to make her first appearance, and must be regarded as the queen of the evening. Who could be happier than Miss Price? But Miss Price had not been brought up to the trade of coming out, and had she known in what light this ball was in general considered respecting her, it would very much have lessened her comfort by increasing the fear she already had of doing wrong and being looked at. To dance without much observation or any extraordinary fatigue, to have strength and partners for about half the evening, to dance a little with Edmund, and not a great deal with Mr. Crawford, to see William enjoy himself, and be able to keep away from her Aunt Norris, was the height of her ambition, and seemed to comprehend her greatest possibility of happiness. As these were the best of her hopes, they could not always prevail and in the course of a long morning, spent principally with her two aunts, she was often under the influence of much less sanguine views. William, determined to make this last day a day of thorough enjoyment, was out snipe-shooting. 
Edmund, she had too much reason to suppose, was at the parsonage, and left alone to bear the worrying of Mrs. Norris, who was cross because the housekeeper would have her own way with the supper, and whom she could not avoid, though the housekeeper might, Fanny was worn down at last to think everything an evil belonging to the ball, and when sent off with a parting worry to dress, moved as languidly towards her own room, and felt as incapable of happiness, as if she had been allowed no share in it. As she walked slowly upstairs, she thought of yesterday. It had been about the same hour that she had returned from the parsonage, and found Edmund in the east room. "'Suppose I were to find him there again to-day,' she said to herself in a fond indulgence of fancy. "'Fanny,' said a voice at that moment near her. Starting and looking up, she saw across the lobby she had just reached, Edmund himself, standing at the head of a different staircase. He came towards her. "'You look tired and fagged, Fanny. You have been walking too far." "'No, I have not been out at all.' "'Then you have had fatigues within doors, which are worse. You had better have gone out.' Fanny, not liking to complain, found it easiest to make no answer, and though he looked at her with his usual kindness, she believed he had soon ceased to think of her countenance. He did not appear in spirits. Something unconnected with her was probably amiss. They proceeded upstairs together, their rooms being on the same floor above. "'I come from Dr. Grant's,' said Edmund presently. "'You may guess my errand there, Fanny.' And he looked so conscious that Fanny could think of but one errand, which turned her too sick for speech. "'I wish to engage Miss Crawford for the first two dances,' was the explanation that followed, and brought Fanny to life again, enabling her, as she found she was expected to speak, to utter something like an inquiry as to the result. "'Yes,' he answered, "'she is engaged to me.' But, with a smile that did not sit easy, she says it is to be the last time she will ever dance with me. She is not serious. I think—I hope—I am sure she is not serious, but I would rather not hear it. She never has danced with a clergyman, she says, and she never will. For my own sake I could wish there had been no ball just at—I mean, not this very week, this very day. To-morrow I leave home." Fanny struggled for speech, and said, I am very sorry that anything has occurred to distress you. This ought to be a day of pleasure. My uncle meant it so. Oh, yes, yes, and it will be a day of pleasure. It will end all right. I am only vexed for a moment. In fact, it is not that I consider the ball as ill-timed. What does it signify? But Fanny, stopping her by taking her hand and speaking low and seriously, you know what this all means. You see how it is, and could tell me, perhaps better than I could tell you, how and why I am vexed. Let me talk to you a little. You are a kind, kind listener. I have been pained by her manner this morning, and cannot get the better of it. I know her disposition to be as sweet and faultless as your own, but the influence of her former companions makes her seem—gives to her conversation, to her professed opinions, sometimes a tinge of wrong. She does not think evil, but she speaks it, speaks it in playfulness, and though I know it to be playfulness, it grieves me to the soul. The effect of education," said Fanny, gently. Edmund could not but agree to it. Yes, that uncle and aunt. They have injured the finest mind. For sometimes, Fanny, I own to you, it does appear more than manner. It appears as if the mind itself was tainted. Fanny imagined this to be an appeal to her judgment, and therefore, after a moment's consideration, said, If you only want me as a listener, cousin, I will be as useful as I can but I am not qualified for an adviser. Do not ask advice of me. I am not competent. You are right, Fanny, to protest against such an office, but you need not be afraid. It is a subject on which I should never ask advice. It is the sort of subject on which it had better never be asked, and few, I imagine, do ask it, but when they want to be influenced against their conscience. I only want to talk to you. One thing more. Excuse the liberty, but take care how you talk to me. Do not tell me anything which hereafter you may be sorry for. The time may come—" The colour rushed into her cheeks as she spoke. "'Dearest Fanny,' cried Edmund, pressing her hand to his lips with almost as much warmth as if it had been Miss Crawford's. "'You are all considerate thought. But it is unnecessary here. The time will never come. No such time as you allude to will ever come. I begin to think it most improbable. The chances grow less and less, and even if it should, there will be nothing to be remembered by either you or me that we need be afraid of. 
for I can never be ashamed of my own scruples, and if they are removed, it must be by changes that will only raise her character the more by the recollection of the faults she once had. You are the only being upon earth to whom I should say what I have said, but you have always known my opinion of her. You can bear me witness, Fanny, that I have never been blinded. How many a time have we talked over her little errors? You need not fear me. I have almost given up every serious idea of her. But I must be a blockhead indeed, if whatever befell me, I could think of your kindness and sympathy without the sincerest gratitude." He had said enough to shake the experience of eighteen. He had said enough to give Fanny some happier feelings than she had lately known. And with a brighter look she answered, "'Yes, cousin, I am convinced that you would be incapable of anything else, though perhaps some might not. I cannot be afraid of hearing anything you wish to say. Do not check yourself. Tell me whatever you like." They were now on the second floor, and the appearance of a housemaid prevented any further conversation. For Fanny's present comfort it was concluded perhaps at the happiest moment. Had he been able to talk another five minutes, there is no saying that he might not have talked away all Miss Crawford's faults and his own despondence. But as it was, they parted with looks on his side of grateful affection, and with some very precious sensations on hers. She had felt nothing like it for hours. Since the first joy from Mr. Crawford's note to William had worn away, she had been in a state absolutely their reverse. There had been no comfort around, no hope within her. Now everything was smiling. William's good fortune returned again upon her mind, and seemed of greater value than at first. The ball, too! Such an evening of pleasure for her! It was now a real animation, and she began to dress for it with much of the happy flutter which belongs to a ball. All went well. She did not dislike her own looks, and when she came to the necklace again, her good fortune seemed complete. For upon trial, the one given her by Miss Crawford would by no means go through the ring of the cross. She had, to oblige Edmund, resolved to wear it, but it was too large for the purpose. His, therefore, must be worn, and having, with delightful feelings, joined the chain and the cross, those memorials of the two most beloved of her heart, those dearest tokens so formed for each other by everything real and imaginary, and put them round her neck, and seen and felt how full of William and Edmund they were, she was able, without an effort, to resolve on wearing Miss Crawford's necklace too. She acknowledged it to be right. Miss Crawford had a claim. And when it was no longer to encroach on, to interfere with the stronger claims, the truer kindness of another, she could do her justice even with pleasure to herself. The necklace really looked very well, and Fanny left her room at last, comfortably satisfied with herself and all about her. Her Aunt Bertram had recollected her on this occasion, with an unusual degree of wakefulness. It had really occurred to her, unprompted, that Fanny, preparing for a ball, might be glad of better help than the upper housemaids, and when dressed herself, she actually sent her own maid to assist her, too late, of course, to be of any use. Mrs. Chapman had just reached the attic floor, when Miss Price came out of her room completely dressed, and only civilities were necessary. But Fanny felt her aunt's attention almost as much as Lady Bertram or Mrs. Chapman could do themselves. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Her uncle and both her aunts were in the drawing-room when Fanny went down. To the former she was an interesting object, and he saw with pleasure the general elegance of her appearance, and her being in remarkably good looks. The neatness and propriety of her dress was all that he would allow himself to commend in her presence, but upon her leaving the room again soon afterwards, he spoke of her beauty with very decided praise. "'Yes,' said Lady Bertram, "'she looks very well. I sent Chapman to her.' "'Look well? Oh, yes,' cried Mrs. Norris. "'She has good reason to look well with all her advantages, brought up in this family as she has been, with all the benefits of her cousin's manners before her.' "'Only think, my dear Sir Thomas, what extraordinary advantages you and I have been the means of giving her. The very gown you have been taking notice of is your own generous present to her when dear Mrs. Rushworth married. What would she have been if we had not taken her by the hand?' Sir Thomas said no more. But when they sat down to table, the eyes of the two young men assured him that the subject might be gently touched again when the ladies withdrew, with more success. Fanny saw that she was approved, and the consciousness of looking well made her look still better. From a variety of causes she was happy, and she was soon made still happier, 
for in following her aunts out of the room, Edmund, who was holding open the door, said as she passed him, "'You must dance with me, Fanny. You must keep two dances for me, any two that you like, except the first. She had nothing more to wish for. She had hardly ever been in a state so nearly approaching high spirits in her life. Her cousin's former gaiety on the day of a ball was no longer surprising to her. She felt it to be indeed very charming, and was actually practising her steps about the drawing-room, as long as she could be safe from the notice of her aunt Norris, who was entirely taken up at first in fresh arranging and injuring the noble fire which the butler had prepared. Half an hour followed, that would have been at least languid under any other circumstances. But Fanny's happiness still prevailed. It was but to think of her conversation with Edmund. And what was the restlessness of Mrs. Norris? What were the yawns of Lady Bertram? The gentlemen joined them, and soon after began the sweet expectation of a carriage, when a general spirit of ease and enjoyment seemed diffused, and they all stood about and talked and laughed, and every moment had its pleasure and its hope. Fanny felt there must be a struggle in Edmund's cheerfulness, but it was delightful to see the effort so successfully made. When the carriages were really heard, when the guests began really to assemble, her own gaiety of heart was much subdued. The sight of so many strangers threw her back into herself, and besides the gravity and formality of the first great circle, which the manners of neither Sir Thomas nor Lady Bertram were of a kind to do away, she found herself occasionally called on to endure something worse. She was introduced here and there by her uncle, and forced to be spoken to, and to curtsey, and speak again. This was a hard duty, and she was never summoned to it without looking at William, as he walked about at his ease in the background of the scene, and longing to be with him. The entrance of the Grants and Crawfords was a favourable epoch. The stiffness of the meeting soon gave way before their popular manners, and more diffused intimacies. Little groups were formed, and everybody grew comfortable. Fanny felt the advantage, and drawing back from the toils of civility, would have been again most happy, could she have kept her eyes from wandering between Edmund and Mary Crawford. She looked all loveliness, and what might not be the end of it? Her own musings were brought to an end on perceiving Mr. Crawford before her, and her thoughts were put into another channel by his engaging her almost instantly for the first two dances. Her happiness on this occasion was very much à la mortale, finely chequered. To be secure of a partner at first was a most essential good, for the moment of beginning was now growing seriously near, and she so little understood her own claims as to think that, if Mr. Crawford had not asked her, she must have been the last to be sought after, and should have received a partner only through a series of inquiry and bustle and interference, which would have been terrible. But at the same time there was a pointedness in his manner of asking her, which she did not like, and she saw his eye glancing for a moment at her necklace, with a smile. She thought there was a smile, which made her blush and feel wretched. And though there was no second glance to disturb her, though his object seemed then to be only quietly agreeable, she could not get the better of her embarrassment, heightened as it was by the idea of his perceiving it, and had no composure till he turned away to some one else. Then she could gradually rise up to the genuine satisfaction of having a partner, a voluntary partner, secured against the dancing began. When the company were moving into the ballroom, she found herself for the first time near Miss Crawford, whose eyes and smiles were immediately and more unequivocally directed, as her brother's had been, and who was beginning to speak on the subject, when Fanny, anxious to get the story over, hastened to give the explanation of the second necklace, the real chain. Miss Crawford listened, and all her intended compliments and insinuations to Fanny were forgotten. She felt only one thing, and her eyes, bright as they had been before, Showing they could yet be brighter, she exclaimed with eager pleasure, "'Did he? Did Edmund? That was like himself. No other man would have thought of it. I honour him beyond expression.' And she looked around as if longing to tell him so. He was not near. He was attending a party of ladies out of the room, and Mrs. Grant coming up to the two girls and taking an arm of each, they followed with the rest. Fanny's heart sunk, but there was no leisure for thinking long even of Miss Crawford's feelings. They were in the ballroom, the violins were playing, and her mind was in a flutter that forbade its fixing on anything serious. She must watch the general arrangements, and see how everything was done. In a few minutes Sir Thomas came to her, and asked if she were engaged, and the "'Yes, sir,' to Mr. Crawford, was exactly what he had intended to hear. Mr. Crawford was not far off. 
Sir Thomas brought him to her, saying something which discovered to Fanny that she was to lead the way and open the ball, an idea that had never occurred to her before. Whenever she had thought on the minutiae of the evening, it had been as a matter of course that Edmund would begin with Miss Crawford, and the impression was so strong that, though her uncle spoke the contrary, she could not help an exclamation of surprise, a hint of her unfitness, an entreaty even to be excused. To be urging her opinion against Sir Thomas's was a proof of the extremity of the case, but such was her horror at the first suggestion that she could actually look him in the face and say she hoped it might be settled otherwise. In vain, however, Sir Thomas smiled, tried to encourage her, and then looked too serious and said too decidedly, It must be so, my dear, for her to hazard another word and she found herself the next moment conducted by Mr. Crawford to the top of the room, and standing there to be joined by the rest of the dancers, couple after couple, as they were formed. She could hardly believe it, to be placed above so many elegant young women. The distinction was too great. It was treating her like her cousins. And her thoughts flew to those absent cousins with most unfeigned and truly tender regret, that they were not at home to take their own place in the room, and have their share of a pleasure which would have been so very delightful to them. So often as she had heard them wish for a ball at home as the greatest of all felicities. And to have them away when it was given, and for her to be opening the ball, and with Mr. Crawford too, she hoped they would not envy her that distinction now. But when she looked back to the state of things in the autumn, to what they had all been to each other when once dancing in that house before, the present arrangement was almost more than she could understand herself. The ball began. It was rather honour than happiness to Fanny, for the first dance at least. Her partner was in excellent spirits, and tried to impart them to her. But she was a great deal too much frightened to have any enjoyment, till she could suppose herself no longer looked at. Young, pretty, and gentle, however, she had no awkwardnesses that were not as good as graces, and there were few persons present that were not disposed to praise her. She was attractive, she was modest, she was Sir Thomas's niece, and she was soon said to be admired by Mr. Crawford. It was enough to give her general favour. Sir Thomas himself was watching her progress down the dance with much complacency. He was proud of his niece, and without attributing all her personal beauty, as Mrs. Norris seemed to do, to her transplantation to Mansfield, he was pleased with himself, for having supplied everything else, education and manners she owed to him. Miss Crawford saw much of Sir Thomas's thoughts as he stood, and having, in spite of all his wrongs towards her, a general prevailing desire of recommending herself to him, took an opportunity of stepping aside to say something agreeable of Fanny. Her praise was warm, and he received it as she could wish, joining in it as far as discretion and politeness and slowness of speech would allow, and certainly appearing to greater advantage on the subject than his lady did soon afterwards, when Mary, perceiving her on a sofa very near, turned round before she began to dance, to compliment her on Miss Price's looks. "'Yes, she does look very well,' was Lady Bertram's placid reply. "'Chapman helped her dress. I sent Chapman to her.' Not but that she was really pleased to have Fanny admired, but she was so much more struck with her own kindness in sending Chapman to her, that she could not get it out of her head. Miss Crawford knew Mrs. Norris too well to think of gratifying her by commendation of Fanny. To her it was, as the occasion offered, "'Ah, ma'am, how much we want dear Mrs. Rushworth and Julia to-night!' and Mrs. Norris paid her with as many smiles and courteous words as she had time for, amid so much occupation as she found for herself, in making up card-tables, giving hints to Sir Thomas, and trying to move all the chaperones to a better part of the room. Miss Crawford blundered most towards Fanny herself, in her intentions to please. She meant to be giving her little heart a happy flutter, and filling her with sensations of delightful self-consequence, and misinterpreting Fanny's blushes, still thought she must be doing so when she went to her after the first two dances, and said, with a significant look, "'Perhaps you can tell me why my brother goes to town to-morrow. He says he has business there, but will not tell me what. The first time he ever denied me his confidence. But this is what we all come to. All are supplanted sooner or later. Now I must apply to you for information. Pray, what is Henry going for?' Fanny protested her ignorance as steadily as her embarrassment allowed. "'Well, then,' replied Miss Crawford, laughing, "'I must suppose it to be purely for the pleasure of conveying your brother, and talking of you by the way.' 
Fanny was confused, but it was the confusion of discontent, while Miss Crawford wondered she did not smile, and thought her over-anxious, or thought her odd, or thought her anything rather than insensible of pleasure in Henry's attentions. Fanny had a good deal of enjoyment in the course of the evening, but Henry's attentions had very little to do with it. She would much rather not have been asked by him again so very soon, and she wished she had not been obliged to suspect that his previous inquiries of Mrs. Norris about the supper-hour were all for the sake of securing her at that part of the evening. But it was not to be avoided. He made her feel that she was the object of all. Though she could not say that it was unpleasantly done, that there was indelicacy or ostentation in his manner and sometimes, when he talked of William, he was really not unagreeable, and showed even a warmth of heart which did him credit. But still, his attentions made no part of her satisfaction. She was happy whenever she looked at William, and saw how perfectly he was enjoying himself in every five minutes that she could walk about with him and hear his account of his partners. She was happy in knowing herself admired and she was happy in having the two dances with Edmund still to look forward to, during the greatest part of the evening, her hand being so eagerly sought after, that her indefinite engagement with him was in continual perspective. She was happy even when they did take place, but not from any flow of spirits on his side, or any such expressions of tender gallantry as had blessed the morning. His mind was fagged, and her happiness sprung from being the friend with whom it could find repose. I am worn out with civility said he. I have been talking incessantly all night, and with nothing to say. But with you, Fanny, there may be peace. You will not want to be talked to. Let us have the luxury of silence." Fanny would hardly even speak her agreement. A weariness arising probably in great measure from the same feelings which he had acknowledged in the morning, was peculiarly to be respected, and they went down their two dances together with such sober tranquillity as might satisfy any looker-on that Sir Thomas had been bringing up no wife for his younger son. The evening had afforded Edmund little pleasure. Miss Crawford had been in gay spirits when they first danced together, but it was not her gaiety that could do him good. It rather sank than raised his comfort and afterwards, for he found himself still impelled to seek her again, she had absolutely pained him by her manner of speaking of the profession to which he was now on the point of belonging. They had talked, and they had been silent. He had reasoned, she had ridiculed, and they had parted at last with mutual vexation. Fanny, not able to refrain entirely from observing them, had seen enough to be tolerably satisfied. It was barbarous to be happy when Edmund was suffering. Yet some happiness must and would arise from the very conviction that he did suffer. When her two dances with him were over, her inclination and strength for more were pretty well at an end, and Sir Thomas, having seen her walk rather than dance down the shortening set, breathless and with her hand at her side, gave his orders for her sitting down entirely. From that time Mr. Crawford sat down likewise. Poor Fanny! cried William, coming for a moment to visit her, and working away his partner's fan as if for life. "'How soon she is knocked up! Why, the sport is but just begun! I hope we shall keep it up these two hours. How can you be tired so soon?' "'So soon, my good friend,' said Sir Thomas, producing his watch with all necessary caution. "'It is three o'clock, and your sister is not used to these sort of hours.' "'Well, then, Fanny, you shall not get up to-morrow before I go. Sleep as long as you can, and never mind me.' "'Oh, William!' "'What? Did she think of being up before you set off?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' cried Fanny, rising eagerly from her seat to be nearer her uncle. "'I must get up and breakfast with him. It will be the last time, you know, the last morning.' "'You had better not. He is to have breakfasted and be gone by half-past nine. Mr. Crawford, I think you call for him at half-past nine. Fanny was too urgent, however, and had too many tears in her eyes for denial. It ended in a gracious, "'Well, well,' which was permission." "'Yes, half-past nine, said Crawford to William, as the latter was leaving them, "'and I shall be punctual, for there will be no kind sister to get up for me. "'And in a lower tone to Fanny, I shall have only a desolate house to hurry from. "'Your brother will find my ideas of time and his own very different to-morrow.' After a short consideration, Sir Thomas asked Crawford to join the early breakfast-party in that house instead of eating alone. He should himself be of it, and the readiness with which his invitation was accepted, convinced him that the suspicions whence, he must confess to himself, this very ball had in great measure sprung, were well founded. Mr. Crawford was in love with Fanny. He had a pleasing anticipation of what would be. 
His niece, meanwhile, did not thank him for what he had just done. She had hoped to have William all to herself the last morning. It would have been an unspeakable indulgence. But though her wishes were overthrown, there was no spirit of murmuring within her. On the contrary, she was so totally unused to have her pleasure consulted, or to have anything take place at all in the way she could desire, that she was more disposed to wonder and rejoice in having carried her point so far, than to repine at the counteraction which followed. Shortly afterwards, Sir Thomas was again interfering a little with her inclination, by advising her to go immediately to bed. Advise was his word, but it was the advice of absolute power, and she had only to rise, and with Mr. Crawford's very cordial adieus, pass quietly away, stopping at the entrance-door, like the lady of Branksome Hall, one moment and no more, to view the happy scene, and take a last look at the five or six determined couple who were still hard at work and then, creeping slowly up the principal staircase, pursued by the ceaseless country-dance, feverish with hopes and fears, soup and negus, sore-footed and fatigued, restless and agitated, yet feeling, in spite of everything, that a ball was indeed delightful. In thus sending her away, Sir Thomas perhaps might not be thinking merely of her health. It might occur to him that Mr. Crawford had been sitting by her long enough or he might mean to recommend her as a wife, by showing her persuadableness. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen The ball was over, and the breakfast was soon over, too. The last kiss was given, and William was gone. Mr. Crawford had, as he foretold, been very punctual, and short and pleasant had been the meal. After seeing William to the last moment, Fanny walked back into the breakfast-room with a very saddened heart to grieve over the melancholy change, and there her uncle kindly left her to cry in peace, conceiving, perhaps, that the deserted chair of each young man might exercise her tender enthusiasm, and that the remaining cold pork-bones and mustard in William's plate might but divide her feelings with the broken eggshells in Mr. Crawford's. She sat and cried con amore, as her uncle intended, but it was con amore fraternal, and no other. William was gone, and she now felt as if she had wasted half his visit in idle cares and selfish solicitudes unconnected with him. Fanny's disposition was such that she could never even think of her Aunt Norris in the meagreness and cheerlessness of her own small house, without reproaching herself for some little want of attention to her when they had been last together much less could her feelings acquit her of having done and said and thought everything by william that was due to him for a whole fortnight it was a heavy melancholy day soon after the second breakfast edmund bade them good-bye for a week and mounted his horse for peterborough and then all were gone nothing remained of last night but remembrances which she had nobody to share in she talked to her aunt Bertram, she must talk to somebody of the ball, but her aunt had seen so little of what passed, and had so little curiosity, that it was heavy work. Lady Bertram was not certain of anybody's dress, or anybody's place at supper, but her own. She could not recollect what it was that she had heard about one of the Miss Maddoxes, or what it was that Lady Prescott had noticed in Fanny. She was not sure whether Colonel Harrison had been talking of Mr. Crawford or of William, when he said he was the finest young man in the room. Somebody had whispered something to her. She had forgot to ask Sir Thomas what it could be. And these were her longest speeches and clearest communications. The rest was only a languid, "'Yes, yes, very well. Did you? Did he? I did not see that. I should not know one from the other.' This was very bad. It was only better than Mrs. Norris's sharp answers would have been. But she, being gone home with all the supernumerary jellies to nurse a sick maid, there was peace and good humour in their little party, though it could not boast much beside. The evening was heavy like the day. "'I cannot think what is the matter with me,' said Lady Bertram, when the tea-things were removed. "'I feel quite stupid. It must be sitting up so late last night. Fanny, you must do something to keep me awake. I cannot work. Fetch the cards. I feel so very stupid." The cards were brought, and Fanny played at cribbage with her aunt till bedtime, and as Sir Thomas was reading to himself, no sounds were heard in the room for the next two hours, beyond the reckonings of the game. "'And that makes thirty-one. Four in hand and eight in crib. You are to deal, ma'am. Shall I deal for you?' Fanny thought and thought again of the difference which twenty-four hours had made in that room, and all that part of the house. 
Last night it had been hope and smiles, bustle and motion, noise and brilliancy in the drawing-room and out of the drawing-room and everywhere. Now it was languor, and all but solitude. A good night's rest improved her spirits. She could think of William the next day more cheerfully, and as the morning afforded her an opportunity of talking over Thursday night with Mrs. Grant and Miss Crawford, in a very handsome style, with all the heightenings of imagination and all the laughs of playfulness which are so essential to the shade of a departed ball, she could afterwards bring her mind without much effort into its everyday state, and easily conform to the tranquillity of the present quiet week. They were indeed a smaller party than she had ever known there for a whole day together, and he was gone on whom the comfort and cheerfulness of every family meeting and every meal chiefly depended. But this must be learned to be endured. He would soon always be gone, and she was thankful that she could now sit in the same room with her uncle, hear his voice, receive his questions, and even answer them without such wretched feelings as she had formerly known. "'We miss our two young men.' was Sir Thomas's observation on both the first and second day, as they formed their very reduced circle after dinner, and in consideration of Fanny's swimming eyes, nothing more was said on the first day than to drink their good health. But on the second it led to something farther. William was kindly commended, and his promotion hoped for. "'And there is no reason to suppose,' added Sir Thomas, "'but that his visits to us may now be tolerably frequent. As to Edmund, we must learn to do without him." This will be the last winter of his belonging to us, as he has done." "'Yes,' said Lady Bertram, "'but I wish he was not going away. They are all going away, I think. I wish they would stay at home.' This wish was levelled principally at Julia, who had just applied for permission to go to town with Maria, and as Sir Thomas thought it best for each daughter that the permission should be granted, Lady Bertram, though in her own good nature she would not have prevented it, was lamenting the change it made in the prospect of Julia's return, which would otherwise have taken place about this time. A great deal of good sense followed on Sir Thomas's side, tending to reconcile his wife to the arrangement. Everything that a considerate parent ought to feel was advanced for her use and everything that an affectionate mother must feel in promoting her children's enjoyment was attributed to her nature. Lady Bertram agreed to it all with a calm, yes, and at the end of a quarter of an hour's silent consideration spontaneously observed, Sir Thomas, I have been thinking, and I am very glad we took Fanny as we did, for now the others are away, we feel the good of it. Sir Thomas immediately improved this compliment by adding, Very true. We show Fanny what a good girl we think her by praising her to her face. She is now a very valuable companion. If we have been kind to her, she is now quite as necessary to us." "'Yes,' said Lady Bertram presently, "'and it is a comfort to think that we shall always have her.' Sir Thomas paused, half smiled, glanced at his niece, and then gravely replied, "'She will never leave us, I hope, till invited to some other home that may reasonably promise her greater happiness than she knows here." And that is not very likely to be, Sir Thomas. Who should invite her? Maria might be very glad to see her at Southerton now and then, but she would not think of asking her to live there, and I am sure she is better off here, and besides I cannot do without her." The week which passed so quietly and peaceably at the great house in Mansfield had a very different character at the parsonage. To the young lady at least in each family it brought very different feelings. What was tranquillity and comfort to Fanny was tediousness and vexation to Mary. Something arose from difference of disposition and habit, one so easily satisfied, the other so unused to endure. But still more might be imputed to difference of circumstances. In some points of interest they were exactly opposed to each other. To Fanny's mind Edmund's absence was really in its cause and its tendency a relief. To Mary it was every way painful. She felt the want of his society every day, almost every hour, and was too much in want of it to derive anything but irritation from considering the object for which he went. He could not have devised anything more likely to raise his consequence than this week's absence, occurring as it did at the very time of her brother's going away, of William Price's going too, and completing the sort of general break-up of a party which had been so animated. She felt it keenly. They were now a miserable trio confined within doors by a series of rain and snow, with nothing to do and no variety to hope for. 
Angry as she was with Edmund for adhering to his own notions and acting on them in defiance of her, and she had been so angry that they had hardly parted friends at the ball, she could not help thinking of him continually when absent, dwelling on his merit and affection, and longing again for the almost daily meetings they lately had. His absence was unnecessarily long. He should not have planned such an absence, he should not have left home for a week, when her own departure from Mansfield was so near. Then she began to blame herself. She wished she had not spoken so warmly in their last conversation. She was afraid she had used some strong, some contemptuous expressions in speaking of the clergy, and that should not have been. It was ill-bred, it was wrong. She wished such words unsaid with all her heart. Her vexation did not end with the week. All this was bad, but she had still more to feel when Friday came round again, and brought no Edmund, when Saturday came, and still no Edmund, and when, through the silent communication with the other family which Sunday produced, she learned that he had actually written home to defer his return, having promised to remain some days longer with his friend. If she had felt impatience and regret before, if she had been sorry for what she said, and feared its too strong effect on him, she now felt and feared it all tenfold more. She had, moreover, to contend with one disagreeable emotion entirely new to her—jealousy. His friend Mr. Owen had sisters. He might find them attractive. But at any rate, his staying away at a time when, according to all preceding plans, she was to remove to London, meant something that she could not bear. Had Henry returned as he talked of doing at the end of three or four days, she should now have been leaving Mansfield. It became absolutely necessary for her to get to Fanny, and try to learn something more. She could not live any longer in such solitary wretchedness, and she made her way to the park, through difficulties of walking which she had deemed unconquerable a week before, for the chance of hearing a little in addition, for the sake of at least hearing his name. The first half-hour was lost, for Fanny and Lady Bertram were together, and unless she had Fanny to herself, she could hope for nothing. But at last Lady Bertram left the room, and then, almost immediately, Miss Crawford thus began, with a voice as well regulated as she could. "'And how do you like your cousin Edmund staying away so long? Being the only young person at home, I consider you as the greatest sufferer. You must miss him. Does his staying longer surprise you?' "'I do not know,' said Fanny, hesitatingly. "'Yes, I had not particularly expected it.' "'Perhaps he will always stay longer than he talks of. It is the general way all young men do.' "'He did not the only time he went to see Mr. Owen before.' "'He finds the house more agreeable now. He is a very—a very, a very pleasing young man himself, and I cannot help being rather concerned at not seeing him again before I go to London, as will now undoubtedly be the case.' I am looking for Henry every day, and as soon as he comes there will be nothing to detain me at Mansfield. I should like to have seen him once more, I confess. But you must give my compliments to him. Yes, I think it must be compliments. Is not there a something wanted, Miss Price, in our language, a something between compliments and—and and love, to suit the sort of friendly acquaintances we have had together, so many months' acquaintance? But compliments may be sufficient here. Was his letter a long one? Does he give you much account of what he is doing? Is it Christmas gaieties that he is staying for? I only heard a part of the letter. It was to my uncle, but I believe it was very short. Indeed, I am sure it was but a few lines. All that I heard was that his friend had pressed him to stay longer, and that he had agreed to do so. A few days longer, or some days longer, I am not quite sure which. Oh, if he wrote to his father! But I thought it might have been to Lady Bertram, or you. But if he wrote to his father, no wonder he was concise. Who could write chat to Sir Thomas? If he had written to you, there would have been more particulars. You would have heard of balls and parties. He would have sent you a description of everything and everybody. How many Miss Owens are there? Three grown up. Are they musical? I do not at all know. I never heard. That is the first question, you know," said Miss Crawford, trying to appear gay and unconcerned, which every woman who plays herself is sure to ask about another. But it is very foolish to ask questions about any young ladies, about any three sisters just grown up. For one knows, without being told, exactly what they are, all very accomplished and pleasing, and one very pretty. There is a beauty in every family. It is a regular thing. 
Two play on the pianoforte, and one on the harp, and all sing, or would sing if they were taught, or sing all the better for not being taught, or something like it. "'I know nothing of the Miss Owens,' said Fanny calmly. "'You know nothing, and you care less, as people say. Never did tone express indifference plainer. Indeed, how can one care for those one has never seen? Well, when your cousin comes back, he will find Mansfield very quiet.' all the noisy ones gone, your brother and mine and myself. I do not like the idea of leaving Mrs. Grant now the time draws near. She does not like my going." Fanny felt obliged to speak. "'You cannot doubt your being missed by many,' said she. "'You will be very much missed.' Miss Crawford turned her eye on her, as if wanting to hear or see more, and then laughingly said, "'Oh, yes!' Missed as every noisy evil is missed when it is taken away. That is, there is a great difference felt. But I am not fishing. Don't compliment me. If I am missed, it will appear. I may be discovered by those who want to see me. I shall not be in any doubtful or distant or unapproachable region." Now Fanny could not bring herself to speak, and Miss Crawford was disappointed, for she had hoped to hear some pleasant assurance of her power from one who she thought must know, and her spirits were clouded again. The Miss Owens, she said soon afterwards, suppose you were to have one of the Miss Owens settled at Thornton Lacey. How should you like it? Stranger things have happened. I dare say they are trying for it, and they are quite in the right, for it would be a very pretty establishment for them. I do not at all wonder or blame them. It is everybody's duty to do as well for themselves as they can. Sir Thomas Bertram's son is somebody, and now he is in their own line. Their father is a clergyman, and their brother is a clergyman, and they are all clergymen together. He is their lawful property. He fairly belongs to them." "'You don't speak, Fanny. Miss Price, you don't speak. But honestly, now, do not you rather expect it than otherwise?' "'No,' said Fanny stoutly. "'I do not expect it at all.' "'Not at all,' cried Miss Crawford with alacrity. "'I wonder at that. But I dare say you know exactly. I always imagine you are—' Perhaps you do not think him likely to marry at all, or not at present?" "'No, I do not,' said Fanny softly, hoping she did not err either in the belief or the acknowledgment of it. Her companion looked at her keenly, and gathering greater spirit from the blush soon produced from such a look, only said, "'He is best off as he is,' and turned the subject. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Miss Crawford's uneasiness was much lightened by this conversation, and she walked home again in spirits which might have defied almost another week of the same small party in the same bad weather, had they been put to the proof. But as that very evening brought her brother down from London again in quite, or more than quite, his usual cheerfulness, she had nothing further to try her own. His still refusing to tell her what he had gone for was but the promotion of gaiety. A day before it might have irritated but now it was a pleasant joke, suspected only of concealing something planned as a pleasant surprise to herself. And the next day did bring a surprise to her. Henry had said he should just go and ask the Bertrams how they did, and be back in ten minutes, but he was gone above an hour, and when his sister, who had been waiting for him to walk with her in the garden, met him at last most impatiently in the sweep, and cried out, "'My dear Henry, where can you possibly have been all this time?' He had only to say that he had been sitting with Lady Bertram and Fanny. "'Sitting with them an hour and a half!' exclaimed Mary. But this was only the beginning of her surprise. "'Yes, Mary,' said he, drawing her arm within his, and walking along the sweep as if not knowing where he was. "'I could not get away sooner. Fanny looked so lovely. I am quite determined, Mary. My mind is entirely made up. Will it astonish you? No. You must be aware that I am quite determined to marry Fanny Price.' The surprise was now complete, for in spite of whatever his consciousness might suggest, a suspicion of his having any such views had never entered his sister's imagination, and she looked so truly the astonishment she felt, that he was obliged to repeat what he had said, and more fully and more solemnly. The conviction of his determination once admitted, it was not unwelcome. There was even pleasure with the surprise. Mary was in a state of mind to rejoice in a connection with the Bertram family, and not to be displeased with her brother's marrying a little beneath him. "'Yes, Mary,' was Henry's concluding assurance, "'I am fairly caught. You know with what idle designs I began. But this is the end of them. 
I have, I flatter myself, made no inconsiderable progress in her affections, but my own are entirely fixed. "'Lucky, lucky girl!' cried Mary, as soon as she could speak. "'What a match for her! My dearest Henry, this must be my first feeling, but my second, which you shall have as sincerely, is that I approve your choice from my soul, and foresee your happiness as heartily as I wish and desire it. You will have a sweet little wife, all gratitude and devotion, exactly what you deserve. What an amazing match for her! Mrs. Norris often talks of her luck. What will she say now? The delight of all the family, indeed! And she has some true friends in it. How they will rejoice! But tell me all about it. Talk to me for ever. When did you begin to think seriously about her?" Nothing could be more impossible than to answer such a question, though nothing be more agreeable than to have it asked. How the pleasing plague had stolen on him he could not say, and before he had expressed the same sentiment with a little variation of words three times over, his sister eagerly interrupted him with, "'Ah, my dear Henry, and this is what took you to London. This was your business. You chose to consult the Admiral before you made up your mind.' But this he stoutly denied. He knew his uncle too well to consult him on any matrimonial scheme. The Admiral hated marriage, and thought it never pardonable in a young man of independent fortune. "'When Fanny is known to him,' continued Henry, "'he will dote on her. She is exactly the woman to do away every prejudice of such a man as the Admiral, for she is exactly such a woman as he thinks does not exist in the world. She is the very impossibility he would describe, if indeed he has now the delicacy of language enough to embody his own ideas. But till it is absolutely settled, settled beyond all interference, he shall know nothing of the matter.' "'No, Mary, you are quite mistaken. You have not discovered my business yet.' "'Well, well, I am satisfied. I know now to whom it must relate, and am in no hurry for the rest. Fanny Price! Wonderful, quite wonderful! That Mansfield should have done so much for—that you should have found your fate in Mansfield. But you are quite right. You could not have chosen better. There is not a better girl in the world, and you do not want for fortune, and as to her connections, they are more than good.' The Bertrams are undoubtedly some of the first people in this country. She is niece to Sir Thomas Bertram. That will be enough for the world. But go on, go on, tell me more. What are your plans? Does she know her own happiness?" No. What are you waiting for? For—for for very little more than opportunity. Mary, she is not like her cousins, but I think I shall not ask in vain. Oh, no, you cannot. Were you even less pleasing, supposing her not to love you already, of which, however, I can have little doubt, you would be safe. The gentleness and gratitude of her disposition would secure her all your own immediately. For my soul I do not think she would marry you without love. That is, if there is a girl in the world capable of being uninfluenced by ambition, I can suppose it to be her. But ask her to love you, and she will never have the heart to refuse." As soon as her eagerness could rest in silence, he was as happy to tell as she could be to listen, and a conversation followed almost as deeply interesting to her as to himself, though he had in fact nothing to relate but his own sensations, nothing to dwell on but Fanny's charms. Fanny's beauty of face and figure, Fanny's graces of manner and goodness of heart, were the exhaustless theme. The gentleness, modesty, and sweetness of her character were warmly expatiated on, that sweetness which makes so essential a part of every woman's worth in the judgment of man, that though he sometimes loves where it is not, he can never believe it absent. Her temper he had good reason to depend on and to praise. He had often seen it tried. Was there one of the family excepting Edmund who had not in some way or other continually exercised her patience and forbearance? Her affections were evidently strong to see her with her brother. What could more delightfully prove that the warmth of her heart was equal to its gentleness? What could be more encouraging to a man who had her love in view? Then her understanding was beyond every suspicion, quick and clear, and her manners were the mirror of her own modest and elegant mind. Nor was this all. Henry Crawford had too much sense not to feel the worth of good principles in a wife, though he was too little accustomed to serious reflection to know them by their proper name. But when he talked of her having such a steadiness and regularity of conduct, such a high notion of honour, and such an observance of decorum, as might warrant any man in the fullest dependence on her faith and integrity, he expressed what was inspired by the knowledge of her being well principled and religious. "'I could so wholly and absolutely confide in her,' said he, "'and that is what I want.' 
Well might his sister, believing as she really did that his opinion of Fanny Price was scarcely beyond her merits, rejoice in his prospects. "'The more I think of it,' she cried, "'the more I am convinced that you are doing quite right. And though I should never have selected Fanny Price as the girl most likely to attach you, I am now persuaded she is the very one to make you happy. Your wicked project upon her peace turns out a clever thought indeed. You will both find your good in it.' "'It was bad, very bad in me against such a creature. But I did not know her then. And she shall have no reason to lament the hour that first put it into my head. I will make her very happy, Mary, happier than she has ever yet been herself, or ever seen anybody else. I will not take her from Northamptonshire. I shall let Everingham, and rent a place in this neighbourhood, perhaps Stanwick's Lodge. I shall let a seven years' lease of Everingham. I am sure of an excellent tenant in half a word. I could name three people now, who would give me my own terms and thank me.' Ha! cried Mary. Settle in Northamptonshire, that is pleasant. Then we shall all be together. When she had spoken it, she recollected herself, and wished it unsaid. But there was no need of confusion, for her brother saw her only as the supposed inmate of Mansfield Parsonage, and replied but to invite her in the kindest manner to his own house, and to claim the best right in her. "'You must give us more than half your time,' said he. "'I cannot admit Mrs. Grant to have an equal claim with Fanny and myself, for we shall both have a right in you. Fanny will be so truly your sister.' Mary had only to be grateful and give general assurances, but she was now very fully purposed to be the guest of neither brother nor sister many months longer. "'You will divide your year between London and Northamptonshire?' "'Yes.' "'That's right. And in London, of course, a house of your own, no longer with the Admiral.' "'My dearest Henry, the advantage to you of getting away from the Admiral before your manners are hurt by the contagion of his, before you have contracted any of his foolish opinions, or learnt to sit over your dinner as if it were the best blessing of life, you are not sensible of the gain, for your regard for him has blinded you. But in my estimation, your marrying early may be the saving of you. To have seen you grow like the Admiral in word or deed, look or gesture, would have broke my heart.' "'Well, well, we do not quite think alike here. The Admiral has his faults, but he is a very good man, and has been more than a father to me. Few fathers would have let me have my own way half so much. You must not prejudice Fanny against him. I must have them love one another.' Mary refrained from saying what she felt, that there could not be two persons in existence whose characters and manners were less accordant. Time would discover it to him, but she could not help this reflection on the Admiral. "'Henry, I think so highly of Fanny Price, that if I could suppose the next Mrs. Crawford would have half the reason which my poor ill-used aunt had to abhor the very name, I would prevent the marriage, if possible. But I know you. I know that a wife you loved would be the happiest of women, and that even when you cease to love, she would yet find in you the liberality and good-breeding of a gentleman.' The impossibility of not doing everything in the world to make Fanny Price happy, or of ceasing to love Fanny Price, was, of course, the groundwork of his eloquent answer. "'Had you seen her this morning, Mary,' he continued, attending with such ineffable sweetness and patience to all the demands of her aunt's stupidity, working with her and for her, her colour beautifully heightened as she leant over the work, then returning to her seat to finish a note which she was previously engaged in writing for that stupid woman's service, and all this with such unpretending gentleness, so much as if it were a matter of course that she was not to have a moment at her own command, her hair arranged as neatly as it always is, and one little curl falling forward as she wrote, which she now and then shook back, and in the midst of all this, still speaking at intervals to me, or listening, and as if she liked to listen to what I said. Had you seen her so, Mary, you would not have implied the possibility of her power over my heart ever ceasing. "'My dearest Henry,' cried Mary, stopping short, and smiling in his face, "'how glad I am to see you so much in love! It quite delights me. But what will Mrs. Rushworth and Julia say?' "'I care neither what they say nor what they feel. They will now see what sort of woman it is that can attach me, that can attach a man of sense. I wish the discovery may do them any good.' and they will now see their cousin treated as she ought to be, and I wish they may be heartily ashamed of their own abominable neglect and unkindness. They will be angry," he added, after a moment's silence, and in a cooler tone. Mrs. Rushworth will be very angry. It will be a bitter pill to her. That is, like other bitter pills, it will have two moments ill flavour, and then be swallowed and forgotten, for I am not such a coxcomb as to suppose her feelings more lasting than other women's, though I was the object of them. Yes, Mary. My Fanny will feel a difference indeed, 
a daily, hourly difference in the behaviour of every being who approaches her. And it will be the completion of my happiness to know that I am the doer of it, that I am the person to give the consequence so justly her due. Now she is dependent, helpless, friendless, neglected, forgotten. Nay, Henry, not by all, not forgotten by all, not friendless or forgotten. Her cousin Edmund never forgets her. Edmund, true, I believe he is, generally speaking, kind to her, and so is Sir Thomas in his way. But it is the way of a rich, superior, long-worded, arbitrary uncle. What can Sir Thomas and Edmund together do? What do they do for her happiness, comfort, honour, and dignity in the world to what I shall do? End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Henry Crawford was at Mansfield Park again the next morning, and at an earlier hour than common visiting warrants. The two ladies were together in the breakfast-room, and, fortunately for him, Lady Bertram was on the very point of quitting it as he entered. She was almost at the door, and, not choosing by any means to take so much trouble in vain, she still went on, after a civil reception, a short sentence about being waited for, and a let Sir Thomas know to the servant. Henry, overjoyed to have her go, bowed and watched her off, and without losing another moment, turned instantly to Fanny, and taking out some letters, said, with a most animated look, "'I must acknowledge myself infinitely obliged to any creature who gives me such an opportunity of seeing you alone. I have been wishing it more than you can have any idea. Knowing, as I do, what your feelings as a sister are, I could hardly have borne that any one in the house should share with you in the first knowledge of the news I now bring. He is made.' Your brother is a lieutenant. I have the infinite satisfaction of congratulating you on your brother's promotion. Here are the letters which announce it this moment come to hand. You will, perhaps, like to see them." Fanny could not speak, but he did not want her to speak. To see the expression of her eyes, the change of her complexion, the progress of her feelings, their doubt, confusion, and felicity, was enough. She took the letters as he gave them. The first was from the Admiral, to inform his nephew, in a few words, of his having succeeded in the object he had undertaken, the promotion of young Price, and enclosing two more, one from the secretary of the First Lord to a friend, whom the Admiral had set to work in the business, the other from that friend to himself, by which it appeared that his Lordship had the very great happiness of attending to the recommendation of Sir Charles, that Sir Charles was much delighted in having such an opportunity of proving his regard for Admiral Crawford, and that the circumstances of Mr. William Price's commission as Second Lieutenant of Her Majesty's Sloop Thrush, being made out, was spreading general joy through a wide circle of great people. While her hand was trembling under these letters, her eye running from one to the other, and her heart swelling with emotion, Crawford thus continued, with unfeigned eagerness, to express his interest in the event. "'I will not talk of my own happiness,' said he, "'great as it is, for I think only of yours. Compared with you, who has a right to be happy? I have almost grudged myself my own prior knowledge of what you ought to have known before all the world. I have not lost a moment, however.' The post was late this morning, but there has not been since a moment's delay. How impatient, how anxious, how wild I have been on the subject, I will not attempt to describe. How severely mortified, how cruelly disappointed in not having it finished while I was in London. I was kept there from day to day in the hope of it, for nothing less dear to me than such an object would have detained me half the time from Mansfield. But though my uncle entered into my wishes with all the warmth I could desire, and exerted himself immediately, there were difficulties from the absence of one friend and the engagements of another, which at last I could no longer bear to stay the end of, and knowing in what good hands I left the cause, I came away on Monday, trusting that many posts would not pass before I should be followed by such very letters as these. My uncle, who is the very best man in the world, has exerted himself, as I knew he would after seeing your brother. He was delighted with him. I would not allow myself yesterday to say how delighted, or to repeat half that the Admiral said in his praise. I deferred it all till his praise should be proved the praise of a friend, as this day does prove it. Now I may say that even I could not require William Price to excite a greater interest, or be followed by warmer wishes and higher commendation, than were most voluntarily bestowed by my uncle, after the evening they passed together." "'Has this been all your doing, then?' cried Fanny. "'Good heaven! How very, very kind!' Have you really—was it by your desire? I beg your pardon, but I am bewildered. Did Admiral Crawford apply? How was it? I am stupefied." Henry was most happy to make it more intelligible, by beginning at an earlier stage, and explaining very particularly what he had done. 
His last journey to London had been undertaken with no other view than that of introducing her brother in Hill Street, and prevailing on the Admiral to exert whatever interest he might have for getting him on. This had been his business. He had communicated it to no creature. He had not breathed a syllable of it even to Mary, while uncertain of the issue he could not have borne any participation of his feelings, but this had been his business, and he spoke with such a glow of what his solicitude had been, and used such strong expressions, was so abounding in the deepest interest, in twofold motives, in views and wishes more than could be told, that Fanny could not have remained insensible of his drift, had she been able to attend. But her heart was so full, and her senses still so astonished, that she could listen but imperfectly, even to what he told her of William, and saying only when he paused, "'How kind! How very kind! Oh, Mr. Crawford, we are infinitely obliged to you, dearest, dearest William!' She jumped up and moved in haste towards the door, crying out, "'I will go to my uncle. My uncle ought to know it as soon as possible.' But this could not be suffered. The opportunity was too fair, and his feelings too impatient. He was after her immediately. She must not go. She must allow him five minutes longer. And he took her hand and led her back to her seat, and was in the middle of his further explanation, before she had suspected for what she was detained. When she did understand it, however, and found herself expected to believe that she had created sensations which his heart had never known before, and that everything he had done for William was to be placed to the account of his excessive and unequalled attachment to her, she was exceedingly distressed and for some moments unable to speak. She considered it all as nonsense, as mere trifling and gallantry, which meant only to deceive for the hour. She could not but feel that it was treating her improperly and unworthily, and in such a way as she had not deserved. But it was like himself, and entirely of a piece with what she had seen before. And she would not allow herself to show half the displeasure she felt, because he had been conferring an obligation which no want of delicacy on his part could make a trifle to her. While her heart was still bounding with joy and gratitude on William's behalf, she could not be severely resentful of anything that injured only herself. And after having twice drawn back her hand, and twice attempted in vain to turn away from him, she got up and said only, with much agitation, "'Don't, Mr. Crawford, pray don't. I beg you would not. This is a sort of talking which is very unpleasant to me. I must go away. I cannot bear it.' But he was still talking on, describing his affection, soliciting a return, and finally, in words so plain as to bear but one meaning, even to her, offering himself, hand, fortune, everything, to her acceptance. It was so. He had said it. Her astonishment and confusion increased, and though still not knowing how to suppose him serious, she could hardly stand. He pressed for an answer. "'No, no, no!' she cried, hiding her face. "'This is all nonsense. Do not distress me. I can hear no more of this. Your kindness to William makes me more obliged to you than words can express. But I do not want—I cannot bear—I must not listen to such—no, no, don't think of me. But you are not thinking of me. I know it is all nothing.' She had burst away from him, and at that moment Sir Thomas was heard speaking to a servant in his way towards the room they were in. It was no time for further assurances or entreaty, though to part with her at a moment when her modesty alone seemed to his sanguine and pre-assured mind to stand in the way of the happiness he sought, was a cruel necessity. She rushed out at an opposite door from the one her uncle was approaching, and was walking up and down the East Room in the utmost confusion of contrary feelings, before Sir Thomas's politeness and apologies were over, or he had reached the beginning of the joyful intelligence which his visitor came to communicate. She was feeling, thinking, trembling about everything. Agitated, happy, miserable, infinitely obliged, absolutely angry. It was all beyond belief. He was inexcusable, incomprehensible. But such were his habits, that he could do nothing without a mixture of evil. He had previously made her the happiest of human beings, and now he had insulted. She knew not what to say, how to class or how to regard it. She would not have him be serious. And yet what could excuse the use of such words and offers, if they meant but to trifle? But William was a lieutenant. That was a fact beyond a doubt, and without an alloy. She would think of it for ever, and forget all the rest. Mr. Crawford would certainly never address her so again. He must have seen how unwelcome it was to her, and in that case how gratefully she could esteem him for his friendship to William. She would not stir farther from the east room than the head of the great staircase, till she had satisfied herself of Mr. Crawford's having left the house. 
But when convinced of his being gone, she was eager to go down and be with her uncle, and have all the happiness of his joy as well as her own, and all the benefit of his information, or his conjectures, as to what would now be William's destination. Sir Thomas was as joyful as she could desire, and very kind and communicative, and she had so comfortable a talk with him about William as to make her feel as if nothing had occurred to vex her, till she found towards the close that Mr. Crawford was engaged to return and dine there that very day. This was a most unwelcome hearing, for though he might think nothing of what had passed, it would be quite distressing to her to see him again so soon. She tried to get the better of it, tried very hard as the dinner-hour approached, to feel and appear as usual, but it was quite impossible for her not to look most shy and uncomfortable when their visitor entered the room. She could not have supposed it in the power of any concurrence of circumstances to give her so many painful sensations on the first day of hearing of William's promotion. Mr. Crawford was not only in the room. He was soon close to her. He had a note to deliver from his sister. Fanny could not look at him, but there was no consciousness of past folly in his voice. She opened her note immediately, glad to have anything to do, and happy, as she read it, to feel that the fidgetings of her Aunt Norris, who was also to dine there, screened her a little from view. "'My dear Fanny, for so I may now always call you, to the infinite relief of a tongue that has been stumbling at Miss Price for at least the last six weeks, I cannot let my brother go without sending you a few lines of general congratulation, and giving my most joyful consent and approval.' Go on, my dear Fanny, and without fear. There can be no difficulties worth naming. I choose to suppose that the assurance of my consent will be something. So you may smile upon him with your sweetest smiles this afternoon, and send him back to me even happier than he goes. Yours affectionately, M. C. These were not expressions to do Fanny any good, for though she read in too much haste and confusion to form the clearest judgment of Miss Crawford's meaning, it was evident that she meant to compliment her on her brother's attachment, and even to appear to believe it serious. She did not know what to do or what to think. There was wretchedness in the idea of its being serious. There was perplexity and agitation every way. She was distressed whenever Mr. Crawford spoke to her, and he spoke to her much too often and she was afraid there was a something in his voice and manner in addressing her, very different from what they were when he talked to the others. Her comfort in that day's dinner was quite destroyed. She could hardly eat anything, and when Sir Thomas good-humouredly observed that joy had taken away her appetite, she was ready to sink with shame, from the dread of Mr. Crawford's interpretation. For though nothing could have tempted her to turn her eyes to the right hand where he sat, she felt that his were immediately directed towards her. She was more silent than ever. She would hardly join even when William was the subject, for his commission came all from the right hand too, and there was pain in the connection. She thought Lady Bertram sat longer than ever, and began to be in despair of ever getting away. But at last they were in the drawing-room, and she was able to think as she would, while her aunts finished the subject of William's appointment in their own style. Mrs. Norris seemed as much delighted with the saving it would be to Sir Thomas as with any part of it. Now William would be able to keep himself, which would make a vast difference to his uncle, for it was unknown how much he had cost his uncle, and indeed it would make some difference in her presence, too. She was very glad that she had given William what she did at parting, very glad indeed that it had been in her power, without material inconvenience just at that time, to give him something rather considerable, that is, for her with her limited means, for now it would all be useful in helping to fit up his cabin. She knew he must be at some expense, that he would have many things to buy, though to be sure his father and mother would be able to put him in the way of getting everything very cheap, but she was very glad that she had contributed her mite towards it. "'I am glad you gave him something considerable,' said Lady Bertram, with most unsuspicious calmness, "'for I gave him only ten pounds.' "'Indeed!' cried Mrs. Norris, reddening. Upon my word, he must have gone on with his pockets well lined, and at no expense for his journey to London either. Sir Thomas told me ten pounds would be enough. Mrs. Norris, being not at all inclined to question its sufficiency, began to take the matter in another point. It is amazing, said she, how much young people cost their friends, what with bringing them up and putting them out in the world. They little think how much it comes to, or what their parents or their uncles and aunts pay for them in the course of the year. Now here are my sister Price's children. Take them all together. I dare say nobody would believe what a sum they cost Sir Thomas every year, to say nothing of what I do for them. 
"'Very true, sister, as you say. But poor things, they cannot help it. And you know it makes very little difference to Sir Thomas. Fanny, William must not forget my shawl if he goes to the East Indies, and I shall give him a commission for anything else that is worth having. I wish he may go to the East Indies, that I may have my shawl. I think I will have two shawls, Fanny." Fanny, meanwhile, speaking only when she could not help it, was very earnestly trying to understand what Mr. and Miss Crawford were at. There was everything in the world against their being serious, but his words and manner. Everything natural, probable, reasonable was against it. All their habits and ways of thinking, and all her own demerits. How could she have excited serious attachment in a man who had seen so many, and been admired by so many, and flirted with so many, infinitely her superiors, who seemed so little open to serious impressions, even where pains had been taken to please him, who thought so slightly, so carelessly, so unfeelingly on all such points, who was everything to everybody, and seemed to find no one essential to him? And further, how could it be supposed that his sister, with all her high and worldly notions of matrimony, would be forwarding anything of a serious nature in such a quarter. Nothing could be more unnatural in either. Fanny was ashamed of her own doubts. Everything might be possible rather than serious attachment or serious approbation of it toward her. She had quite convinced herself of this, before Sir Thomas and Mr. Crawford joined them. The difficulty was in maintaining the conviction quite so absolutely, after Mr. Crawford was in the room. For once or twice a look seemed forced on her, which she did not know how to class among the common meaning. In any other man, at least, she would have said that it meant something very earnest, very pointed. But she still tried to believe it no more than what he might often have expressed towards her cousins and fifty other women. She thought he was wishing to speak to her unheard by the rest. She fancied he was trying for it the whole evening at intervals, whenever Sir Thomas was out of the room, or at all engaged with Mrs. Norris, and she carefully refused him at every opportunity. At last—it seemed an at last to Fanny's nervousness, though not remarkably late—he began to talk of going away. But the comfort of the sound was impaired by his turning to her the next moment, and saying, "'You have nothing to send to Mary? No answer to her note? She will be disappointed if she receives nothing from you. Pray write to her, if it be only a line." "'Oh, yes, certainly,' cried Fanny, rising in haste, the haste of embarrassment, and of wanting to get away. "'I will write directly.' She went accordingly to the table, where she was in the habit of writing for her aunt, and prepared her materials, without knowing what in the world to say. She had read Miss Crawford's note only once, and how to reply to anything so imperfectly understood was most distressing. Quite unpractised in such sort of note-writing, had there been time for scruples and fears as to style, she would have felt them in abundance. But something must be instantly written, and with only one decided feeling, that of wishing not to appear to think anything really intended, she wrote thus, in great trembling both of spirits and hand. I am very much obliged to you, my dear Miss Crawford, for your kind congratulations, as far as they relate to my dearest William. The rest of your note, I know, means nothing but I am so unequal to anything of the sort, that I hope you will excuse my begging you to take no further notice. I have seen too much of Mr. Crawford not to understand his manners. If he understood me as well, he would, I dare say, behave differently. I do not know what I write, but it would be a great favour of you never to mention the subject again. With thanks for the honour of your note, I remain, dear Miss Crawford, etc., etc. The conclusion was scarcely intelligible from increasing fright, for she found that Mr. Crawford, under pretence of receiving the note, was coming towards her. "'You cannot think I mean to hurry you,' said he in an undervoice, perceiving the amazing trepidation with which she made up the note. "'You cannot think I have any such object. Do not hurry yourself, I entreat.' "'Oh, I thank you. I have quite done, just done. It will be ready in a moment. I am very much obliged to you, if you will be so good as to give that to Miss Crawford.' The note was held out and must be taken, and as she instantly and with averted eyes walked towards the fireplace where sat the others, he had nothing to do but to go in good earnest. Fanny thought she had never known a day of greater agitation, both of pain and pleasure. But happily, the pleasure was not of a sort to die with the day, for every day would restore the knowledge of William's advancement, whereas the pain, she hoped, would return no more. She had no doubt that her note must appear excessively ill-written, that the language would disgrace a child, for her distress had allowed no arrangement. 
but at least it would assure them both of her being neither imposed on nor gratified by Mr. Crawford's attentions. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Fanny had by no means forgotten Mr. Crawford when she awoke the next morning, but she remembered the purport of her note, and was not less sanguine as to its effect than she had been the night before. If Mr. Crawford would but go away! That was what she most earnestly desired—go and take his sister with him, as he was to do. And why it was not done already she could not devise, for Miss Crawford certainly wanted no delay. Fanny had hoped, in the course of his yesterday's visit, to hear the day named, but he had only spoken of their journey as what would take place ere long. Having so satisfactorily settled the conviction her note would convey, she could not but be astonished to see Mr. Crawford, as she accidentally did, coming up to the house again, and at an hour as early as the day before. His coming might have nothing to do with her, but she must avoid seeing him if possible. And being there in her way upstairs, she resolved there to remain, during the whole of his visit, unless actually sent for and as Mrs. Norris was still in the house, there seemed little danger of her being wanted. She sat some time in a good deal of agitation, listening, trembling, and fearing to be sent for every moment, but as no footsteps approached the east room, she grew gradually composed, could sit down and be able to employ herself, and able to hope that Mr. Crawford had come, and would go, without her being obliged to know anything of the matter. Nearly half an hour had passed, and she was growing very comfortable, when suddenly the sound of a step in regular approach was heard. A heavy step. An unusual step in that part of the house. It was her uncle's. She knew it as well as his voice. She had trembled at it as often, and began to tremble again, at the idea of his coming up to speak to her, whatever might be the subject. It was indeed Sir Thomas who opened the door, and asked if she were there, and if he might come in. The terror of his former occasional visits to that room seemed all renewed, and she felt as if he were going to examine her again in French and English. She was all attention, however, in placing a chair for him, and trying to appear honoured, and in her agitation had quite overlooked the deficiencies of her apartment, till he, stopping short as he entered, said with much surprise, "'Why have you no fire to-day?' There was snow on the ground, and she was sitting in a shawl. She hesitated. "'I am not cold, sir. I never sit here long at this time of year." "'But you have a fire in general?' "'No, sir.' "'How comes this about? Here must be some mistake. I understood that you had the use of this room by way of making you perfectly comfortable. In your bedchamber I know you cannot have a fire. Here is some great misapprehension which must be rectified. It is highly unfit for you to sit, be it only half an hour a day, without a fire. You are not strong. You are chilly. Your aunt cannot be aware of this. Fanny would rather have been silent, but being obliged to speak, she could not forbear, in justice to the aunt she loved best, from saying something in which the words, My Aunt Norris, were distinguishable. "'I understand,' cried her uncle, recollecting himself, and not wanting to hear more. "'I understand. Your Aunt Norris has always been an advocate, and very judiciously, for young people's being brought up without unnecessary indulgences. But there should be moderation in everything.' She is also very hardy herself, which of course will influence her in her opinion of the wants of others. And on another account, too, I can perfectly comprehend. I know what her sentiments have always been. The principle was good in itself, but it may have been, and I believe has been carried too far in your case. I am aware that there has been sometimes, in some points, a misplaced distinction, but I think too well of you, Fanny, to suppose you will ever harbour resentment on that account. You have an understanding, which will prevent you from receiving things only in part, and judging partially by the event. You will take in the whole of the past. You will consider times, persons, and probabilities, and you will feel that they were not least your friends who were educating and preparing you for that mediocrity of condition which seemed to be your lot. Though their caution may prove eventually unnecessary, it was kindly meant, and of this you may be assured that every advantage of affluence will be doubled by the little privations and restrictions that may have been imposed. I am sure you will not disappoint my opinion of you, by failing at any time to treat your Aunt Norris with the respect and attention that are due to her. But enough of this. Sit down, my dear. I must speak to you for a few minutes, but I will not detain you long." Fanny obeyed, with eyes cast down and colour rising. After a moment's pause, Sir Thomas, trying to suppress a smile, went on. 
You are not aware, perhaps, that I have had a visitor this morning. I had not been long in my own room after breakfast, when Mr. Crawford was shown in. His errand you may probably conjecture." Fanny's colour grew deeper and deeper, and her uncle, perceiving that she was embarrassed to a degree that made either speaking or looking up quite impossible, turned away his own eyes, and without any farther pause, proceeded in his account of Mr. Crawford's visit. Mr. Crawford's business had been to declare himself the lover of Fanny, make decided proposals for her, and entreat the sanction of the uncle, who seemed to stand in the place of her parents and he had done it all so well, so openly, so liberally, so properly, that Sir Thomas, feeling, moreover, his own replies and his own remarks to have been very much to the purpose, was exceedingly happy to give the particulars of their conversation, and, little aware of what was happening in his niece's mind, conceived that by such details he must be gratifying her far more than himself. He talked, therefore, for several minutes, without Fanny's daring to interrupt him. She had hardly even attained the wish to do it. Her mind was in too much confusion. She had changed her position, and with her eyes fixed intently on one of the windows, was listening to her uncle, in the utmost perturbation and dismay. For a moment he ceased, but she had barely become conscious of it, when, rising from his chair, he said, "'And now, Fanny, having performed one part of my commission, and shown you everything placed on a basis the most assured and satisfactory, I may execute the remainder by prevailing on you to accompany me downstairs, where, though I cannot but presume on having been no unacceptable companion myself, I must submit to your finding one still better worth listening to. Mr. Crawford, as you have perhaps foreseen, is yet in the house. He is in my room, and hoping to see you there." There was a look, a start, an exclamation on hearing this, which astonished Sir Thomas. But what was his increase of astonishment on hearing her exclaim, "'Oh, no, sir, I cannot, indeed I cannot go down to him. Mr. Crawford ought to know. He must know that. I told him enough yesterday to convince him. He spoke to me on this subject yesterday, and I told him without disguise that it was very disagreeable to me, and quite out of my power to return his good opinion.' "'I do not catch your meaning,' said Sir Thomas, sitting down again out of your power to return his good opinion. What is all this? I know he spoke to you yesterday, and, as far as I understand, received as much encouragement to proceed as a well-judging young woman could permit herself to give. I was very much pleased with what I collected to have been your behaviour on the occasion. It showed a discretion highly to be commended. But now, when he has made his overture so properly, and honourably, what are your scruples now? "'You are mistaken, Sir Thomas,' cried Fanny, forced by the anxiety of the moment, even to tell her uncle that he was wrong. "'You are quite mistaken. How could Mr. Crawford say such a thing? I gave him no encouragement yesterday. On the contrary, I told him—I cannot recollect my exact words, but I am sure I told him that I would not listen to him, that it was very unpleasant to me in every respect, and that I begged him never to talk to me in that manner again. I am sure I said as much as that, and more, and I should have said still more, if I had been quite certain of his meaning anything seriously. But I did not like to be—I could not bear to be—imputing more than might be intended. I thought it might all pass for nothing with him." She could say no more. Her breath was almost gone. "'Am I to understand,' said Sir Thomas, after a few moments' silence, "'that you mean to refuse Mr. Crawford?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Refuse him?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Refuse, Mr. Crawford. Upon what plea? For what reason? I, I cannot like him, sir, well enough to marry him.' "'This is very strange,' said Sir Thomas, in a voice of calm displeasure. "'There is something in this which my comprehension does not reach. Here is a young man wishing to pay his addresses to you, with everything to recommend him, not merely situation in life, fortune and character, but with more than common agreeableness, with address and conversation pleasing to everybody and he is not an acquaintance of to-day. You have now known him some time. His sister, moreover, is your intimate friend, and he has been doing that for your brother, which I should suppose would have been almost sufficient recommendation to you, had there been no other. It is very uncertain when my interest might have got William on. He has done it already." "'Yes,' said Fanny, in a faint voice, and looking down with fresh shame. And she did feel almost ashamed of herself, after such a picture as her uncle had drawn, for not liking Mr. Crawford. "'You must have been aware,' continued Sir Thomas presently, "'you must have been some time aware of a particularity in Mr. Crawford's manners to you.' 
this cannot have taken you by surprise. You must have observed his attentions, and though you always received them very properly, I have no accusation to make on that head, I never perceived them to be unpleasant to you. I am half inclined to think, Fanny, that you do not quite know your own feelings." "'Oh, yes, sir, indeed I do. His attentions were always what I did not like.' Sir Thomas looked at her with deeper surprise. "'This is beyond me,' said he. "'This requires explanation. Young as you are, and having seen scarcely any one, it is hardly possible that your affections—' He paused, and eyed her fixedly. He saw her lips formed into a no, though the sound was inarticulate, but her face was like scarlet. That, however, in so modest a girl, might be very compatible with innocence, and choosing at least to appear satisfied, he quickly added, "'No, no, I know that is quite out of the question, quite impossible. Well, there is nothing more to be said.' And for a few minutes he did say nothing. He was deep in thought. His niece was deep in thought likewise, trying to harden and prepare herself against farther questioning. She would rather die than own the truth, and she hoped by a little reflection to fortify herself beyond betraying it. "'Independently of the interest which Mr. Crawford's choice seemed to justify,' said Sir Thomas, beginning again, and very composedly, "'his wishing to marry at all so early is recommendatory to me. I am an advocate for early marriages, where there are means in proportion, and would have every young man with a sufficient income settle as soon after four-and-twenty as he can.' This is so much my opinion, that I am sorry to think how little likely my own eldest son, your cousin Mr. Bertram, is to marry early. But at present, as far as I can judge, matrimony makes no part of his plans or thoughts. I wish he were more likely to fix." Here was a glance at Fanny. "'Edmund, I consider from his disposition and habits, as much more likely to marry early than his brother. He, indeed, I have lately thought has seen the woman he could love, which, I am convinced, my eldest son has not. Am I right? Do you agree with me, my dear?" "'Yes, sir.' It was gently, but it was calmly said, and Sir Thomas was easy on the score of the cousins. But the removal of his alarm did his niece no service. As her unaccountableness was confirmed, his displeasure increased and getting up and walking about the room with a frown which fanny could picture to herself though she dared not lift up her eyes he shortly afterwards and in a voice of authority said have you any reason child to think ill of mr crawford's temper no sir she longed to add but of his principles i have but her heart sunk under the appalling prospect of discussion explanation and probably non-conviction her ill opinion of him was founded chiefly on observations which, for her cousin's sake, she could scarcely dare mention to their father. Maria and Julia, especially Maria, were so closely implicated in Mr. Crawford's misconduct, that she could not give his character, such as she believed it, without betraying them. She had hoped that to a man like her uncle, so discerning, so honourable, so good, the simple acknowledgment of settled dislike on her side would have been sufficient. To her infinite grief she found it was not. Sir Thomas came towards the table where she sat in trembling wretchedness, and with a good deal of cold sternness said, "'It is of no use, I perceive, to talk to you. We had better put an end to this most mortifying conference. Mr. Crawford must not be kept longer waiting. I will, therefore, only add, as thinking it my duty to mark my opinion of your conduct, that you have disappointed every expectation I had formed, and proved yourself of a character the very reverse of what I had supposed.' for I had, Fanny, as I think my behaviour must have shown, formed a very favourable opinion of you from the period of my return to England. I had thought you peculiarly free from wilfulness of temper, self-conceit, and every tendency to that independence of spirit which prevails so much in modern days, even in young women, and which in young women is offensive and disgusting beyond all common offence. But you have now shown me that you can be wilful and perverse, that you can and will decide for yourself, without any consideration or deference for those who have surely some right to guide you, without even asking their advice. You have shown yourself very, very different from anything that I had imagined. The advantage or disadvantage of your family, of your parents, your brothers and sisters, never seems to have had a moment's share in your thoughts on this occasion. How they might be benefited! How they must rejoice in such an establishment for you, is nothing to you. You think only of yourself, and because you do not feel for Mr. Crawford exactly what a young, heated fancy imagines to be necessary for happiness, you resolve to refuse him at once, without wishing even for a little time to consider of it. 
a little more time for cool consideration, and for really examining your own inclinations, and are, in a wild fit of folly, throwing away from you such an opportunity of being settled in life, eligibly, honourably, nobly settled, as will probably never occur to you again. Here is a young man of sense, of character, of temper, of manners, and of fortune, exceedingly attached to you, and seeking your hand in the most handsome and disinterested way. And let me tell you, Fanny, that you may live eighteen years longer in the world, without being addressed by a man of half Mr. Crawford's estate, or a tenth part of his merits. Gladly would I have bestowed either of my own daughters on him. Maria is nobly married, but had Mr. Crawford sought Julia's hand, I should have given it to him with superior and more heartfelt satisfaction than I gave Maria's to Mr. Rushworth. After half a moment's pause, and I should have been very much surprised had either of my daughters, on receiving a proposal of marriage at any time, which might carry with it only half the eligibility of this, immediately and peremptorily, and without paying my opinion or my regard the compliment of any consultation, put a decided negative on it. I should have been much surprised and much hurt by such a proceeding. I should have thought it a gross violation of duty and respect. You are not to be judged by the same rule. You do not owe me the duty of a child. But, Fanny, if your heart can acquit you of ingratitude—' He ceased. Fanny was by this time crying so bitterly, that, angry as he was, he would not press that article farther. Her heart was almost broke by such a picture of what she appeared to him by such accusations, so heavy, so multiplied, so rising in dreadful gradation, self-willed, obstinate, selfish, and ungrateful. He thought her all this. She had deceived his expectations. She had lost his good opinion. What was to become of her? "'I am very sorry,' she said inarticulately through her tears. "'I am very sorry indeed.' "'Sorry? Yes. I hope you are sorry. And you will probably have reason to be long sorry for this day's transactions.' "'If it were possible for me to do otherwise,' said she, with another strong effort, "'but I am so perfectly convinced that I could never make him happy, and that I should be miserable myself.' Another burst of tears. But in spite of that burst, and in spite of that great black word, miserable, which served to introduce it, Sir Thomas began to think a little relenting, a little change of inclination, might have something to do with it, and to augur favourably from the personal entreaty of the young man himself. He knew her to be very timid, and exceedingly nervous, and thought it not improbable that her mind might be in such a state, as a little time, a little pressing, a little patience, and a little impatience, a judicious mixture of all on the lover's side, might work their usual effect on. If the gentleman would but persevere, if he had but love enough to persevere, Sir Thomas began to have hopes, and these reflections having passed across his mind and cheered it, well, said he, in a tone of becoming gravity, but of less anger. Well, child, dry up your tears. There is no use in these tears. They can do no good. You must now come downstairs with me. Mr. Crawford has been kept waiting too long already. You must give him your own answer. We cannot expect him to be satisfied with less. And you can only explain to him the grounds of that misconception of your sentiments, which, unfortunately for himself, he certainly has imbibed. I am totally unequal to it. But Fanny showed such reluctance, such misery at the idea of going down to him, that Sir Thomas, after a little consideration, judged it better to indulge her. His hopes from both gentleman and lady suffered a small depression in consequence. But when he looked at his niece, and saw a state of feature and complexion which her crying had brought her into, he thought there might be as much lost as gained by an immediate interview. With a few words, therefore, of no particular meaning, he walked off by himself leaving his poor niece to sit and cry over what had passed, with very wretched feelings. Her mind was all disorder. The past, present, future, everything was terrible. But her uncle's anger gave her the severest pain of all. Selfish and ungrateful! To have appeared so to him! She was miserable for ever. She had no one to take her part, to counsel or speak for her. Her only friend was absent. He might have softened his father. But all, perhaps all, would think her selfish and ungrateful. She might have to endure the reproach again and again. She might hear it, or see it, or know it to exist for ever in every connection about her. She could not but feel some resentment against Mr. Crawford. Yet if he really loved her, and were unhappy too, it was all wretchedness together. 
In about a quarter of an hour her uncle returned. She was almost ready to faint at the sight of him. He spoke calmly, however, without austerity, without reproach, and she revived a little. There was comfort, too, in his words, as well as his manner, for he began with, "'Mr. Crawford is gone. He has just left me. I need not repeat what has passed. I do not want to add to anything you may now be feeling, by an account of what he has felt. Suffice it that he has behaved in the most gentlemanlike and generous manner, and has confirmed me in a most favourable opinion of his understanding, heart, and temper. Upon my representation of what you were suffering, he immediately, and with the greatest delicacy, ceased to urge to see you for the present." Here Fanny, who had looked up, looked down again. "'Of course,' continued her uncle, "'it cannot be supposed but that he should request to speak with you alone, be it only for five minutes, a request too natural, a claim too just to be denied. But there is no time fixed, perhaps to-morrow, or whenever your spirits are composed enough. For the present you have only to tranquillise yourself. Check these tears, they do but exhaust you. If, as I am willing to suppose, you wish to show me any observance, you will not give way to these emotions, but endeavour to reason yourself into a stronger frame of mind. I advise you to go out. The air will do you good. Go out for an hour on the gravel. You will have the shrubbery to yourself, and will be the better for air and exercise. And Fanny, turning back again for a moment, I shall make no mention below of what has passed. I shall not even tell your Aunt Bertram. There is no occasion for spreading the disappointment. Say nothing about it yourself." This was an order to be most joyfully obeyed. This was an act of kindness which Fanny felt at her heart. To be spared from her Aunt Norris's interminable reproaches. He left her in a glow of gratitude. Anything might be bearable rather than such reproaches. Even to see Mr. Crawford would be less overpowering. She walked out directly as her uncle recommended, and followed his advice throughout as far as she could did check her tears, did earnestly try to compose her spirits, and strengthen her mind. She wished to prove to him that she did desire his comfort, and sought to regain his favour, and he had given her another strong motive for exertion, in keeping the whole affair from the knowledge of her aunts. Not to excite suspicion by her look or manner was now an object worth attaining, and she felt equal to almost anything that might save her from her aunt Norris. She was struck, quite struck, when on returning from her walk, and going into the east room again, the first thing which caught her eye was a fire lighted and burning. A fire! It seemed too much. Just at that time to be giving her such an indulgence was exciting even painful gratitude. She wondered that Sir Thomas could have leisure to think of such a trifle again, but she soon found, from the voluntary information of the housemaid who came in to attend it, that so it was to be every day. Sir Thomas had given orders for it. "'I must be a brute indeed if I can be really ungrateful,' said she in soliloquy. "'Heaven defend me from being ungrateful!' She saw nothing more of her uncle, nor of her aunt Norris, till they met at dinner. Her uncle's behaviour to her was then nearly as possible what it had been before. She was sure he did not mean there should be any change, and that it was only her own conscience that could fancy any. But her aunt was soon quarrelling with her and when she found how much and how unpleasantly her having only walked out without her aunt's knowledge could be dwelt on, she felt all the reason she had to bless the kindness which saved her from the same spirit of reproach exerted on a more momentous subject. "'If I had known you were going out, I should have got you just to go as far as my house with some orders for Nanny,' said she, which I have since, to my very great inconvenience, been obliged to go and carry myself. I could very ill spare the time, and you might have saved me the trouble, if you would only have been so good as to let us know you were going out. It would have made no difference to you, I suppose, whether you had walked in the shrubbery, or gone to my house." "'I recommended the shrubbery to Fanny as the driest place,' said Sir Thomas. "'Oh,' said Mrs. Norris, with a moment's check, "'that was very kind of you, Sir Thomas. But you do not know how dry the path is to my house. Fanny would have got quite as good a walk there, I assure you, with the advantage of being some use, and obliging her aunt. It is all her fault, if she would have but let us know she was going out. But there is a something about Fanny. I have often observed it before. She likes to go her own way to work. She does not like to be dictated to. She takes her own independent walk whenever she can. She certainly has a little spirit of secrecy and independence and nonsense about her, which I would advise her to get the better of." As a general reflection on Fanny, Sir Thomas thought nothing could be more unjust, though he had been so lately expressing the same sentiments himself. 
and he tried to turn the conversation, tried repeatedly before he could succeed, for Mrs. Norris had not discernment enough to perceive, either now or at any other time, to what degree he thought well of his niece, or how very far he was from wishing to have his own children's merit set off by the depreciation of hers. She was talking at Fanny, and resenting this private walk, half through the dinner. It was over, however, at last and the evening set in with more composure to Fanny, and more cheerfulness of spirits, than she could have hoped for, after so stormy a morning. But she trusted in the first place that she had done right, that her judgment had not misled her, for the purity of her intention she could answer, and she was willing to hope, secondly, that her uncle's displeasure was abating, and would abate farther as he considered the matter with more impartiality, and felt, as a good man must feel, how wretched and how unpardonable, how hopeless and how wicked it was, to marry without affection. When the meeting with which she was threatened for the morrow was past, she could not but flatter herself that the subject would be finally concluded, and Mr. Crawford once gone from Mansfield, that everything would soon be as if no such subject had existed. She would not, could not believe, that Mr. Crawford's affection for her could distress him long. His mind was not of that sort. London would soon bring its cure. In London he would soon learn to wonder at his infatuation, and be thankful for the right reason in her, which had saved him from its evil consequences. While Fanny's mind was engaged in these sort of hopes, her uncle was soon after tea called out of the room, an occurrence too common to strike her, and she thought nothing of it, till the butler reappeared ten minutes afterwards, and advancing decidedly towards herself, said, "'Sir Thomas wishes to speak with you, ma'am, in his own room.' Then it occurred to her what might be going on, a suspicion rushed over her mind which drove the colour from her cheeks. But instantly rising, she was preparing to obey, when Mrs. Norris called out, "'Stay, stay, Fanny! What are you about? Where are you going? Don't be in such a hurry. Depend upon it, it is not you that are wanted. Depend upon it, it is me,' looking at the butler. "'But you are so very eager to put yourself forward. What should Sir Thomas want you for? It is me badly, you mean. I am coming this moment. You mean me badly, I am sure. Sir Thomas wants me, not Miss Price." But badly was stout. "'No, ma'am, it is Miss Price. I am certain of its being Miss Price.' And there was a half-smile with the words which meant, "'I do not think you would answer the purpose at all.' Mrs. Norris, much discontented, was obliged to compose herself to work again and Fanny, walking off in agitating consciousness, found herself, as she anticipated, in another minute alone with Mr. Crawford. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen The conference was neither so short nor so conclusive as the lady had designed. The gentleman was not so easily satisfied. He had all the disposition to persevere that Sir Thomas could wish him. He had vanity, which strongly inclined him in the first place to think she did love him, though she might not know it herself, and which, secondly, when constrained at last to admit that she did know her own present feelings, convinced him that he should be able in time to make those feelings what he wished. He was in love, very much in love, and it was a love which, operating on an active, sanguine spirit, of more warmth than delicacy, made her affection appear of greater consequence, because it was withheld, and determined him to have the glory, as well as the felicity, of forcing her to love him. He would not despair, he would not desist. He had every well-grounded reason for solid attachment. He knew her to have all the worth that could justify the warmest hopes of lasting happiness with her. Her conduct at this very time, by speaking the disinterestedness and delicacy of her character, qualities which he believed most rare indeed, was of a sort to heighten all his wishes, and confirm all his resolutions. He knew not that he had a pre-engaged heart to attack. Of that he had no suspicion. He considered her rather as one who had never thought on the subject enough to be in danger, who had been guarded by youth, a youth of mind as lovely as of person, whose modesty had prevented her from understanding his attentions, and who was still overpowered by the suddenness of addresses so wholly unexpected, and the novelty of a situation which her fancy had never taken into account. Must it not follow, of course, that when he was understood he should succeed? He believed it fully. Love such as his, in a man like himself, must with perseverance secure a return, and at no great distance. And he had so much delight in the idea of obliging her to love him in a very short time, that her not loving him now was scarcely regretted. A little difficulty to be overcome was no evil to Henry Crawford. 
he rather derived spirits from it. He had been apt to gain hearts too easily. His situation was new and animating. To Fanny, however, who had known too much opposition all her life to find any charm in it, all this was unintelligible. She found that he did mean to persevere. But how he could, after such language from her as she felt herself obliged to use, was not to be understood. She told him that she did not love him, could not love him, was sure she never should love him, that such a change was quite impossible, that the subject was most painful to her, that she must entreat him never to mention it again, to allow her to leave him at once, and let it be considered as concluded for ever and when father pressed had added that in her opinion their dispositions were so totally dissimilar as to make mutual affection incompatible and that they were unfitted for each other by nature education and habit all this she had said and with the earnestness of sincerity yet this was not enough for he immediately denied there being anything uncongenial in their characters or anything unfriendly in their situations and positively declared that he would still love and still hope fanny knew her own meaning but was no judge of her own manner her manner was incurably gentle and she was not aware how much it concealed the sternness of her purpose her diffidence gratitude and softness made every expression of indifference seem almost an effort of self-denial seem at least to be giving nearly as much pain to herself as to him mr crawford was no longer the mr crawford who as the clandestine insidious treacherous admirer of maria bertram had been her abhorrence whom she had hated to see or to speak to in whom she could believe no good quality to exist and whose power even of being agreeable she had barely acknowledged he was now the mr crawford who was addressing herself with ardent disinterested love whose feelings were apparently become all that was honourable and upright, whose views of happiness were all fixed on a marriage of attachment, who was pouring out his sense of her merits, describing and describing again his affection, proving as far as words could prove it, and in the language, tone, and spirit of a man of talent, too, that he sought her for her gentleness and her goodness, and to complete the whole, he was now the Mr. Crawford who had procured William's promotion here was a change, and here were claims which could not but operate. She might have disdained him in all the dignity of angry virtue, in the grounds of Southerton, or at the theatre at Mansfield Park. But he approached her now with rights that demanded different treatment. She must be courteous, and she must be compassionate. She must have a sensation of being honoured, and whether thinking of herself or her brother, she must have a strong feeling of gratitude. The effect of the whole was a manner so pitying and agitated, and words intermingled with her refusal so expressive of obligation and concern, that to a temper of vanity and hope like Crawford's, the truth, or at least the strength of her indifference, might well be questionable. And he was not so irrational as Fanny considered him, in the professions of persevering, assiduous, and not desponding attachment which closed the interview. It was with reluctance that he suffered her to go but there was no look of despair in parting to belie his words, or give her hopes of his being less unreasonable than he professed himself. Now she was angry. Some resentment did arise at a perseverance so selfish and ungenerous. Here was again a want of delicacy and regard for others which had formerly so struck and disgusted her. Here was again a something of the same Mr. Crawford whom she had so reprobated before how evidently was there a gross want of feeling and humanity where his own pleasure was concerned and alas how always no known principle to supply as a duty what the heart was deficient in had her own affections been as free as perhaps they ought to have been he never could have engaged them so thought fanny in good truth and sober sadness as she sat musing over that too great indulgence and luxury of a fire upstairs wandering at the past and present wandering at what was yet to come and in a nervous agitation which made nothing clear to her but the persuasion of her being never under any circumstances able to love mr crawford and the felicity of having a fire to sit over and think of it sir thomas was obliged or obliged himself to wait till the morrow for a knowledge of what had happened between the young people he then saw mr crawford and received his account the first feeling was disappointment he had hoped better things 
He had hoped that an hour's entreaty from a young man like Crawford could not have worked so little change on a gentle-tempered girl like Fanny. But there was speedy comfort in the determined views and sanguine perseverance of the lover, and when seeing such confidence of success in the principal, Sir Thomas was soon able to depend on it himself. Nothing was omitted on his side of civility, compliment, or kindness that might assist the plan. Mr. Crawford's steadiness was honoured, and Fanny was praised, and the connection was still the most desirable in the world. At Mansfield Park Mr. Crawford would always be welcome. He had only to consult his own judgment and feelings as to the frequency of his visits, at present or in future. In all his niece's family and friends there could be but one opinion, one wish on the subject. The influence of all who loved her must incline one way. Everything was said that could encourage. Every encouragement received with grateful joy, and the gentlemen parted the best of friends. Satisfied that the cause was now on a footing the most proper and hopeful, Sir Thomas resolved to abstain from all farther importunity with his niece, and to show no open interference. Upon her disposition he believed kindness might be the best way of working. Entreaty should be from one quarter only. The forbearance of her family on a point, respecting which she could be in no doubt of their wishes, might be their surest means of forwarding it. Accordingly, on this principle, Sir Thomas took the first opportunity of saying to her, with a mild gravity, intending to be overcoming, "'Well, Fanny, I have seen Mr. Crawford again, and learned from him exactly how matters stand between you. He is a most extraordinary young man, and whatever be the event, you must feel that you have created an attachment of no common character, though young as you are, and little acquainted with the transient, varying, unsteady nature of love, as it generally exists, you cannot be struck as I am, with all that is wonderful in a perseverance of this sort, against discouragement. With him it is entirely a matter of feeling. He claims no merit in it, perhaps is entitled to none. Yet having chosen so well, his constancy has a respectable stamp. Had his choice been less unexceptionable, I should have condemned his persevering." "'Indeed, sir said Fanny. I am very sorry that Mr. Crawford should continue to—' I know that it is paying me a very great compliment, and I feel most undeservedly honoured, but I am so perfectly convinced, and I have told him so, that it will never be in my power—" "'My dear,' interrupted Sir Thomas, "'there is no occasion for this. Your feelings are as well known to me, as my wishes and regrets must be to you. There is nothing more to be said or done. From this hour the subject is never to be revived between us. You will have nothing to fear or to be agitated about. You cannot suppose me capable of trying to persuade you to marry against your inclinations. Your happiness and advantage are all that I have in view, and nothing is required of you but to bear with Mr. Crawford's endeavours to convince you that they may not be incompatible with his. He proceeds at his own risk. You are on safe ground. I have engaged for your seeing him whenever he calls, as you might have done, had nothing of this sort occurred. You will see him with the rest of us in the same manner, and as much as you can, dismissing the recollection of everything unpleasant. He leaves Northamptonshire so soon, that even this slight sacrifice cannot be often demanded. The future must be very uncertain. And now, my dear Fanny, this subject is closed between us." The promised departure was all that Fanny could think of with much satisfaction. Her uncle's kind expressions, however, and forbearing manner, were sensibly felt and when she considered how much of the truth was unknown to him, she believed she had no right to wonder at the line of conduct he pursued. He who had married a daughter to Mr. Rushworth! Romantic delicacy was certainly not to be expected from him. She must do her duty, and trust that time might make her duty easier than it now was. She could not, though only eighteen, suppose Mr. Crawford's attachment would hold out for ever. She could not but imagine that steady, unceasing discouragement from herself would put an end to it in time. How much time she might, in her own fancy, allot for its dominion, is another concern. It would not be fair to inquire into a young lady's exact estimate of her own perfections. In spite of his intended silence, Sir Thomas found himself once more obliged to mention the subject to his niece, to prepare her briefly for its being imparted to her aunts, a measure which he would still have avoided if possible, but which became necessary from the totally opposite feelings of Mr. Crawford as to any secrecy of proceeding. He had no idea of concealment. 
It was all known at the parsonage, where he loved to talk over the future with both his sisters, and it would be rather gratifying to him to have enlightened witnesses of the progress of his success. When Sir Thomas understood this, he felt the necessity of making his own wife and sister-in-law acquainted with the business without delay. Though on Fanny's account, he almost dreaded the effect of the communication to Mrs. Norris, as much as Fanny herself. He deprecated her mistaken but well-meaning zeal. Sir Thomas, indeed, was by this time not very far from classing Mrs. Norris as one of those well-meaning people who are always doing mistaken and very disagreeable things. Mrs. Norris, however, relieved him. He pressed for the strictest forbearance and silence towards their niece. She not only promised, but did observe it. She only looked her increased ill-will. Angry she was, bitterly angry, but she was more angry with Fanny for having received such an offer than for refusing it. It was an injury and affront to Julia, who ought to have been Mr. Crawford's choice, and independently of that she disliked Fanny, because she had neglected her, and she would have grudged such an elevation to one whom she had always been trying to depress. Sir Thomas gave her more credit for discretion on the occasion than she deserved, and Fanny could have blessed her for allowing her only to see her displeasure, and not to hear it. Lady Bertram took it differently. She had been a beauty, and a prosperous beauty, all her life, and beauty and wealth were all that excited her respect. To know Fanny to be sought in marriage by a man of fortune raised her, therefore, very much in her opinion. By convincing her that Fanny was very pretty, which she had been doubting about before, and that she would be advantageously married, it made her feel a sort of credit in calling her niece. "'Well, Fanny,' said she, as soon as they were alone together afterwards, and she really had known something like impatience to be alone with her, and her countenance, as she spoke, had extraordinary animation. "'Well, Fanny, I have had a very agreeable surprise this morning. I must just speak of it once.' I told Sir Thomas I must once, and then I shall have done. I give you joy, my dear niece." And looking at her complacently, she added, "'Hm! We certainly are a handsome family.'" Fanny coloured, and doubted at first what to say. When hoping to assail her on her vulnerable side, she presently answered, "'My dear aunt, you cannot wish me to do differently from what I have done, I am sure. You cannot wish me to marry, for you would miss me, should not you?' Yes, I am sure you would miss me too much for that. No, my dear, I should not think of missing you when such an offer as this comes in your way. I could do very well without you, if you were married to a man of such good estate as Mr. Crawford. And you must be aware, Fanny, that it is every young woman's duty to accept such a very unexceptionable offer as this." This was almost the only rule of conduct, the only piece of advice, which Fanny had ever received from her aunt in the course of eight years and a half. It silenced her. She felt how unprofitable contention would be. If her aunt's feelings were against her, nothing could be hoped from attacking her understanding. Lady Bertram was quite talkative. "'I will tell you what, Fanny,' said she, "'I am sure he fell in love with you at the ball.' I am sure the mischief was done that evening. You did look remarkably well. Everybody said so. Sir Thomas said so. And you know you had Chapman to help you dress. I am very glad I sent Chapman to you. I shall tell Sir Thomas that I am sure it was done that evening." And still pursuing the same cheerful thoughts, she soon afterwards added, "'And I will tell you what, Fanny, which is more than I did for Maria, the next time Pug has a litter, you shall have a puppy. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Edmund had great things to hear on his return. Many surprises were awaiting him. The first that occurred was not least in interest. The appearance of Henry Crawford and his sister walking together through the village as he rode into it. He had concluded he had meant them to be far distant. His absence had been extended beyond a fortnight purposely to avoid Miss Crawford. He was returning to Mansfield with spirits ready to feed on melancholy remembrances and tender associations, when her own fair self was before him, leaning on her brother's arm, and he found himself receiving a welcome unquestionably friendly, from the woman who, two moments before, he had been thinking of as seventy miles off, and as farther, much farther from him in inclination, than any distance could express. Her reception of him was of a sort which he could not have hoped for, had he expected to see her. 
coming as he did from such a purport fulfilled as had taken him away, he would have expected anything rather than a look of satisfaction and words of simple pleasant meaning. It was enough to set his heart in a glow, and to bring him home in the properest state for feeling the full value of the other joyful surprises at hand. William's promotion, with all its particulars, he was soon master of, and with such a secret provision of comfort within his own breast to help the joy, he found in it a source of most gratifying sensation and unvarying cheerfulness all dinner-time. After dinner, when he and his father were alone, he had Fanny's history, and then all the great events of the last fortnight and the present situation of matters at Mansfield were known to him. Fanny suspected what was going on. They sat so much longer than usual in the dining parlour that she was sure they must be talking of her. And when tea at last brought them away, and she was to be seen by Edmund again, she felt dreadfully guilty. He came to her, sat down by her, took her hand, and pressed it kindly. And at that moment she thought that, but for the occupation and the scene which the tea-things afforded, she must have betrayed her emotion in some unpardonable excess. He was not intending, however, by such action, to be conveying to her that unqualified approbation and encouragement which her hopes drew from it. It was designed only to express his participation in all that interested her, and to tell her that he had been hearing what quickened every feeling of affection. He was, in fact, entirely on his father's side of the question. His surprise was not so great as his father's at her refusing Crawford, because, so far from supposing her to consider him anything like a preference, he had always believed it to be rather the reverse, and could imagine her to be taken perfectly unprepared. But Sir Thomas could not regard the connection as more desirable than he did. It had every recommendation to him, and while honouring her for what she had done under the influence of her present indifference, honouring her in rather stronger terms than Sir Thomas could quite echo, he was most earnest in hoping, and sanguine in believing, that it would be a match at last, and that, united by mutual affection, it would appear that their dispositions were as exactly fitted to make them blessed in each other, as he was now beginning seriously to consider them. Crawford had been too precipitate. He had not given her time to attach herself. He had begun at the wrong end. With such powers as his, however, and such a disposition as hers, Edmund trusted that everything would work out a happy conclusion. Meanwhile, he saw enough of Fanny's embarrassment to make him scrupulously guard against exciting it a second time by any word, look, or movement. Crawford called the next day and on the score of Edmund's return, Sir Thomas felt himself more than licensed to ask him to stay to dinner. It was really a necessary compliment. He stayed, of course, and Edmund had then ample opportunity for observing how he sped with Fanny, and what degree of immediate encouragement for him might be extracted from her manners. And it was so little, so very, very little, every chance, every possibility of it, resting upon her embarrassment only, if there was not hope in her confusion there was hope in nothing else, that he was almost ready to wonder at his friend's perseverance. Fanny was worth it all. He held her to be worth every effort of patience, every exertion of mind. But he did not think he could have gone on himself with any woman breathing, without something more to warm his courage than his eyes could discern in hers. He was very willing to hope that Crawford saw clearer, and this was the most comfortable conclusion for his friend that he could come to from all that he observed to pass before, and at, and after dinner. In the evening a few circumstances occurred which he thought more promising. When he and Crawford walked into the drawing-room, his mother and Fanny were sitting as intently and silently at work as if there were nothing else to care for. Edmund could not help noticing their apparently deep tranquillity. "'We have not been so silent all the time,' replied his mother. "'Fanny has been reading to me, and only put the book down upon hearing you coming.' And sure enough, there was a book on the table which had the air of being very recently closed, a volume of Shakespeare. She often reads to me out of these books, and she was in the middle of a very fine speech of that man's—what's his name, Fanny—when we heard your footsteps.' Crawford took the volume. "'Let me have the pleasure of finishing that speech to your ladyship,' said he. "'I shall find it immediately.' And by carefully giving way to the inclination of the leaves, he did find it, or within a page or two, quite near enough to satisfy Lady Bertram, who assured him, as soon as he mentioned the name of Cardinal Wolsey, that he had got the very speech. 
Not a look or an offer of help had Fanny given, not a syllable for or against. All her attention was for her work. She seemed determined to be interested by nothing else. But taste was too strong in her. She could not abstract her mind five minutes. She was forced to listen. His reading was capital, and her pleasure in good reading extreme. To good reading, however, she had been long used. Her uncle read well, her cousins all, Edmund very well. But in Mr. Crawford's reading there was a variety of excellence beyond what she had ever met with. The King, the Queen, Buckingham, Wolsey, Cromwell, all were given in turn. For with the happiest knack, the happiest power of jumping and guessing, he could always light at will on the best scene, or the best speeches of each, and whether it were dignity or pride, or tenderness or remorse, or whatever were to be expressed, he could do it with equal beauty. It was truly dramatic. His acting had first taught Fanny what pleasure a play might give, and his reading brought all his acting before her again. Nay, perhaps with greater enjoyment, for it came unexpectedly, and with no such drawback as she had been used to suffer in seeing him on the stage with Miss Bertram. Edmund watched the progress of her attention, and was amused and gratified by seeing how she gradually slackened in the needlework, which, at the beginning, seemed to occupy her totally, how it fell from her hand while she sat motionless over it, and at last how the eyes which had appeared so studiously to avoid him throughout the day were turned and fixed on Crawford, fixed on him for minutes, fixed on him in short, till the attraction drew Crawford's upon her, and the book was closed, and the charm was broken. Then she was shrinking again into herself, and blushing and working as hard as ever. But it had been enough to give Edmund encouragement for his friend, and as he cordially thanked him, he hoped to be expressing Fanny's secret feelings too. "'That play must be a favourite with you,' said he. "'You read as if you knew it well.' "'It will be a favourite, I believe, from this hour,' replied Crawford. "'But I do not think I have had a volume of Shakespeare in my hand before since I was fifteen. I once saw Henry the Eighth acted or I have heard of it from somebody who did, I am not certain which. But Shakespeare one gets acquainted with without knowing how. It is part of an Englishman's constitution. His thoughts and beauties are so spread abroad that one touches them everywhere. One is intimate with him by instinct. No man of any brain can open at a good part one of his plays, without falling into the flow of his meaning immediately." "'No doubt one is familiar with Shakespeare in a degree,' said Edmund, from one's earliest years. His celebrated passages are quoted by everybody. They are in half the books we open, and we all talk Shakespeare, use his similes, and describe with his descriptions. But this is totally distinct from giving his sense as you gave it. To know him in bits and scraps is common enough. To know him pretty thoroughly is perhaps not uncommon. But to read him well aloud is no everyday talent." "'Sir, you do me honour," was Crawford's answer, with a bow of mock gravity. Both gentlemen had a glance at Fanny, to see if a word of accordant praise could be extorted from her, yet both feeling that it could not be. Her praise had been given in her attention, and that must content them. Lady Bertram's admiration was expressed, and strongly, too. "'It was really like being at a play,' said she. "'I wish Sir Thomas had been here.' Crawford was excessively pleased. If Lady Bertram, with all her incompetency and languor, could feel this, the inference of what her niece, alive and enlightened as she was, must feel, was elevating. "'You have a great turn for acting, I am sure, Mr. Crawford,' said her ladyship soon afterwards, "'and I will tell you what. I think you will have a theatre some time or other at your house in Norfolk. I mean, when you are settled there. I do indeed.' i think you will fit up a theatre at your house in norfolk do you ma'am cried he with quickness no no that will never be your ladyship is quite mistaken no theatre at everingham oh no and he looked at fanny with an expressive smile which evidently meant that lady will never allow a theatre at everingham Edmund saw it all, and saw Fanny so determined not to see it, as to make it clear that the voice was enough to convey the full meaning of the protestation. And such a quick consciousness of compliment, such a ready comprehension of a hint, he thought, was rather favourable than not. The subject of reading aloud was farther discussed. The two young men were the only talkers, but they, standing by the fire, talked over the too common neglect of the qualification 
the total inattention to it, in the ordinary school system for boys, and the consequently natural, yet in some instances almost unnatural, degree of ignorance and uncouthness of men, of sensible and well-informed men, when suddenly called to the necessity of reading aloud, which had fallen within their notice giving instances of blunders and failures with their secondary causes, the want of management of the voice, of proper modulation and emphasis, of foresight and judgment, all proceeding from the first cause, want of early attention and habit. And Fanny was listening again with great entertainment. "'Even in my profession,' said Edmund, with a smile, "'how little the art of reading has been studied! How little a clear manner and good delivery have been attended to! I speak rather of the past, however, than the present. There is now a spirit of improvement abroad. But among those who were ordained twenty, thirty, forty years ago, the larger number, to judge by their performance, must have thought reading was reading, and preaching was preaching. It is different now. The subject is more justly considered. It is felt that distinctness and energy may have weight in recommending the most solid truths. And besides, there is more general observation and taste, a more critical knowledge diffused, than formerly. In every congregation there is a larger proportion who know a little of the matter, and who can judge and criticise." Edmund had already gone through the service once since his ordination, and upon this being understood, he had a variety of questions from Crawford as to his feelings and success, questions which being made, though with the vivacity of friendly interest and quick taste, without any touch of that spirit of banter or air of levity which Edmund knew to be most offensive to Fanny, he had true pleasure in satisfying. And when Crawford proceeded to ask his opinion, and give his own, as to the properest manner in which particular passages in the service should be delivered, showing it to be a subject on which he had thought before, and thought with judgment, Edmund was still more and more pleased. This would be the way to Fanny's heart. She was not to be won by all that gallantry and wit and good-nature together could do, or at least, she could not be won by them nearly so soon, without the assistance of sentiment and feeling, and seriousness on serious subjects. "'Our liturgy,' observed Crawford, "'has beauties which not even a careless, slovenly style of reading can destroy. But it has also redundancies and repetitions which require good reading not to be felt. For myself, at least, I must confess being not always so attentive as I ought to be.' Here was a glance at Fanny that nineteen times out of twenty I am thinking how such a prayer ought to be read, and longing to have it to read myself. Did you speak?" stepping eagerly to Fanny, and addressing her in a softened voice, and upon her saying, No, he added, are you sure you did not speak? I saw your lips move. I fancied you might be going to tell me I ought to be more attentive, and not allow my thoughts to wander. Are not you going to tell me so? No, indeed. You know your duty too well for me to—even supposing— she stopped, felt herself getting into a puzzle, and could not be prevailed on to add another word, not by dint of several minutes of supplication and waiting. He then returned to his former station, and went on as if there had been no such tender interruption. A sermon well delivered is more uncommon even than prayers well read. A sermon good in itself is no rare thing. It is more difficult to speak well than to compose well. That is, the rules and trick of composition are oftener an object of study. A thoroughly good sermon, thoroughly well delivered, is a capital gratification. I can never hear such a one without the greatest admiration and respect, and more than half a mind to take orders and preach myself. There is something in the eloquence of the pulpit, when it is really eloquence, which is entitled to the highest praise and honour. The preacher who can touch and affect such an heterogeneous mass of hearers, on subjects limited and long-worn threadbare, in all common hands who can say anything new or striking, anything that rouses the attention without offending the taste, or wearing out the feelings of his hearers, is a man whom one could not, in his public capacity, honour enough. I should like to be such a man." Edmund laughed. "'I should indeed. I never listened to a distinguished preacher in my life without a sort of envy. But then I must have a London audience. I could not preach but to the educated, to those who were capable of estimating my composition and I do not know that I should be fond of preaching often. Now and then, perhaps, once or twice in the spring, after being anxiously expected for half a dozen Sundays together, but not for a constancy. It would not do for a constancy." Here Fanny, who could not but listen, involuntarily shook her head, and Crawford was instantly by her side again, entreating to know her meaning, 
and as Edmund perceived, by his drawing in a chair, and sitting down close by her, that it was to be a very thorough attack, that looks and undertones were to be well tried, he sank as quietly as possible into a corner, turned his back, and took up a newspaper, very sincerely wishing that dear little Fanny might be persuaded into explaining away that shake of the head to the satisfaction of her ardent lover and as earnestly trying to bury every sound of the business from himself, in murmurs of his own, over the various advertisements of a most desirable estate in South Wales, to parents and guardians, and a capital seasoned hunter. Fanny, meanwhile, vexed with herself for not having been as motionless as she was speechless, and grieved to the heart to see Edmund's arrangements, was trying, by everything in the power of her modest, gentle nature, to repulse Mr. Crawford, and avoid both his looks and inquiries. And he, unrepulsable, was persisting in both. "'What did that shake of the head mean?' said he. "'What was it meant to express? Disapprobation, I fear. But of what? What had I been saying to displease you?' Did you think me speaking improperly, lightly, irreverently, on the subject? Only tell me if I was. Only tell me if I was wrong. I want to be set right. Nay, nay, I entreat you, for one moment, put down your work. What did that shake of the head mean? In vain was her, Pray, sir, don't, pray, Mr. Crawford, repeated twice over, and in vain did she try to move away. In the same low, eager voice, and the same close neighbourhood, he went on, re-urging the same questions as before. She grew more agitated and displeased. "'How can you, sir? You quite astonish me. I wonder how you can—' "'Do I astonish you?' said he. "'Do you wonder? Is there anything in my present entreaty that you do not understand? I will explain to you instantly all that makes me urge you in this manner, all that gives me an interest in what you look and do, and excites my present curiosity. I will not leave you to wonder long.' In spite of herself, she could not help half a smile, but she said nothing. You shook your head at my acknowledging that I should not like to engage in the duties of a clergyman always, for a constancy. Yes, that was the word, constancy. I am not afraid of the word. I would spell it, read it, write it with anybody. I see nothing alarming in the word. Did you think I ought?" "'Perhaps, sir,' said Fanny, wearied at last into speaking, "'perhaps, sir, I thought it was a pity you did not always know yourself as well as you seemed to do at that moment.' Crawford, delighted to get her to speak at any rate, was determined to keep it up. And poor Fanny, who had hoped to silence him by such an extremity of reproof, found herself sadly mistaken, and that it was only a change from one object of curiosity, and one set of words, to another. He had always something to entreat the explanation of. The opportunity was too fair. None such had occurred since his seeing her in her uncle's room, and none such might occur again before his leaving Mansfield. Lady Bertram's being just on the other side of the table was a trifle, for she might always be considered as only half awake, and Edmund's advertisements were still of the first utility. "'Well,' said Crawford, after a course of rapid questions and reluctant answers, "'I am happier than I was, because I now understand more clearly your opinion of me. You think me unsteady, easily swayed by the whim of the moment, easily tempted, easily put aside. With such an opinion, no wonder that— but we shall see. It is not by protestations that I shall endeavour to convince you I am wronged. It is not by telling you that my affections are steady. My conduct shall speak for me. Absence, distance, time shall speak for me. They shall prove that as far as you can be deserved by anybody, I do deserve you. You are infinitely my superior in merit. All that I know. You have qualities which I had not before supposed to exist in such a degree in any human creature. You have some touches of the angel in you, beyond what— not merely beyond what one sees, because one never sees anything like it, but beyond what one fancies might be. But still I am not frightened. It is not by equality of merit that you can be won. That is out of the question. It is he who sees and worships your merit the strongest, who loves you most devotedly, that has the best right to a return. There I build my confidence. By that right I do and will deserve you. And when once convinced that my attachment is what I declare it, I know you too well not to entertain the warmest hopes. Yes, dearest, sweetest Fanny. Nay, seeing her draw back displeased, forgive me. Perhaps I have as yet no right. But by what other name can I call you? Do you suppose you are ever present to my imagination under any other? No, it is Fanny that I think of all day, and dream of all night. You have given the name such reality of sweetness that nothing else can now be descriptive of you." Fanny could hardly have kept her seat any longer, 
or have refrained from at least trying to get away, in spite of all the too public opposition she foresaw to it, had it not been for the sound of approaching relief, the very sound which she had been long watching for, and long thinking strangely delayed. The solemn procession, headed by Badley, of tea-board, urn, and cake-bearers, made its appearance, and delivered her from a grievous imprisonment of body and mind. Mr. Crawford was obliged to move. She was at liberty, she was busy, she was protected. Edmund was not sorry to be admitted again among the number of those who might speak and hear. But though the conference had seemed full long to him, and though on looking at Fanny he saw rather a flush of vexation, he inclined to hope that so much could not have been said and listened to, without some profit to the speaker. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Edmund had determined that it belonged entirely to Fanny to choose whether her situation with regard to Crawford should be mentioned between them or not, and that if she did not lead the way, it should never be touched on by him. But after a day or two of mutual reserve, he was induced by his father to change his mind, and try what his influence might do for his friend. A day, and a very early day, was actually fixed for the Crawfords' departure, and Sir Thomas thought it might be as well to make one more effort for the young man before he left Mansfield, that all his professions and vows of unshaken attachment might have as much hope to sustain them as possible. Sir Thomas was most cordially anxious for the perfection of Mr. Crawford's character in that point. He wished him to be a model of constancy, and fancied the best means of effecting it would be by not trying him too long. Edmund was not unwilling to be persuaded to engage in the business. He wanted to know Fanny's feelings. She had been used to consult him in every difficulty, and he loved her too well to bear to be denied her confidence now. He hoped to be of service of her. He thought he must be of service of her. Whom else had she to open her heart to? If she did not need counsel, she must need the comfort of communication. Fanny estranged from him, silent and reserved, was an unnatural state of things, a state which he must break through, and which he could easily learn to think she was wanting him to break through. "'I will speak to her, sir. I will take the first opportunity of speaking to her alone,' was the result of such thoughts as these, and upon Sir Thomas's information of her being at that very time walking alone in the shrubbery, he instantly joined her. "'I am come to walk with you, Fanny,' said he. "'Shall I?' drawing her arm within his. "'It is a long while since we have had a comfortable walk together.' She assented to it all rather by look than word. Her spirits were low. "'But, Fanny,' he presently added, "'in order to have a comfortable walk, something more is necessary than merely pacing this gravel together. You must talk to me. I know you have something on your mind. I know what you are thinking of. You cannot suppose me uninformed.' Am I to hear of it from everybody but Fanny herself?" Fanny, at once agitated and dejected, replied, "'If you hear it from everybody, cousin, there can be nothing for me to tell.' "'Not of facts, perhaps, but of feelings, Fanny. No one but you can tell me them. I do not mean to press you, however. If it is not what you wish yourself, I have done. I had thought it might be a relief.' "'I am afraid we think too differently for me to find any relief in talking of what I feel. Do you suppose that we think differently? I have no idea of it. I dare say that, on a comparison of our opinions, they would be found as much alike as they have been used to be. To the point. I consider Crawford's proposals as most advantageous and desirable, if you could return his affection. I consider it as most natural that all your family should wish you could return it, but that, as you cannot, you have done exactly as you ought in refusing him. Can there be any disagreement between us there? Oh, no! But I thought you blamed me. I thought you were against me. This is such a comfort." This comfort you might have had sooner, Fanny, had you sought it. But how could you possibly suppose me against you? How could you imagine me an advocate for marriage without love? Were I even careless in general on such matters, how could you imagine me so where your happiness was at stake? My uncle thought me wrong, and I knew he had been talking to you. As far as you have gone, Fanny, I think you perfectly right. I may be sorry, I may be surprised, though hardly that, for you had not had time to attach yourself, but I think you perfectly right. Can it admit of a question? It is disgraceful to us if it does. You did not love him. Nothing could have justified your accepting him." 
Fanny had not felt so comfortable for days and days. "'So far your conduct has been faultless, and they were quite mistaken who wished you to do otherwise. But the matter does not end here. Crawford's is no common attachment. He perseveres, with the hope of creating that regard which had not been created before. This, we know, must be a work of time. But—' with an affectionate smile. Let him succeed at last, Fanny, let him succeed at last. You have proved yourself upright and disinterested. Prove yourself grateful and tender-hearted. And then you will be the perfect model of a woman, which I have always believed you born for." "'Oh, never, never, never! He will never succeed with me!' And she spoke with a warmth which quite astonished Edmund, and which she blushed at the recollection of herself, when she saw his look, and heard him reply, Never, Fanny, so very determined and positive. This is not like yourself, your rational self. I mean, she cried sorrowfully, correcting herself, that I think I never shall, as far as the future can be answered for, I think I never shall return his regard. I must hope better things. I am aware, more aware than Crawford can be, that the man who means to make you love him, you having due notice of his intentions, must have very uphill work, for there are all your early attachments and habits in battle array, and before he can get your heart for his own use, he has to unfasten it from all the holes upon things animate and inanimate, which so many years' growth have confirmed, and which are considerably tightened for the moment by the very idea of separation. I know that the apprehension of being forced to quit Mansfield will for a time be arming you against him. I wish he had not been obliged to tell you what he was trying for. I wish he had known you as well as I do, Fanny. Between us I think we should have won you. My theoretical and his practical knowledge together could not have failed. He should have worked upon my plans. I must hope, however, that time proving him, as I firmly believe it will, to deserve you by his steady affection, will give him his reward. I cannot suppose that you have not the wish to love him, the natural wish of gratitude. You must have some feeling of that sort. You must be sorry for your own indifference." "'We are so totally unlike,' said Fanny, avoiding a direct answer. "'We are so very, very different in all our inclinations and ways, that I consider it as quite impossible we should ever be tolerably happy together, even if I could like him. There never were two people more dissimilar. We have not one taste in common. We should be miserable." "'You are mistaken, Fanny. The dissimilarity is not so strong. You are quite enough alike. You have tastes in common. You have moral and literary tastes in common. You have both warm hearts and benevolent feelings. And, Fanny, who that heard him read, and saw you listen to Shakespeare the other night, will think you unfitted as companions. You forget yourself. There is a decided difference in your tempers, I allow. He is lively, you are serious, but so much the better. His spirits will support yours. It is your disposition to be easily dejected, and to fancy difficulties greater than they are. His cheerfulness will counteract this. He sees difficulties nowhere, and his pleasantness and gaiety will be a constant support to you. Your being so far unlike Fanny does not in the smallest degree make against the probability of your happiness together. Do not imagine it. I am myself convinced that it is rather a favourable circumstance. I am perfectly persuaded that the tempers had better be unlike. I mean, unlike in the flow of the spirits, in the manners, in the inclination for much or little company, in the propensity to talk or to be silent, to be grave or to be gay. Some opposition here is, I am thoroughly convinced, friendly to matrimonial happiness. I exclude extremes, of course and a very close resemblance in all those points would be the likeliest way to produce an extreme. A counteraction, gentle and continual, is the best safeguard of manners and conduct." Full well could Fanny guess where his thoughts were now. Miss Crawford's power was all returning. He had been speaking of her cheerfully from the hour of his coming home. His avoiding her was quite at an end. He had dined at the parsonage only the preceding day. After leaving him to his happier thoughts for some minutes, Fanny, feeling it due to herself, returned to Mr. Crawford, and said, "'It is not merely in temper that I consider him as totally unsuited to myself, though in that respect I think the difference between us too great, infinitely too great. His spirits often oppress me, but there is something in him which I object to still more. I must say, cousin, that I cannot approve his character.' I have not thought well of him from the time of the play. 
I then saw him behaving, as it appeared to me, so very improperly and unfeelingly—I may speak of it now, because it is all over—so improperly by poor Mr. Rushworth, not seeming to care how he exposed or hurt him, and paying attentions to my cousin Maria, which—in short, at the time of the play, I received an impression which will never be got over." "'My dear Fanny,' replied Edmund, scarcely hearing her to the end, "'let us not any of us be judged by what we appeared at that period of general folly. The time of the play is a time which I hate to recollect. Maria was wrong. Crawford was wrong. We were all wrong together, but none so wrong as myself. Compared with me all the rest were blameless. I was playing the fool with my eyes open.' "'As a bystander,' said Fanny, "'perhaps I saw more than you did. And I do think that Mr. Rushworth was sometimes very jealous." "'Very possibly. No wonder. Nothing could be more improper than the whole business. I am shocked whenever I think that Maria could be capable of it. But if she could undertake the part, we must not be surprised at the rest." "'Before the play, I am much mistaken if Julia did not think he was paying her attentions." "'Julia? I have heard before from some one of his being in love with Julia, but I could never see anything of it. And Fanny, though I hope I do justice to my sister's good qualities, I think it very possible that they might, one or both, be more desirous of being admired by Crawford, and might show that desire rather more unguardedly than was perfectly prudent. I can remember that they were evidently fond of his society, and with such encouragement a man like Crawford, lively, and it may be a little unthinking, might be led on to— there could be nothing very striking, because it is clear that he had no pretensions. His heart was reserved for you. And I must say that its being for you has raised him inconceivably in my opinion. It does him the highest honour. It shows his proper estimation of the blessing of domestic happiness and pure attachment. It proves him unspoiled by his uncle. It proves him, in short, everything that I had been used to wish to believe him, and feared he was not. I am persuaded that he does not think as he ought on serious subjects. Say, rather, that he has not thought at all upon serious subjects, which I believe to be a good deal the case. How could it be otherwise, with such an education and adviser? Under the disadvantages, indeed, which both have had, is it not wonderful that they should be what they are? Crawford's feelings, I am ready to acknowledge, have hitherto been too much his guides. Happily those feelings have generally been good. You will supply the rest and a most fortunate man he is to attach himself to such a creature, to a woman who, firm as a rock in her own principles, has a gentleness of character so well adapted to recommend them. He has chosen his partner indeed, with rare felicity. He will make you happy, Fanny. I know he will make you happy. But you will make him everything." "'I would not engage in such a charge,' cried Fanny, in a shrinking accent, in such an office of high responsibility. As usual, believing yourself unequal to anything, fancying everything too much for you. Well, though I may not be able to persuade you into different feelings, you will be persuaded into them, I trust. I confess myself sincerely anxious that you may. I have no common interest in Crawford's well-doing. Next to your happiness, Fanny, his has the first claim on me. You are aware of my having no common interest in Crawford." Fanny was too well aware of it to have anything to say and they walked on together some fifty yards in mutual silence and abstraction. Edmund first began again. I was very much pleased by her manner of speaking of it yesterday, particularly pleased, because I had not depended upon her seeing everything in so just a light. I knew she was very fond of you, but yet I was afraid of her not estimating your worth to her brother quite as it deserved, and of her regretting that he had not rather fixed on some woman of distinction or fortune. I was afraid of the bias of those worldly maxims, which she has been too much used to hear. But it was very different. She spoke of you, Fanny, just as she ought. She desires the connection as warmly as your uncle or myself. We had a long talk about it. I should not have mentioned the subject, though very anxious to know her sentiments, but I had not been in the room five minutes before she began, introducing it with all that openness of heart and sweet peculiarity of manner, that spirit and ingenuousness, which are so much a part of herself. Mrs. Grant laughed at her for her rapidity. Was Mrs. Grant in the room, then? Yes. When I reached the house I found the two sisters together by themselves, and when once we had begun we had not done with you, Fanny, till Crawford and Dr. Grant came in. It is above a week since I saw Miss Crawford. 
Yes, she laments it, yet owns it may have been best. You will see her, however, before she goes. She is very angry with you, Fanny. You must be prepared for that. She calls herself very angry, but you can imagine her anger. It is the regret and disappointment of a sister, who thinks her brother has a right to everything he may wish for, at the first moment. She is hurt, as you would be for William, but she loves and esteems you with all her heart." "'I knew she would be angry with me.' "'My dearest Fanny,' cried Edmund, pressing her arm closer to him, "'do not let the idea of her anger distress you. It is anger to be talked of rather than felt. Her heart is made for love and kindness, not for resentment. I wish you could have overheard her tribute of praise. I wish you could have seen her countenance, when she said that you should be Henry's wife. And I observed that she always spoke of you as Fanny, which she was never used to do, and it had a sound of most sisterly cordiality." "'And Mrs. Grant, did she say—did she speak—was she there all the time?' "'Yes. She was agreeing exactly with her sister. The surprise of your refusal, Fanny, seems to have been unbounded. That you could refuse such a man as Henry Crawford seems more than they can understand. I said what I could for you, but in good truth, as they stated the case, you must prove yourself to be in your senses as soon as you can by a different conduct. Nothing else will satisfy them. But this is teasing you. I have done. Do not turn away from me." I should have thought, said Fanny, after a pause of recollection and exertion, that every woman must have felt the possibility of a man's not being approved, not being loved by some one of her sex at least, let him be ever so generally agreeable. Let him have all the perfections in the world. I think it ought not to be set down as certain that a man must be acceptable to every woman he may happen to like himself. But even supposing it is so, allowing Mr. Crawford to have all the claims which his sisters think he has, how was I to be prepared to meet him with any feeling answerable to his own? He took me wholly by surprise. I had not an idea that his behaviour to me before had any meaning. And surely I was not to be teaching myself to like him only because he was taking what seemed very idle notice of me. In my situation it would have been the extreme of vanity to be forming expectations on Mr. Crawford. I am sure his sisters, rating him as they do, must have thought it so, supposing he had meant nothing. How then was I to be—to be in love with him, the moment he said he was with me? How was I to have an attachment at his service, as soon as it was asked for? His sisters should consider me as well as him. The higher his deserts, the more improper for me ever to have thought of him. And—and and we think very differently of the nature of women, if they can imagine a woman so very soon capable of returning an affection as this seems to imply. My dear, dear Fanny! Now I have the truth. I know this to be the truth, and most worthy of you are such feelings. I had attributed them to you before. I thought I could understand you. You have now given exactly the explanation which I ventured to make for you to your friend and Mrs. Grant, and they were both better satisfied, though your warm-hearted friend was still run away with a little by the enthusiasm of her fondness for Henry. I told them that you were of all human creatures the one over whom habit had most power, and novelty least, and that the very circumstance of the novelty of Crawford's addresses was against him. Their being so new and so recent was all in their disfavour, that you could tolerate nothing that you were not used to, and a great deal more to the same purpose to give them a knowledge of your character. Miss Crawford made us laugh by her plans of encouragement for her brother. She meant to urge him to persevere in the hope of being loved in time, and of having his addresses most kindly received at the end of about ten years' happy marriage." Fanny could with difficulty give the smile that was here asked for. Her feelings were all in revolt. She feared she had been doing wrong, saying too much, overacting the caution which she had been fancying necessary in guarding against one evil laying herself open to another, and to have Miss Crawford's liveliness repeated to her at such a moment, and on such a subject, was a bitter aggravation. Edmund saw weariness and distress in her face, and immediately resolved to forbear all farther discussion, and not even to mention the name of Crawford again, except as what might be connected with what must be agreeable to her. On this principle he soon afterwards observed, "'They go on Monday.' You are sure, therefore, of seeing your friend either to-morrow or Sunday. They really go on Monday, and I was within a trifle of being persuaded to stay at Lessingby till that very day. I had almost promised it. What a difference it might have made! Those five or six days more at Lessingby might have been felt all my life." 
You were near staying there? Very. I was most kindly pressed, and had nearly consented. Had I received any letter from Mansfield to tell me how you were all going on, I believe I should certainly have stayed. But I knew nothing that had happened here for a fortnight, and felt that I had been away long enough. You spent your time pleasantly there? Yes. That is, it was all the fault of my own mind if I did not. They were all very pleasant. I doubt their finding me so. I took uneasiness with me, and there was no getting rid of it till I was in Mansfield again. The Miss Owens. You liked them, did not you? Yes, very well. Pleasant, good-humoured, unaffected girls. But I am spoiled, Fanny, for common female society. Good-humoured, unaffected girls will not do for a man who has been used to sensible women. They are two distinct orders of being. You and Miss Crawford have made me too nice." Still, however, Fanny was oppressed and wearied. He saw it in her looks. It could not be talked away. And attempting it no more, he led her directly, with the kind authority of a privileged guardian, into the house. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Edmund now believed himself perfectly acquainted with all that Fanny could tell or could leave to be conjectured of her sentiments, and he was satisfied. It had been, as he before presumed, too hasty a measure on Crawford's side, and time must be given to make the idea first familiar and then agreeable to her. She must be used to the consideration of his being in love with her, and then a return of affection might not be very distant. He gave this opinion as the result of the conversation to his father, and recommended there being nothing more said to her, no farther attempts to influence or persuade, but that everything should be left to Crawford's assiduities and the natural workings of her own mind. Sir Thomas promised that it should be so. Edmund's account of Fanny's disposition he could believe to be just. He supposed she had all those feelings. But he must consider it as very unfortunate that she had for less willing than his son to trust to the future he could not help fearing that if such very long allowances of time and habit were necessary for her she might not have persuaded herself into receiving his addresses properly before the young man's inclination for paying them were over there was nothing to be done however but to submit quietly and hope the best the promised visit from her friend as edmund called miss crawford was a formidable threat to fanny and she lived in continual terror of it. As a sister so partial and so angry, and so little scrupulous of what she said, and in another light so triumphant and secure, she was in every way an object of painful alarm. Her displeasure, her penetration, and her happiness were all fearful to encounter, and the dependence of having others present when they met was Fanny's only support in looking forward to it. She absented herself as little as possible from Lady Bertram kept away from the east room, and took no solitary walk in the shrubbery, in her caution to avoid any sudden attack. She succeeded. She was safe in the breakfast-room with her aunt, when Miss Crawford did come. And the first misery over, and Miss Crawford looking and speaking with much less particularity of expression than she had anticipated, Fanny began to hope there would be nothing worse to be endured than an half-hour of moderate agitation. But here she hoped too much. Miss Crawford was not the slave of opportunity. She was determined to see Fanny alone, and therefore said to her tolerably soon in a low voice, "'I must speak to you for a few minutes somewhere,' words that Fanny felt all over her, in all her pulses and all her nerves. Denial was impossible. Her habits of ready submission, on the contrary, made her almost instantly rise and lead the way out of the room. She did it with wretched feelings, but it was inevitable. They were no sooner in the hall than all restraint of countenance was over on Miss Crawford's side. She immediately shook her head at Fanny with arch yet affectionate reproach, and taking her hand, seemed hardly able to help beginning directly. She said nothing, however, but, "'Sad, sad girl! I do not know when I shall have done scolding you,' and had discretion enough to reserve the rest till they might be secure of having four walls to themselves. Fanny naturally turned upstairs, and took her guest to the apartment which was now always fit for comfortable use. Opening the door, however, with a most aching heart, and feeling that she had a more distressing scene before her than ever that spot had yet witnessed. But the evil ready to burst on her was at least delayed by the sudden change in Miss Crawford's ideas, by the strong effect on her mind which the finding herself in the East Room again produced. 
Ah! she cried, with instant animation, am I here again? The East Room! Once only was I in this room before. And after stopping to look about her, and seemingly to retrace all that had then passed, she added, Only once before. Do you remember it? I came to rehearse. Your cousin came too, and we had a rehearsal. You were our audience and prompter. A delightful rehearsal. I shall never forget it. Here we were, just in this part of the room. Here was your cousin, here was I, here were the chairs. Oh, why will such things ever pass away?" Happily for her companion, she wanted no answer. Her mind was entirely self-engrossed. She was in a reverie of sweet remembrances. The scene we were rehearsing was so very remarkable, the subject of it so very, very, what shall I say? He was to be describing and recommending matrimony to me. I think I see him now, trying to be as demure and composed as Anhalt ought, through the two long speeches. When two sympathetic hearts meet in the marriage state, matrimony may be called a happy life. I suppose no time can ever wear out the impression I have of his looks and voice, as he said those words. It was curious, very curious, that we should have such a scene to play. If I had the power of recalling any one week of my existence, it should be that week, that acting week. Say what you would, Fanny, it should be that, for I never knew such exquisite happiness in any other. His sturdy spirit to bend as it did, oh, it was sweet beyond expression! But alas, that very evening destroyed it all. That very evening brought your most unwelcome uncle, poor Sir Thomas, who was glad to see you. Yet, Fanny, do not imagine that I would now speak disrespectfully of Sir Thomas, though I certainly did hate him for many a week. No, I do him justice now. He is just what the head of such a family should be. Nay, in sober sadness, I believe I now love you all. And having said so, with the degree of tenderness and consciousness which Fanny had never seen in her before, and now thought only too becoming, she turned away for a moment to recover herself. I have had a little fit since I came into this room, as you may perceive," she said presently, with a playful smile, but it is over now. So let us sit down and be comfortable. For as to scolding you, Fanny, which I came fully intending to do, I have not the heart for it when it comes to the point. And embracing her very affectionately, good, gentle Fanny, when I think of this being the last time of seeing you, for I do not know how long, I feel it quite impossible to do anything but love you. Fanny was affected. She had not foreseen anything of this, and her feelings could seldom withstand the melancholy influence of the word last. She cried as if she had loved Miss Crawford more than she possibly could. And Miss Crawford, yet farther softened by the sight of such emotion, hung about her with fondness, and said, "'I hate to leave you. I shall see no one half so amiable where I am going. Who says we shall not be sisters? I know we shall.' I feel that we are born to be connected, and those tears convince me that you feel it too, dear Fanny." Fanny roused herself, and replying only in part, said, "'But you are only going from one set of friends to another. You are going to a very particular friend.' "'Yes, very true. Mrs. Fraser has been my intimate friend for years, but I have not the least inclination to go near her. I can think only of the friends I am leaving my excellent sister, yourself, and the Bertrams in general. You have all so much more heart among you, than one finds in the world at large. You will give me a feeling of being able to trust and confide in you, which in common intercourse one knows nothing of. I wish I had settled with Mrs. Fraser not to go to her till after Easter, a much better time for the visit, but now I cannot put her off and when I have done with her, I must go to her sister, Lady Stornoway, because she was rather my most particular friend of the two, but I have not cared much for her these three years." After this speech the two girls sat many minutes silent, each thoughtful. Fanny meditating on the different sorts of friendship in the world, Mary on something of less philosophic tendency. She first spoke again. How perfectly I remember my resolving to look for you upstairs, and setting off to find my way to the East Room, without having an idea whereabouts it was! How well I remember what I was thinking of as I came along, and my looking in and seeing you here, sitting at this table at work, and then your cousin's astonishment, when he opened the door, at seeing me here! To be sure, your uncle's returning that very evening! There never was anything quite like it! Another short fit of abstraction followed. 
When shaking it off, she thus attacked her companion. "'Why, Fanny, you are absolutely in a reverie, thinking, I hope, of one who is always thinking of you. Oh, that I could transport you for a short time into our circle in town, that you might understand how your power over Henry is thought of there. Oh, the envyings and heart-burnings of dozens and dozens! The wonder, the incredulity that will be felt at hearing what you have done! For as to secrecy, Henry is quite the hero of an old romance and glories in his chains. You should come to London to know how to estimate your conquest. If you were to see how he is courted, and how I am courted for his sake, now I am well aware that I shall not be half so welcome to Mrs. Fraser in consequence of his situation with you. When she comes to know the truth, she will very likely wish me in Northamptonshire again, for there is a daughter of Mr. Fraser by a first wife, whom she is wild to get married, and wants Henry to take. Oh, she has been trying for him to such a degree! Innocent and quiet as you sit here, you cannot have an idea of the sensation that you will be occasioning, of the curiosity there will be to see you, of the endless questions I shall have to answer. Poor Margaret Fraser will be at me for ever about your eyes and your teeth, and how you do your hair, and who makes your shoes. I wish Margaret were married for my poor friend's sake, for I look upon the Frasers to be about as unhappy as most other married people, and yet it was a most desirable match for Janet at the time. We were all delighted. She could not do otherwise than accept him, for he was rich and she had nothing. But he turns out ill-tempered and exigent, and wants a young woman, a beautiful young woman of five-and-twenty, to be as steady as himself. And my friend does not manage him well. She does not seem to know how to make the best of it. There is a spirit of irritation, which, to say nothing worse, is certainly very ill-bred. In their house I shall call to mind the conjugal manners of Mansfield Parsonage with respect. Even Dr. Grant does show a thorough confidence in my sister, and a certain consideration for her judgment, which makes one feel there is attachment. But of that I shall see nothing with the Frasers. I shall be at Mansfield for ever, Fanny. My own sister as a wife, Sir Thomas Bertram as a husband, are my standards of perfection. Poor Janet has been sadly taken in, and yet there was nothing improper on her side. She did not run into the match inconsiderately. There was no want of foresight. She took three days to consider of his proposals, and during those three days asked the advice of everybody connected with her, whose opinion was worth having, and especially applied to my late dear aunt, whose knowledge of the world made her judgment very generally and deservedly looked up to by all the young people of her acquaintance, and she was decidedly in favour of Mr. Fraser. This seems as if nothing were a security for matrimonial comfort. I have not so much to say for my friend Flora, who jilted a very nice young man in the blues for the sake of that horrid Lord Stornoway, who has about as much sense, Fanny, as Mr. Rushworth, but much worse-looking, and with a blackguard character. I had my doubts at the time about her being right, for he has not even the air of a gentleman, and now I am sure she was wrong. By the by, Flora Ross was dying for Henry the first winter she came out. But were I to attempt to tell you of all the women whom I have known to be in love with him, I should never have done. It is you only, you insensible Fanny, who can think of him with anything like indifference. But are you so insensible as you profess yourself? No, no, I see you are not." There was indeed so deep a blush over Fanny's face at that moment, as might warrant strong suspicion in a predisposed mind. "'Excellent creature! I will not tease you. Everything shall take its course. But, dear Fanny, you must allow that you were not so absolutely unprepared to have the question asked as your cousin fancies. It is not possible, but that you must have had some thoughts on the subject, some surmises as to what might be. You must have seen that he was trying to please you by every attention in his power. Was not he devoted to you at the ball? And then before the ball, the necklace? Oh, you received it just as it was meant. You were as conscious as heart could desire. I remember it perfectly." "'Do you mean, then, that your brother knew of the necklace beforehand? Oh, Miss Crawford, that was not fair!' "'Knew of it. It was his own doing entirely, his own thought. I am ashamed to say that it had never entered my head, but I was delighted to act on his proposal for both your sakes." "'I will not say,' replied Fanny, "'that I was not half afraid at the time of its being so, for there was something in your look that frightened me. But not at first. 
I was as unsuspicious of it at first, indeed, indeed I was. It is as true as that I sit here. And had I had an idea of it, nothing should have induced me to accept the necklace. As to your brother's behaviour, certainly I was sensible of a particularity. I had been sensible of it some little time, perhaps two or three weeks. But then I considered it as meaning nothing. I put it down as simply being his way, and was as far from supposing as from wishing him to have any serious thoughts on me. I had not, Miss Crawford, been an inattentive observer of what was passing between him and some part of this family in the summer and autumn. I was quiet, but I was not blind. I could not but see that Mr. Crawford allowed in himself gallantries which did mean nothing. Ah! I cannot deny it. He has now and then been a sad flirt, and cared very little for the havoc he might be making in young ladies' affections. I have often scolded him for it, but it is his only fault. And there is this to be said, that very few young ladies have any affections worth caring for. And then, Fanny, the glory of fixing one who has been shot at by so many, of having it in one's power to pay off the debts of one's sex! Oh, I am sure it is not in woman's nature to refuse such a triumph." Fanny shook her head. "'I cannot think well of a man who sports with any woman's feelings, and there may often be a great deal more suffered than a stander-by can judge of. I do not defend him. I leave him entirely to your mercy. And when he has got you at Everingham, I do not care how much you lecture him. But this I will say, that his fault, the liking to make girls a little in love with him, is not half so dangerous to a wife's happiness as a tendency to fall in love himself, which he has never been addicted to. And I do seriously and truly believe that he is attached to you in a way he never was to any woman before, and that he loves you with all his heart, and will love you as nearly for ever as possible. If any man ever loved a woman for ever, I think Henry will do as much for you." Fanny could not avoid a faint smile, but had nothing to say. "'I cannot imagine Henry ever to have been happier,' continued Mary presently, than when he had succeeded in getting your brother's commission. She had made a sure push at Fanny's feelings here. "'Oh, yes! How very, very kind of him!' "'I know he must have exerted himself very much, for I know the parties he had to move. The Admiral hates trouble, and scorns asking favours, and there are so many young men's claims to be attended to in the same way, that a friendship and energy not very determined is easily put by. What a happy creature William must be! I wish we could see him!" Poor Fanny's mind was thrown into the most distressing of all its varieties. The recollection of what had been done for William was always the most powerful disturber of every decision against Mr. Crawford and she sat thinking deeply of it, till Mary, who had been first watching her complacently, and then musing on something else, suddenly called her attention by saying, "'I should like to sit talking with you here all day, but we must not forget the ladies below. And so good-bye, my dear, my amiable, my excellent Fanny, for though we shall nominally part in the breakfast-parlour, I must take leave of you here. And I do take leave, longing for a happy reunion, and trusting that when we meet again, it will be under circumstances which may open our hearts to each other without any remnant of shadow or reserve." A very, very kind embrace, and some agitation of manner, accompanied these words. "'I shall see your cousin in town soon. He talks of being there tolerably soon. And Sir Thomas, I dare say, in the course of the spring and your eldest cousin and the Rushworths and Julia I am sure of meeting again and again, and all but you. I have two favours to ask, Fanny. One is your correspondence. You must write to me. And the other, that you will often call on Mrs. Grant, and make her amends for my being gone." The first, at least, of these favours, Fanny would rather not have been asked, but it was impossible for her to refuse the correspondence. It was impossible for her even not to accede to it more readily than her own judgment authorised. There was no resisting so much apparent affection. Her disposition was peculiarly calculated to value a fond treatment, and from having hitherto known so little of it, she was the more overcome by Miss Crawford's. Besides, there was gratitude towards her, for having made their tete-a-tete -tete so much less painful than her fears had predicted. It was over and she had escaped without reproaches and without detection. Her secret was still her own, and while that was the case, she thought she could resign herself to almost everything. In the evening there was another parting. 
Henry Crawford came and sat some time with them, and her spirits not being previously in the strongest state, her heart was softened for a while towards him, because he really seemed to feel. Quite unlike his usual self, he scarcely said anything. He was evidently oppressed, and Fanny must grieve for him, though hoping she might never see him again till he were the husband of some other woman. When it came to the moment of parting, he would take her hand, he would not be denied it. He said nothing, however, or nothing that she heard, and when he had left the room she was better pleased that such a token of friendship had passed. On the morrow the Crawfords were gone. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Mr. Crawford gone, Sir Thomas's next object was that he should be missed and he entertained great hope that his niece would find a blank in the loss of those attentions which at the time she had felt or fancied an evil. She had tasted of consequence in its most flattering form, and he did hope that the loss of it, the sinking again into nothing, would awaken very wholesome regrets in her mind. He watched her with this idea, but he could hardly tell with what success. He hardly knew whether there were any difference in her spirits or not. She was always so gentle and retiring, that her emotions were beyond his discrimination. He did not understand her. He felt that he did not, and therefore applied to Edmund, to tell him how she stood affected on the present occasion, and whether she were more or less happy than she had been. Edmund did not discern any symptoms of regret, and thought his father a little unreasonable, in supposing the first three or four days could produce any. What chiefly surprised Edmund was that Crawford's sister, the friend and companion who had been so much to her, should not be more visibly regretted. He wondered that Fanny spoke so seldom of her, and had so little voluntarily to say of her concern at this separation. Alas! it was this sister, this friend and companion, who was now the chief bane of Fanny's comfort. If she could have believed Mary's future fate as unconnected with Mansfield, as she was determined the brother should be, if she could have hoped her return thither to be as distant as she was much inclined to think his, she would have been light of heart indeed. But the more she recollected and observed, the more deeply she was convinced that everything was now in a fairer train for Miss Crawford's marrying Edmund than it had ever been before. On his side the inclination was stronger, on hers less equivocal. His objections, the scruples of his integrity, seemed all done away. Nobody could tell how, and the doubts and hesitations of her ambition were equally got over, and equally without apparent reason. It could only be imputed to increasing attachment. His good and her bad feelings yielded to love, and such love must unite them. He was to go to town, as soon as some business relative to Thornton Lacey were completed. Perhaps within a fortnight, he talked of going, he loved to talk of it. And when once with her again, Fanny could not doubt the rest. Her acceptance must be as certain as his offer. And yet there were bad feelings still remaining, which made the prospect of it most sorrowful to her, independently—she believed independently of self. In their very last conversation, Miss Crawford, in spite of some amiable sensations and much personal kindness, had still been Miss Crawford, still shown a mind led astray and bewildered, and without any suspicion of being so, darkened, yet fancying itself light. She might love, but she did not deserve Edmund by any other sentiment. Fanny believed there was scarcely a second feeling in common between them. And she may be forgiven by older sages for looking on the chance of Miss Crawford's future improvement as nearly desperate, for thinking that if Edmund's influence in this season of love had already done so little in clearing her judgment, and regulating her notions, his worth would be finally wasted on her, even in years of matrimony. Experience might have hoped more for any young people so circumstanced, and impartiality would not have denied to Miss Crawford's nature, that participation of the general nature of women, which would lead her to adopt the opinions of the man she loved and respected as her own. But as such were Fanny's persuasions, she suffered very much from them, and could never speak of Miss Crawford without pain. Sir Thomas, meanwhile, went on with his own hopes and his own observations, still feeling a right, by all his knowledge of human nature, to expect to see the effect of the loss of power and consequence on his niece's spirits, and the past attentions of the lover producing a craving for their return. 
and he was soon afterwards able to account for his not yet completely and indubitably seeing all this by the prospect of another visitor, whose approach he could allow to be quite enough to support the spirits he was watching. William had obtained a ten days' leave of absence, to be given to Northamptonshire, and was coming, the happiest of lieutenants, because the latest maid, to show his happiness and describe his uniform. He came and he would have been delighted to show his uniform there, too, had not cruel custom prohibited its appearance except on duty. So the uniform remained at Portsmouth, and Edmund conjectured that before Fanny had any chance of seeing it, all its own freshness, and all the freshness of its wearer's feelings, must be worn away. It would be sunk into a badge of disgrace, for what can be more unbecoming, or more worthless, than the uniform of a lieutenant who has been a lieutenant a year or two, and sees others made commanders before him? So reasoned Edmund, till his father made him the confidant of a scheme which placed Fanny's chance of seeing the second lieutenant of H.M.S. Thrush, in all his glory, in another light. This scheme was that she should accompany her brother back to Portsmouth, and spend a little time with her own family. It had occurred to Sir Thomas, in one of his dignified musings, as a right and desirable measure. But before he absolutely made up his mind, he consulted his son. Edmund considered it every way, and saw nothing but what was right. The thing was good in itself, and could not be done at a better time, and he had no doubt of it being highly agreeable to Fanny. This was enough to determine Sir Thomas, and a decisive, "'Then so it shall be,' closed that stage of the business." Sir Thomas retiring from it with some feelings of satisfaction, and views of good over and above what he had communicated to his son. For his prime motive in sending her away had very little to do with the propriety of her seeing her parents again, and nothing at all with any idea of making her happy. He certainly wished her to go willingly, but he as certainly wished her to be heartily sick of home before her visit ended and that a little abstinence from the elegancies and luxuries of Mansfield Park would bring her mind into a sober state, and incline her to a juster estimate of the value of that home of greater permanence and equal comfort of which she had the offer. It was a medicinal project upon his niece's understanding, which he must consider as at present diseased. A residence of eight or nine years in the abode of wealth and plenty had a little disordered her powers of comparing and judging. Her father's house would, in all probability, teach her the value of a good income, and he trusted that she would be the wiser and happier woman all her life for the experiment he had devised. Had Fanny been at all addicted to raptures, she must have had a strong attack of them, when she first understood what was intended, when her uncle first made her the offer of visiting the parents and brothers and sisters, from whom she had been divided almost half her life, of returning for a couple of months to the scenes of her infancy, with William for the protector and companion of her journey, and the certainty of continuing to see William to the last hour of his remaining on land. Had she ever given way to bursts of delight, it must have been then, for she was delighted, but her happiness was of a quiet, deep, heart-swelling sort and though never a great talker, she was always more inclined to silence when feeling most strongly. At the moment she could only thank and accept. Afterwards, when familiarized with the visions of enjoyment so suddenly opened, she could speak more largely to William and Edmund of what she felt. But still there were emotions of tenderness that could not be clothed in words. The remembrance of all her earliest pleasures, and of what she had suffered in being torn from them, came over her with renewed strength, and it seemed as if to be at home again would heal every pain that had since grown out of the separation. To be in the centre of such a circle, loved by so many, and more loved by all than she had ever been before, to feel affection without fear or restraint, to feel herself the equal of those who surrounded her, to be at peace from all mention of the Crawfords, safe from every look which could be fancied a reproach on their account. This was a prospect to be dwelt on with a fondness that could be but half acknowledged. Edmund, too, to be but two months from him, and perhaps she might be allowed to make her absence three, must do her good. At a distance unassailed by his looks or his kindness, and safe from the perpetual irritation of knowing his heart, and striving to avoid his confidence, she should be able to reason herself into a proper estate. She should be able to think of him as in London, and arranging everything there without wretchedness. What might have been hard to bear at Mansfield was to become a slight evil at Portsmouth. The only drawback was the doubt of her Aunt Bertram's being comfortable without her. 
She was of use to no one else, but there she might be missed to a degree that she did not like to think of, and that part of the arrangement was, indeed, the hardest for Sir Thomas to accomplish, and what only he could have accomplished at all. But he was master at Mansfield Park. When he had really resolved on any measure, he could always carry it through. And now, by dint of long talking on the subject, explaining and dwelling on the duty of Fanny's sometimes seeing her family, he did induce his wife to let her go, obtaining it rather from submission, however, than conviction, for Lady Bertram was convinced of very little more than that Sir Thomas thought Fanny ought to go, and therefore that she must. In the calmness of her own dressing-room, in the impartial flow of her own meditations, unbiased by his bewildering statements, she could not acknowledge any necessity for Fanny's ever going near a father and mother who had done without her so long, while she was so useful to herself. And as to the not missing her, which under Mrs. Norris's discussion was the point attempted to be proved, she set herself very steadily against admitting any such thing. Sir Thomas had appealed to her reason, conscience, and dignity. He called it a sacrifice, and demanded it of her goodness and self-command as such. But Mrs. Norris wanted to persuade her that Fanny could be very well spared, she being ready to give up all her own time to her as requested, and, in short, could not really be wanted or missed. "'That may be, sister,' was all Lady Bertram's reply. "'I dare say you are very right, but I am sure I shall miss her very much.' The next step was to communicate with Portsmouth. Fanny wrote to offer herself, and her mother's answer, though short, was so kind, a few simple lines expressed so natural and motherly a joy in the prospect of seeing her child again, as to confirm all the daughter's views of happiness in being with her, convincing her that she should now find a warm and affectionate friend in the mamma who had certainly shown no remarkable fondness for her formerly but this she could easily suppose to have been her own fault, or her own fancy. She had probably alienated love by the helplessness and fretfulness of a fearful temper, or been unreasonable in wanting a larger share than any one among so many could deserve. Now, when she knew better how to be useful and how to forbear, and when her mother could no longer be occupied by the incessant demands of a house full of little children, there would be leisure and inclination for every comfort, and they should soon be what mother and daughter ought to be to each other. William was almost as happy in the plan as his sister. It would be the greatest pleasure to him to have her there to the last moment before he sailed, and perhaps find her there still when he came in from his first cruise and besides he wanted her so very much to see the thrush before she went out of harbour the thrush was certainly the finest sloop in the service and there were several improvements in the dockyard too which he quite longed to show her he did not scruple to add that her being at home for a while would be a great advantage to everybody i do not know how it is said he but we seem to want some of your nice ways and orderliness at my father's the house is always in confusion you will set things going in a better way, I am sure. You will tell my mother how it all ought to be, and you will be so useful to Susan, and you will teach Betsy, and make the boys love and mind you. How right and comfortable it will all be!" By the time Mrs. Price's answer arrived, there remained but a very few days more to be spent at Mansfield, and for part of one of those days the young travellers were in a good deal of alarm on the subject of their journey for when the mode of it came to be talked of and mrs norris found that all her anxiety to save her brother-in-law's money was vain and that in spite of her wishes and hints for a less expensive conveyance of fanny they were to travel post when she saw sir thomas actually give william notes for the purpose she was struck with the idea of there being room for a third in the carriage and suddenly seized with a strong inclination to go with them to go and see her poor dear sister Price. She proclaimed her thoughts. She must say that she had more than half a mind to go with the young people. It would be such an indulgence to her. She had not seen her poor dear sister Price for more than twenty years, and it would be a help to the young people in their journey to have her older head to manage for them. And she could not help thinking her poor dear sister Price would feel it very unkind of her not to come by such an opportunity. William and Fanny were horror-struck at the idea all the comfort of their comfortable journey would be destroyed at once with woeful countenances they looked at each other their suspense lasted an hour or two no one interfered to encourage or dissuade 
Mrs. Norris was left to settle the matter by herself, and it ended, to the infinite joy of her nephew and niece, in the recollection that she could not possibly be spared from Mansfield Park at present, that she was a great deal too necessary to Sir Thomas and Lady Bertram for her to be able to answer it to herself, to leave them even for a week, and therefore must certainly sacrifice every other pleasure to that of being useful to them. It had in fact occurred to her that, though taken to Portsmouth for nothing, it would hardly be possible for her to avoid paying her own expenses back again. So her poor dear sister Price was left to all the disappointment of her missing such an opportunity, and another twenty years' absence, perhaps, begun. Edmund's plans were affected by this Portsmouth journey, this absence of Fanny's. He too had a sacrifice to make to Mansfield Park, as well as his aunt. He had intended, about this time, to be going to London but he could not leave his father and mother just when everybody else of most importance to their comfort was leaving them, and with an effort, felt but not boasted of, he delayed for a week or two longer a journey which he was looking forward to, with the hope of its fixing his happiness for ever. He told Fanny of it. She knew so much already that she must know everything. It made the substance of one other confidential discourse about Miss Crawford and Fanny was the more affected from feeling it to be the last time in which Miss Crawford's name would ever be mentioned between them, with any remains of liberty. Once afterwards she was alluded to by him. Lady Bertram had been telling her niece in the evening to write to her soon and often, and promising to be a good correspondent herself. And Edmund, at a convenient moment, then added in a whisper, "'And I shall write to you, Fanny, when I have anything worth writing about, anything to say, that I think you will like to hear.' and that you will not hear so soon from any other quarter." Had she doubted his meaning while she listened, the glow in his face when she looked up at him would have been decisive. For this letter she must try to arm herself. That a letter from Edmund should be a subject of terror. She began to feel that she had not yet gone through all the changes of opinion and sentiment which the progress of time and variation of circumstances occasion in this world of changes. The vicissitudes of the human mind had not yet been exhausted by her. Poor Fanny! Though going, as she did, willingly and eagerly, the last evening at Mansfield Park must still be wretchedness. Her heart was completely sad at parting. She had tears for every room in the house, much more for every beloved inhabitant. She clung to her aunt, because she would miss her. She kissed the kind hand of her uncle with struggling sobs, because she had displeased him. And as for Edmund, she could neither speak, nor look, nor think, when the last moment came with him, and it was not till it was over that she knew he was giving her the affectionate farewell of a brother. All this passed overnight, for the journey was to begin very early in the morning, and when the small diminished party met at breakfast, William and Fanny were talked of as already advanced one stage. End of chapter 37 Chapter thirty eight of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. The novelty of travelling and the happiness of being with William soon produced their natural effect on Fanny's spirits when Mansfield Park was fairly left behind, and by the time their first stage was ended and they were to quit Sir Thomas's carriage, she was able to take leave of the old coachman and send back proper messages with cheerful looks. Of pleasant talk between the brother and sister there was no end. Everything supplied an amusement to the high glee of William's mind, and he was full of frolic and joke, in the intervals of their higher-toned subjects, all of which ended, if they did not begin, in praise of the thrush, conjectures how she would be employed, schemes for an action with some superior force, which, supposing the first lieutenant out of the way, and William was not very merciful to the first lieutenant, was to give himself the next step as soon as possible or speculations upon prize-money, which was to be generously distributed at home, with only the reservation of enough to make the little cottage comfortable, in which he and Fanny were to pass all their middle and latter life together. Fanny's immediate concerns, as far as they involved Mr. Crawford, made no part of their conversation. William knew what had passed, and from his heart lamented that his sister's feelings should be so cold towards a man whom he must consider as the first of human characters but he was of an age to be all for love, and therefore unable to blame. And knowing her wish on the subject, he would not distress her by the slightest allusion. She had reason to suppose herself not yet forgotten by Mr. Crawford. She had heard repeatedly from his sister within the three weeks which had passed since their leaving Mansfield, and in each letter there had been a few lines from himself. 
warm and determined like his speeches. It was a correspondence which Fanny found quite as unpleasant as she had feared. Miss Crawford's style of writing, lively and affectionate, was itself an evil, independent of what she was thus forced into reading from the brother's pen, for Edmund would never rest till she had read the chief of the letter to him, and then she had to listen to his admiration of her language and the warmth of her attachments. There had, in fact, been so much of message, of allusion, of recollection, so much of Mansfield in every letter, that Fanny could not but suppose it meant for him to hear, and to find herself forced into a purpose of that kind, compelled into a correspondence which was bringing her the addresses of the man she did not love, and obliging her to administer to the adverse passion of the man she did, was cruelly mortifying. Here, too, her present removal promised advantage. When no longer under the same roof with Edmund, she trusted that Miss Crawford would have no motive for writing, strong enough to overcome the trouble, and that at Portsmouth their correspondence would dwindle into nothing. With such thoughts as these, among ten hundred others, Fanny proceeded in her journey, safely and cheerfully, and as expeditiously as could rationally be hoped, in the dirty month of February. They entered Oxford, but she could take only a hasty glimpse of Edmund's College as they passed along, and made no stop anywhere till they reached Newbury, where a comfortable meal, uniting dinner and supper, wound up the enjoyments and fatigues of the day. The next morning saw them off again at an early hour, and with no events and no delays they regularly advanced, and were in the environs of Portsmouth while there was yet daylight for Fanny to look around her, and wonder at the new buildings. They passed the drawbridge, and entered the town, and the light was only beginning to fail, as, guided by William's powerful voice, they were rattled into a narrow street, leading from the high street, and drawn up before the door of a small house now inhabited by Mr. Price. Fanny was all agitation and flutter, all hope and apprehension. The moment they stopped, a trollopy-looking maid-servant, seemingly in waiting for them at the door, stepped forward, and, more intent on telling the news than giving them any help, immediately began with, "'The thrush has gone out of Arbour, please, sir, and one of the officers has been up here to—' She was interrupted by a fine tall boy of eleven years old, who, rushing out of the house, pushed the maid aside, and while William was opening the chaise door himself, called out, "'You are just in time. We've been looking for you this half-hour. The thrush went out of harbour this morning. I saw her. It was a beautiful sight. And they think she will have her orders in a day or two. And Mr. Campbell was here at four o'clock to ask for you. He has got one of the thrush's boats, and is going off to her at six, and hoped you would be here in time to go with him." A stare or two at Fanny, as William helped her out of the carriage, was all the voluntary notice which this brother bestowed, but he made no objection to her kissing him, though still entirely engaged in detailing farther particulars of the thrushes going out of harbour, in which he had a strong right of interest, being to commence his career of seamanship in her at this very time. Another moment, and Fanny was in the narrow entrance passage of the house, and in her mother's arms, who met her there with looks of true kindness, and with features which Fanny loved the more because they brought her Aunt Bertram's before her. And there were her two sisters, Susan, a well-grown fine girl of fourteen, and Betsy, the youngest of the family, about five, both glad to see her in their way, though with no advantage of manner in receiving her. But manner Fanny did not want. Would they but love her, she should be satisfied. She was then taken into a parlour, so small that her first conviction was of its being only a passage-room to something better, and she stood for a moment expecting to be invited on. But when she saw there was no other door, and that there were signs of habitation before her, she called back her thoughts, reproved herself, and grieved, lest they should have been suspected. Her mother, however, could not stay long enough to suspect anything. She was gone again to the street-door to welcome William. "'Oh, my dear William, how glad I am to see you! But have you heard about the thrush? She has gone out of harbour already, three days before we had any thought of it. And I do not know what I am to do about Sam's things. They will never be ready in time, for she may have her orders to-morrow, perhaps. It takes me quite unawares. And now you must be off for Spithead, too. Campbell has been here quite in a worry about you. And now what shall we do?' I thought to have had such a comfortable evening with you, and here everything comes upon me at once." Her son answered cheerfully, telling her that everything was always for the best, and making light of his own inconvenience in being obliged to hurry away so soon. "'To be sure. 
I had much rather she had stayed in harbour, that I might have sat a few hours with you in comfort, but as there is a boat ashore, I had better go off at once, and there is no help for it. Whereabouts does the thrush lay at Spithead? Near the canopus? But no matter. Here's Fanny in the parlour. And why should we stay in the passage? Come, mother, you have hardly looked at your own dear Fanny yet." In they both came, and Mrs. Price, having kindly kissed her daughter again, and commented a little on her growth, began with very natural solicitude to feel for their fatigues and wants as travellers. Poor dears! How tired you must both be! And now what will you have? I began to think you would never come. Betsy and I have been watching for you this half-hour. And when did you get anything to eat? And what would you like to have now? I could not tell whether you would be for some meat, or only a dish of tea after your journey, or else I would have got something ready. And now I am afraid Campbell will be here before there is time to dress a steak, and we have no butcher at hand. It is very inconvenient to have no butcher in the street. We were better off in our last house. Perhaps you would like some tea as soon as it can be got." They both declared they should prefer it to anything. "'Then, Betsy, my dear, run into the kitchen and see if Rebecca has put the water on, and tell her to bring in the tea-things as soon as she can. I wish we could get the bell mended, but Betsy is a very handy little messenger." Betsy went with alacrity, proud to show her abilities before her fine new sister. "'Dear me,' continued the anxious mother, "'what a sad fire we have got, and I dare say you are both starved with cold. Draw your chair nearer, my dear. I cannot think what Rebecca has been about. I am sure I told her to bring some coals half an hour ago. Susan, you should have taken care of the fire." "'I was upstairs, Mama, moving my things,' said Susan, in a fearless, self-defending tone which startled Fanny. "'You know you had but just settled that my sister Fanny and I should have the other room, and I could not get Rebecca to give me any help.' Farther discussion was prevented by various bustles. First the driver came to be paid. Then there was a squabble between Sam and Rebecca, about the manner of carrying up his sister's trunk, which he would manage all his own way, and lastly, in walked Mr. Price himself, his own loud voice preceding him, as with something of the oath kind he kicked away his son's portmanteau and his daughter's bandbox in the passage, and called out for a candle. No candle was brought, however, and he walked into the room. Fanny, with doubting feelings, had risen to meet him but sank down again, on finding herself undistinguished in the dusk, and unthought of. With a friendly shake of his son's hand, and an eager voice, he instantly began, "'Ha! Welcome back, my boy. Glad to see you. Have you heard the news? The thrush went out of harbour this morning. Sharp is the word, you see. By God, you are just in time. The doctor has been here inquiring for you. He has got one of the boats, and is to be off for Spithead by six, so you'd better go with him. I have been to Turner's about your mess. It is all in a way to be done.' I should not wonder if you had your orders to-morrow, but you cannot sail with this wind, if you are to cruise to the westward. And Captain Walsh thinks you will certainly have a cruise to the westward with the elephant. By God, I wish you may! But old Scully was saying just now that he thought you would be sent first to the Texel. Well, well, we are ready whatever happens, but by God you lost a fine sight by not being here in the morning, to see the thrush go out of harbour. I would not have been out of the way for a thousand pounds. Old Scully ran in at breakfast-time to say she had slipped her moorings and was coming out. I jumped up, and made but two steps to the platform. If ever there was a perfect beauty afloat, she is one. And there she lays at Spithead, and anybody in England would take her for an eight-and-twenty. I was upon the platform two hours this afternoon, looking at her. She lays close to the Endymion, between her and the Cleopatra, just to the eastward of the Sheer Hulk. Ha! Huh cried William. That's just where I should have put her myself. It's the best berth at Spithead. But here is my sister, sir. Here is Fanny." Turning and leading her forward, it is so dark you do not see her. With an acknowledgment that he had quite forgot her, Mr. Price now received his daughter, and having given her a cordial hug, and observed that she was grown into a woman, and he supposed would be wanting a husband soon, seemed very much inclined to forget her again. Fanny shrunk back to her seat, with feelings sadly pained by his language and his smell of spirits, and he talked on only to his son, and only of the thrush, though William, warmly interested as he was in that subject, more than once tried to make his father think of Fanny, and her long absence and long journey. After sitting some time longer, a candle was obtained. But as there was still no appearance of tea, nor from Betsy's reports from the kitchen, much hope of any under a considerable period, William determined to go and change his dress, and make the necessary preparations for his removal on board directly, that he might have his tea in comfort afterwards. 
As he left the room, two rosy-faced boys, ragged and dirty, about eight and nine years old, rushed into it just released from school, and coming eagerly to see their sister and tell that the thrush was gone out of harbour. Tom and Charles. Charles had been born since Fanny's going away, but Tom she had often helped to nurse, and now felt a particular pleasure in seeing again. Both were kissed very tenderly, but Tom she wanted to keep by her, to try to trace the features of the baby she had loved, and talk to him of his infant preference of herself. Tom, however, had no mind for such treatment. He came home not to stand and be talked to, but to run about and make a noise, and both boys had soon burst away from her, and slammed the parlour door till her temples ached. She had now seen all that were at home. There remained only two brothers between herself and Susan, one of whom was a clerk in a public office in London, and the other midshipman on board an Indiaman. But though she had seen all the members of the family, she had not yet heard all the noise they could make. Another quarter of an hour brought her a great deal more. William was soon calling out from the landing-place of the second story for his mother and for Rebecca. He was in distress for something that he had left there, and did not find again. A key was mislaid, Betsy accused of having got at his new hat, and some slight but essential alteration of his uniform waistcoat, which he had been promised to have done for him, entirely neglected. Mrs. Price, Rebecca, and Betsy all went up to defend themselves, all talking together, but Rebecca loudest, and the job was to be done as well as it could in a great hurry. William trying in vain to send Betsy down again, or keep her from being troublesome where she was the whole of which, as almost every door in the house was open, could be plainly distinguished in the parlour, except when drowned at intervals by the superior noise of Sam, Tom, and Charles chasing each other up and down stairs, and tumbling about and hallooing. Fanny was almost stunned. The smallness of the house and thinness of the walls brought everything so close to her, that added to the fatigue of her journey, and all her recent agitation, she hardly knew how to bear it. Within the room all was tranquil enough, for Susan having disappeared with the others, there were soon only her father and herself remaining, and he taking out a newspaper, the accustomary loan of a neighbour, applied himself to studying it, without seeming to recollect her existence. The solitary candle was held between himself and the paper, without any reference to her possible convenience, but she had nothing to do and was glad to have the light screened from her aching head, as she sat in bewildered, broken, sorrowful contemplation. She was at home. But alas! It was not such a home, she had not such a welcome, as— She checked herself. She was unreasonable. What right had she to be of importance to her family? She could have none, so long lost sight of. William's concerns must be dearest. They had always been, and he had every right. Yet to have so little said or asked about herself, to have scarcely an inquiry made after Mansfield! It did pain her to have Mansfield forgotten. The friends who had done so much, the dear, dear friends! But here one subject swallowed up all the rest. Perhaps it must be so. The destination of the thrush must be now pre-eminently interesting. A day or two might show the difference. She only was to blame. Yet she thought it would not have been so at Mansfield. No, in her uncle's house there would have been a consideration of times and seasons, a regulation of subject, a propriety, an attention towards everybody, which there was not here. The only interruption which thoughts like these received for nearly half an hour was from a sudden burst of her father's, not at all calculated to compose them. At a more than ordinary pitch of thumping and hallooing in the passage he exclaimed, "'Devil take those young dogs! How will they are singing out! Ay, Sam's voice louder than all the rest! That boy is fit for a boatswain! Hola! You there, Sam! Stop your confounded pipe, or I shall be after you!' This threat was so palpably disregarded, that, though within five minutes afterwards the three boys all burst into the room together and sat down, Fanny could not consider it as a proof of anything more than their being, for the time, thoroughly fagged, which their hot faces and panting breath seemed to prove, especially as they were still kicking each other's shins, and hallooing out at sudden starts immediately under their father's eye. The next opening of the door brought something more welcome. It was for the tea-things, which she had begun almost to despair of seeing that evening. Susan and an attendant girl, whose inferior appearance informed Fanny, to her great surprise, that she had previously seen the upper servant, brought in everything necessary for the meal. 
Susan looking as she put the kettle on the fire, and glanced at her sister, as if divided between the agreeable triumph of showing her activity and usefulness, and the dread of being thought to demean herself by such an office. She had been into the kitchen, she said, to hurry Sally and help make the toast, and spread the bread and butter, or she did not know when they should have got tea, and she was sure her sister must want something after her journey. Fanny was very thankful. She could not but own that she should be very glad of a little tea, and Susan immediately set about making it, as if pleased to have the employment all to herself, and with only a little unnecessary bustle, and some few injudicious attempts at keeping her brothers in better order than she could, acquitted herself very well. Fanny's spirit was as much refreshed as her body. Her head and heart were soon the better for such well-timed kindness. Susan had an open, sensible countenance. She was like William, and Fanny hoped to find her like him in disposition and good-will towards herself. In this more placid state of things William re-entered, followed not far behind by his mother and Betsy. He, complete in his lieutenant's uniform, looking and moving all the taller, firmer, and more graceful for it, and with the happiest smile over his face, walked up directly to Fanny, who, rising from her seat, looked at him for a moment in speechless admiration, and then threw her arms round his neck to sob out her various emotions of pain and pleasure. Anxious not to appear unhappy, she soon recovered herself, and wiping away her tears, was able to notice and admire all the striking parts of his dress, listening with reviving spirits to his cheerful hopes of being on shore some part of every day before they sailed, and even of getting her to Spithead to see the sloop. The next bustle brought in Mr. Campbell, the surgeon of the thrush, a very well-behaved young man, who came to call for his friend, and for whom there was with some contrivance found a chair and with some hasty washing of the young tea-makers, a cup and saucer. And after another quarter of an hour of earnest talk between the gentlemen, noise rising upon noise, and bustle upon bustle, men and boys at last all in motion together, the moment came for setting off. Everything was ready. William took leave, and all of them were gone, for the three boys, in spite of their mother's entreaty, determined to see their brother and Mr. Campbell to the sally-port, and Mr. Price walked off at the same time to carry back his neighbour's newspaper. Something like tranquillity might now be hoped for, and accordingly, when Rebecca had been prevailed on to carry away the tea-things, and Mrs. Price had walked about the room some time looking for a shirt-sleeve which Betsy at last hunted out from a drawer in the kitchen, the small party of females were pretty well composed, and the mother, having lamented again over the impossibility of getting Sam ready in time, was at leisure to think of her eldest daughter, and the friends she had come from. A few inquiries began but one of the earliest, how did her sister Bertram manage about her servants, was she as much plagued as herself to get tolerable servants, soon led her mind away from Northamptonshire, and fixed it on her own domestic grievances, and the shocking character of all the Portsmouth servants, of whom she believed her own two were the very worst, engrossed her completely. The Bertrams were all forgotten in detailing the faults of Rebecca, against whom Susan had also much to depose, and little Betsy a great deal more, and who did seem so thoroughly without a single recommendation, that Fanny could not help modestly presuming that her mother meant to part with her when her year was up. "'Her year!' cried Mrs. Price. "'I am sure I shall be rid of her before she has stayed a year, for that will not be up till November.' Servants are come to such a pass, my dear, in Portsmouth, that it is quite a miracle if one keeps them more than half a year. I have no hope of ever being settled, and if I was to part with Rebecca, I should only get something worse. And yet, I do not think I am a very difficult mistress to please, and I am sure the place is easy enough, for there is always a girl under her, and I often do half the work myself." Fanny was silent, but not from being convinced that there might not be a remedy found for some of these evils. As she now sat looking at Betsy, she could not but think particularly of another sister, a very pretty little girl, whom she had left there not much younger when she went into Northamptonshire, who had died a few years afterwards. There had been something remarkably amiable about her. Fanny, in those early days, had preferred her to Susan, and when the news of her death had at last reached Mansfield, had for a short time been quite afflicted. The sight of Betsy brought the image of little Mary back again but she would not have pained her mother by alluding to her for the world. While considering her with these ideas, Betsy, at a small distance, was holding out something to catch her eyes, meaning to screen it at the same time from Susan's. "'What have you got there, my love?' said Fanny. "'Come and show it to me.' It was a silver knife, 
Up jumped Susan, claiming it as her own, and trying to get it away, but the child ran to her mother's protection, and Susan could only reproach, which she did very warmly, and evidently hoping to interest Fanny on her side. It was very hard that she was not to have her own knife. It was her own knife. Little sister Mary had left it to her upon her deathbed, and she ought to have had it to keep herself long ago. But Mamma kept it from her, and was always letting Betsy get hold of it. And the end of it would be that Betsy would spoil it, and get it for her own, though Mamma had promised her that Betsy should not have it in her own hands. Fanny was quite shocked. Every feeling of duty, honour, and tenderness was wounded by her sister's speech, and her mother's reply. "'Now, Susan,' cried Mrs. Price in a complaining voice, "'now how can you be so cross? You are always quarrelling about that knife. I wish you would not be so quarrelsome. Poor little Betsy! How cross Susan is to you! But you should not have taken it out, my dear, when I sent you to the drawer. You know I told you not to touch it, because Susan is so cross about it. I must hide it another time, Betsy. Poor Mary little thought it would be such a bone of contention when she gave it me to keep, only two hours before she died. Poor little soul! She could but just speak to be heard, and she said so prettily, "'Let Sister Susan have my knife, Mamma, when I am dead and buried.' Poor little dear! She was so fond of it, Fanny, that she would have it lay by her in bed all through her illness. It was the gift of her good godmother, old Mrs. Admiral Maxwell, only six weeks before she was taken for death. Poor little sweet creature! Well, she has been taken away from evil to come. My own Betsy, fondling her, you have not the luck of such a good godmother. Aunt Norris lives too far off to think of such little people as you." Fanny had indeed nothing to convey from Aunt Norris but a message to say she hoped her goddaughter was a good girl, and learnt her book. There had been at one moment a slight murmur in the drawing-room at Mansfield Park, about sending her a prayer-book, but no second sound had been heard of such a purpose. Mrs. Norris, however, had gone home and taken down two old prayer-books of her husband with that idea, but upon examination the ardour of generosity went off. One was found to have too small a print for a child's eyes, and the other to be too cumbersome for her to carry about. Fanny, fatigued and fatigued again, was thankful to accept the first invitation of going to bed, and before Betsy had finished her cry at being allowed to sit up only one hour extraordinary in honour of sister, she was off, leaving all below in confusion and noise again, the boys begging for toasted cheese, her father calling out for his rum and water, and Rebecca never where she ought to be. There was nothing to raise her spirits in the confined and scantily furnished chamber that she was to share with Susan. The smallness of the rooms above and below, indeed, and the narrowness of the passage and staircase, struck her beyond her imagination. She soon learnt to think with respect of her own little attic at Mansfield Park, in that house reckoned too small for anybody's comfort. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen could Sir Thomas have seen all his niece's feelings when she wrote her first letter to her aunt, he would not have despaired. For though a good night's rest, a pleasant morning, the hope of soon seeing William again, and the comparatively quiet state of the house, from Tom and Charles being gone to school, Sam on some project of his own, and her father on his usual lounges, enabled her to express herself cheerfully on the subject of home, there were still to her own perfect consciousness many drawbacks suppressed. Could he have seen only half that she felt before the end of a week, he would have thought Mr. Crawford sure of her, and been delighted with his own sagacity. Before the week ended, it was all disappointment. In the first place William was gone. The thrush had had her orders, the wind had changed, and he was sailed within four days from their reaching Portsmouth, and during those days she had seen him only twice, in a short and hurried way, when he had come ashore on duty. There had been no free conversation, no walk on the ramparts, no visit to the dockyard, no acquaintance with the thrush, nothing of all that they had planned and depended on. Everything in that quarter failed her, except William's affection. His last thought on leaving home was for her. He stepped back again to the door to say, "'Take care of Fanny, mother. She is tender, and not used to rough it like the rest of us. I charge you, take care of Fanny.' William was gone, and the home he had left her in was— Fanny could not conceal it from herself, in almost every respect, the very reverse of what she could have wished. It was the abode of noise, disorder, and impropriety. Nobody was in their right place, nothing was done as it ought to be. 
she could not respect her parents as she had hoped. On her father her confidence had not been sanguine, but he was more negligent of his family, his habits were worse, and his manners coarser, than she had been prepared for. He did not want abilities, but he had no curiosity, and no information beyond his profession. He read only the newspaper and the navy list. He talked only of the dockyard, the harbour, Spithead, and the mother-bank. He swore and he drank. He was dirty and gross. She had never been able to recall anything approaching to tenderness in his former treatment of herself. There had remained only a general impression of roughness and loudness, and now he scarcely ever noticed her but to make her the object of a coarse joke. Her disappointment in her mother was greater. There she had hoped much, and found almost nothing. Every flattering scheme of being of consequence to her soon fell to the ground. Mrs. Price was not unkind, but instead of gaining on her affection and confidence, and becoming more and more dear, her daughter never met with greater kindness from her than on the first day of her arrival. The instinct of nature was soon satisfied, and Mrs. Price's attachment had no other source. Her heart and her time were already quite full. She had neither leisure nor affection to bestow on Fanny. Her daughters never had been much to her. She was fond of her sons, especially of William, but Betsy was the first of her girls whom she had ever much regarded. To her she was most injudiciously indulgent. William was her pride, Betsy her darling, and John, Richard, Sam, Tom, and Charles occupied all the rest of her maternal solicitude, alternately her worries and her comforts. These shared her heart. Her time was given chiefly to her house and her servants. Her days were spent in a kind of slow bustle always busy without getting on, always behindhand and lamenting it, without altering her ways, wishing to be an economist, without contrivance or regularity, dissatisfied with her servants, without skill to make them better, and whether helping or reprimanding or indulging them, without any power of engaging their respect. Of her two sisters, Mrs. Price very much more resembled Lady Bertram than Mrs. Norris. She was a manager by necessity, without any of Mrs. Norris's inclination for it, or any of her activity. Her disposition was naturally easy and indolent, like Lady Bertram's, and a situation of similar affluence and do-nothingness would have been much more suited to her capacity than the exertions and self-denials of the one which her imprudent marriage had placed her in. She might have made just as good a woman of consequence as Lady Bertram, but Mrs. Norris would have been a more respectable mother of nine children on a small income. Much of all this Fanny could not but be sensible of. She might scruple to make use of the words, but she must and did feel that her mother was a partial, ill-judging parent, a dawdle, a slattern, who neither taught nor restrained her children, whose house was the scene of mismanagement and discomfort from beginning to end, and who had no talent, no conversation, no affection towards herself, no curiosity to know her better, no desire of her friendship, and no inclination for her company that could lessen her sense of such feelings. Fanny was very anxious to be useful, and not to appear above her home, or in any way disqualified or disinclined by her foreign education from contributing her help to its comforts, and therefore set about working for Sam immediately, and by working early and late, with perseverance and great dispatch, did so much that the boy was shipped off at last, with more than half his linen ready. She had great pleasure in feeling her usefulness, but could not conceive how they would have managed without her. Sam, loud and overbearing as he was, she rather regretted when he went, for he was clever and intelligent, and glad to be employed in any errand in the town, and though spurning the remonstrances of Susan, given as they were, though very reasonable in themselves, with ill-timed and powerless warmth, was beginning to be influenced by Fanny's services and gentle persuasions, and she found that the best of the three younger ones was gone in him. Tom and Charles, being at least as many years as they were his juniors distant from that age of feeling and reason, which might suggest the expediency of making friends, and of endeavouring to be less disagreeable. Their sister soon despaired of making the smallest impression on them. They were quite untamable by any means of address which she had spirits or time to attempt. Every afternoon brought a return of their riotous games all over the house, and she very early learnt to sigh at the approach of Saturday's constant half-holiday. Betsy, too, a spoilt child, trained up to think the alphabet her greatest enemy, 
left to be with the servants at her pleasure, and then encouraged to report any evil of them, she was almost as ready to despair of being able to love or assist. And of Susan's temper she had many doubts. Her continual disagreements with her mother, her rash squabbles with Tom and Charles, and petulance with Betsy, were at least so distressing to Fanny that, though admitting they were by no means without provocation, she feared the disposition that could push them to such length must be far from amiable, and from affording any repose to herself. Such was the home which was to put Mansfield out of her head, and teach her to think of her cousin Edmund with moderated feelings. On the contrary, she could think of nothing but Mansfield, its beloved inmates, its happy ways. Everything where she was now was in full contrast to it. The elegance, propriety, regularity, harmony, and perhaps above all, the peace and tranquillity of Mansfield, were brought to her remembrance every hour of the day, by the prevalence of everything opposite to them here. The living in incessant noise was to a frame and temper delicate and nervous like Fanny's, an evil which no superadded elegance or harmony could have entirely atoned for. It was the greatest misery of all. At Mansfield no sounds of contention, no raised voice, no abrupt bursts, no tread of violence was ever heard. All proceeded in a regular course of cheerful orderliness. Everybody had their due importance, everybody's feelings were consulted. If tenderness could be ever supposed wanting, good sense and good breeding supplied its place. And as to the little irritations, sometimes introduced by Aunt Norris, they were short, they were trifling, they were as a drop of water to the ocean, compared with the ceaseless tumult of her present abode. Here everybody was noisy, every voice was loud, excepting perhaps her mother's, which resembled the soft monotony of Lady Bertram's, only worn into fretfulness. Whatever was wanted was hallooed for, and the servants hallooed out their excuses from the kitchen. The doors were in constant banging, the stairs were never at rest, nothing was done without a clatter, nobody sat still, and nobody could command attention when they spoke. In a review of the two houses, as they appeared to her before the end of a week, Fanny was tempted to apply to them Dr. Johnson's celebrated judgment as to matrimony and celibacy, and say that though Mansfield Park might have some pains, Portsmouth could have no pleasures. End of chapter 39 Chapter 40 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Fanny was right enough in not expecting to hear from Miss Crawford now, at the rapid rate in which their correspondence had begun. Mary's next letter was after a decidedly longer interval than the last, but she was not right in supposing that such an interval would be felt a great relief to herself. Here was another strange revolution of mind. She was really glad to receive the letter when it did come. In her present exile from good society, and distance from everything that had been wont to interest her, a letter from one belonging to the set where her heart lived, written with affection and some degree of elegance, was thoroughly acceptable. The usual plea of increasing engagements was made an excuse for not having written to her earlier. "'And now that I have begun,' she continued, "'my letter will not be worth your reading, for there will be no little offering of love at the end, no three or four lines passionnées from the most devoted H. C. in the world, for Henry is in Norfolk. Business called him to Everingham ten days ago, or perhaps he only pretended the call, for the sake of being travelling at the same time that you were. But there he is, and, by the way, his absence may sufficiently account for any remissness of his sister's writing, for there has been no, "'Well, Mary, when do you write to Fanny? Is not it time for you to write to Fanny to spur me on?' At last, after various attempts at meeting, I have seen your cousins, dear Julia and dearest Mrs. Rushworth. They found me at home yesterday, and we were glad to see each other again. We seemed very glad to see each other, and I do really think we were a little. We had a vast deal to say. Shall I tell you how Mrs. Rushworth looked when your name was mentioned? I did not used to think her wanting in self-possession, but she had not quite enough for the demands of yesterday. Upon the whole, Julia was in the best looks of the two, at least after you were spoken of. There was no recovering the complexion from the moment that I spoke of Fanny, and spoke of her as a sister should. But Mrs. Rushworth's day of good looks will come. We have cards for her first party on the twenty-eighth. Then she will be in beauty, for she will open one of the best houses in Wimpole Street. 
I was in it two years ago, when I was at Lady Lascelles, and prefer it to almost any I know in London, and certainly she will then feel, to use a vulgar phrase, that she has got her pennyworth for her penny. Henry could not have afforded her such a house. I hope she will recollect it and be satisfied, as well she may, with moving the queen of a palace, though the king may appear best in the background, and as I have no desire to tease her, I shall never force your name upon her again. She will grow sober by degrees. From all that I hear and guess, Baron Wildenheim's attentions to Julia continue, but I do not know that he has any serious encouragement. She ought to do better. A poor honourable is no catch, and I cannot imagine any liking in the case, for take away his rants, and the poor Baron has nothing. What a difference a vowel makes! If his rents were but equal to his rants! Your cousin Edmund moves slowly detained, perchance, by parish duties. There may be some old woman at Thornton Lacey to be converted. I am unwilling to fancy myself neglected for a young one. Adieu, my dear sweet Fanny. This is a long letter from London. Write me a pretty one in reply to gladden Henry's eyes when he comes back, and send me an account of all the dashing young captains whom you disdain for his sake." There was great food for meditation in this letter, and chiefly for unpleasant meditation. And yet, with all the uneasiness it supplied, it connected her with the absent. It told her of people and things about whom she had never felt so much curiosity as now, and she would have been glad to have been sure of such a letter every week. Her correspondence with her Aunt Bertram was her only concern of higher interest. As for any society in Portsmouth, that could at all make amends for deficiencies at home, there were none within the circle of her father's and mother's acquaintance to afford her the smallest satisfaction. She saw nobody in whose favour she could wish to overcome her own shyness and reserve. The men appeared to her all coarse, the women all pert, and everybody underbred and she gave as little contentment as she received from introductions either to old or new acquaintance. The young ladies who approached her at first with some respect, in consideration of her coming from a baronet's family, were soon offended by what they termed airs, for as she neither played on the pianoforte nor wore fine pelisses, they could, on farther observation, admit no right of superiority. The first solid consolation which Fanny received for the evils of home, the first which her judgment could entirely approve, and which gave any promise of durability, was in a better knowledge of Susan, and a hope of being of service to her. Susan had always behaved so pleasantly to herself, but the determined character of her general manners had astonished and alarmed her, and it was at least a fortnight before she began to understand a disposition so totally different from her own. Susan saw much that was wrong at home, and wanted to set it right. That a girl of fourteen, acting only on her own unassisted reason, should err in the method of reform, was not wonderful. And Fanny soon became more disposed to admire the natural light of the mind which could so early distinguish justly, than to censure severely the faults of conduct to which it led. Susan was only acting on the same truths, and pursuing the same system, which her own judgment acknowledged, but which her more supine and yielding temper would have shrunk from asserting. Susan tried to be useful, where she could only have gone away and cried, and that Susan was useful she could perceive, that things, bad as they were, would have been worse, but for such interposition, and that both her mother and Betsy were restrained from some excesses of very offensive indulgence and vulgarity. In every argument with her mother, Susan had in point of reason the advantage, and never was there any maternal tenderness to buy her off. The blind fondness which was for ever producing evil around her, she had never known. There was no gratitude for affection, past or present, to make her better bear with its excesses to the others. All this became gradually evident, and gradually placed Susan before her sister as an object of mingled compassion and respect. That her manner was wrong, however, at times very wrong, her measures often ill-chosen and ill-timed, and her looks and language very often indefensible, Fanny could not cease to feel. But she began to hope that they might be rectified. Susan, she found, looked up to her, and wished for her good opinion, 
and new as anything like an office of authority was to Fanny, new as it was to imagine herself capable of guiding or informing any one, she did resolve to give occasional hints to Susan, and endeavour to exercise for her advantage the juster notions of what was due to everybody, and what would be wisest for herself, which her own more favoured education had fixed in her. Her influence, or at least the consciousness and use of it, originated in an act of kindness by Susan, which after many hesitations of delicacy she at last worked herself up to. It had very early occurred to her that a small sum of money might perhaps restore peace for ever on the sore subject of the silver knife, canvassed as it now was continually, and the riches which she was in possession of herself, her uncle having given her ten pounds at parting, made her as able as she was willing to be generous. But she was so wholly unused to confer favours except on the very poor, so unpractised in removing evils, or bestowing kindnesses among her equals, and so fearful of appearing to elevate herself as a great lady at home, that it took some time to determine that it would not be unbecoming in her to make such a present. It was made, however, at last. A silver knife was bought for Betsy, and accepted with great delight, its newness giving it every advantage over the other that could be desired. Susan was established in the full possession of her own, Betsy handsomely declaring that now she had got one so much prettier herself, she should never want that again, and no reproach seemed conveyed to the equally satisfied mother, which Fanny had almost feared to be impossible. The deed thoroughly answered, a source of domestic altercation was entirely done away, and it was the means of opening Susan's heart to her, and giving her something more to love and be interested in. Susan showed that she had delicacy pleased as she was to be mistress of property, which she had been struggling for at least two years, she yet feared that her sister's judgment had been against her, and that a reproof was designed for her for having so struggled as to make the purchase necessary for the tranquillity of the house. Her temper was open. She acknowledged her fears, blamed herself for having contended so warmly, and from that hour Fanny, understanding the worth of her disposition, and perceiving how fully she was inclined to seek her good opinion and refer to her judgment, began to feel again the blessing of affection, and to entertain the hope of being useful to a mind so much in need of help, and so much deserving it. She gave advice, advice too sound to be resisted by a good understanding, and given so mildly and considerately as not to irritate an imperfect temper. And she had the happiness of observing its good effects not unfrequently. More was not to be expected by one who, while seeing all the obligation and expediency of submission and forbearance, saw also with sympathetic acuteness of feeling all that must be hourly grating to a girl like Susan. Her greatest wonder on the subject soon became, not that Susan should have been provoked into disrespect and impatience against her better knowledge, but that so much better knowledge, so many good notions, should have been hers at all, and that, brought up in the midst of negligence and error, she should have formed such proper opinions of what ought to be, she who had no cousin Edmund to direct her thoughts or fix her principles. The intimacy thus begun between them was a material advantage to each. By sitting together upstairs, they avoided a great deal of the disturbance of the house. Fanny had peace, and Susan learnt to think it no misfortune to be quietly employed. They sat without a fire, but that was a privation familiar even to Fanny, and she suffered the less because reminded by it of the East Room. It was the only point of resemblance. In space, light, furniture, and prospect, there was nothing alike in the two apartments, and she often heaved a sigh at the remembrance of all her books and boxes, and various comforts there. By degrees the girls came to spend the chief of the morning upstairs, at first only in working and talking, but after a few days the remembrance of the said books grew so potent and stimulative that Fanny found it impossible not to try for books again. There were none in her father's house, but wealth is luxurious and daring, and some of hers found its way to a circulating library. She became a subscriber, amazed at being anything in propria persona, amazed at her own doings in every way. To be a renter, a chooser of books, and to be having any one's improvement in view in her choice. But so it was. Susan had read nothing, and Fanny longed to give her a share in her own first pleasures, and inspire a taste for the biography and poetry which she delighted in herself. 
In this occupation she hoped, moreover, to bury some of the recollections of Mansfield which were too apt to seize her mind, if her fingers only were busy, and especially at this time hoped it might be useful in diverting her thoughts from pursuing Edmund to London, whither, on the authority of her aunt's last letter, she knew he was gone. She had no doubt of what would ensue. The promised notification was hanging over her head. The postman's knock within the neighbourhood was beginning to bring its daily terrors, and if reading could banish the idea for even half an hour, it was something gained. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen A week was gone since Edmund might be supposed in town, and Fanny had heard nothing of him. There were three different conclusions to be drawn from his silence, between which her mind was in fluctuation, each of them at times being held the most probable. Either his going had been again delayed, or he had yet procured no opportunity of seeing Miss Crawford alone, or he was too happy for letter-writing. One morning about this time, Fanny having now been nearly four weeks from Mansfield, a point which she never failed to think over and calculate every day, as she and Susan were preparing to remove as usual upstairs, they were stopped by the knock of a visitor, whom they felt they could not avoid, from Rebecca's alertness in going to the door, a duty which always interested her beyond any other. It was a gentleman's voice. It was a voice that Fanny was just turning pale about, when Mr. Crawford walked into the room. Good sense, like hers, will always act when really called upon and she found that she had been able to name him to her mother, and recall her remembrance of the name, as that of William's friend, though she could not previously have believed herself capable of uttering a syllable at such a moment. The consciousness of his being known there only as William's friend was some support. Having introduced him, however, and being all reseated, the terrors that occurred of what this visit might lead to were overpowering, and she fancied herself on the point of fainting away. While trying to keep herself alive, their visitor, who had at first approached her with as animated a countenance as ever, was wisely and kindly keeping his eyes away, and giving her time to recover, while he devoted himself entirely to her mother, addressing her and attending her with the utmost politeness and propriety, at the same time with a degree of friendliness, of interest at least, which was making his manner perfect. Mrs. Price's manners were also at their best. Warmed by the sight of such a friend to her son, and regulated by the wish of appearing to advantage before him, she was overflowing with gratitude, artless maternal gratitude, which could not be unpleasing. Mr. Price was out, which she regretted very much. Fanny was just recovered enough to feel that she could not regret it, for to her many other sources of uneasiness was added the severe one of shame for the home in which she found her. She might scold herself for the weakness, but there was no scolding it away. She was ashamed, and she should have been yet more ashamed of her father than of all the rest. They talked of William, a subject on which Mrs. Price could never tire, and Mr. Crawford was as warm in his commendation as even her heart could wish. She felt that she had never seen so agreeable a man in her life, and was only astonished to find that so great and so agreeable as he was, he should be come down to Portsmouth neither on a visit to the Port Admiral, nor the Commissioner, nor yet with the intention of going over to the island, nor of seeing the dockyard. Nothing of all that she had been used to think of as the proof of importance, or the employment of wealth, had brought him to Portsmouth. He had reached it late the night before was come for a day or two, was staying at the Crown, had accidentally met with a navy officer or two of his acquaintance since his arrival, but had no object of that kind in coming. By the time he had given all this information, it was not unreasonable to suppose that Fanny might be looked at and spoken to, and she was tolerably able to bear his eye, and hear that he had spent half an hour with his sister the evening before his leaving London, that she had sent her best and kindest love, but had had no time for writing that he thought himself lucky in seeing mary for even half an hour having spent scarcely twenty-four hours in london after his return from norfolk before he set off again that her cousin edmund was in town had been in town he understood a few days that he had not seen him himself but that he was well had left them all well at mansfield and was to dine as yesterday with the frasers fanny listened collectedly even to the last mentioned circumstance nay it seemed a relief to her worn mind to be at any certainty and the words then by this time it is all settled passed internally without more evidence of emotion than a faint blush 
After talking a little more about Mansfield, a subject in which her interest was most apparent, Crawford began to hint at the expediency of an early walk. It was a lovely morning, and at that season of the year a fine morning so often turned off that it was wisest for everybody not to delay their exercise. And such hints producing nothing, he soon proceeded to a positive recommendation to Mrs. Price and her daughters to take their walk without loss of time. Now they came to an understanding. Mrs. Price, it appeared, scarcely ever stirred out of doors, except of a Sunday. She owned she could seldom, with her large family, find time for a walk. Would she not then persuade her daughters to take advantage of such weather, and allow him the pleasure of attending them? Mrs. Price was greatly obliged, and very complying. Her daughters were very much confined. Portsmouth was a sad place, they did not often get out, and she knew they had some errands in the town, which they would be very glad to do. And the consequence was, that Fanny, strange as it was, strange, awkward, and distressing, found herself and Susan within ten minutes walking towards the High Street with Mr. Crawford. It was soon pain upon pain, confusion upon confusion, for they were hardly in the High Street before they met her father, whose appearance was not the better from its being Saturday. He stopped, and, ungentlemanlike as he looked, Fanny was obliged to introduce him to Mr. Crawford. She could not have a doubt of the manner in which Mr. Crawford must be struck. He must be ashamed and disgusted altogether. He must soon give her up, and cease to have the smallest inclination for the match. And yet, though she had been so much wanting his affection to be cured, this was a sort of cure that would be almost as bad as the complaint. And I believe there is scarcely a young lady in the United Kingdoms who would not rather put up with the misfortune of being sought by a clever, agreeable man, than have him driven away by the vulgarity of her nearest relations. Mr. Crawford probably could not regard his future father-in-law with any idea of taking him for a model in dress, but as Fanny instantly and to her great relief discerned, her father was a very different man a very different Mr. Price in his behaviour to this most highly respected stranger from what he was in his own family at home. His manners now, though not polished, were more than passable. They were grateful, animated, manly. His expressions were those of an attached father and a sensible man. His loud tones did very well in the open air, and there was not a single oath to be heard. Such was his instinctive compliment to the good manners of Mr. Crawford, and be the consequence what it might, Fanny's immediate feelings were infinitely soothed. The conclusion of the two gentlemen's civilities was an offer of Mr. Price's to take Mr. Crawford into the dockyard, which Mr. Crawford, desirous of accepting as a favour what was intended as such, though he had seen the dockyard again and again, and hoping to be so much the longer with Fanny, was very gratefully disposed to avail himself of if the Miss Prices were not afraid of the fatigue, and as it was somehow or other ascertained, or inferred, or at least acted upon, that they were not at all afraid, to the dockyard they were all to go. And but for Mr. Crawford, Mr. Price would have turned thither directly, without the smallest consideration for his daughter's errands in the High Street. He took care, however, that they should be allowed to go to the shops they came out expressly to visit, and it did not delay them long for Fanny could so little bear to excite impatience or be waited for, that before the gentlemen, as they stood at the door, could do more than begin upon the last naval regulations, or settle the number of three-deckers now in commission, their companions were ready to proceed. They were then to set forward for the dockyard at once, and the walk would have been conducted, according to Mr. Crawford's opinion, in a singular manner, had Mr. Price been allowed the entire regulation of it, as the two girls, he found, would have been left to follow, and keep up with them or not, as they could, while they walked on together at their own hasty pace. He was able to introduce some improvement occasionally, though by no means to the extent he wished. He absolutely would not walk away from them, and at any crossing or any crowd, when Mr. Price was only calling out, "'Come, girls, come, Fan, come, Sue, take care of yourselves, keep a sharp look-out,' he would give them his particular attendance. Once fairly in the dockyard, he began to reckon upon some happy intercourse with Fanny, as they were very soon joined by a brother lounger of Mr. Price's, who was come to take his daily survey of how things went on, and who must prove a far more worthy companion than himself. And after a time the two officers seemed very well satisfied in going about together, and discussing matters of equal and never-failing interest, while the young people sat down upon some timbers in the yard, or found a seat on board a vessel in the stocks, which they all went to look at. Fanny was most conveniently in want of rest. Crawford could not have wished her more fatigued or more ready to sit down, but he could have wished her sister away. 
A quick-looking girl of Susan's age was the very worst third in the world, totally different from Lady Bertram, all eyes and ears, and there was no introducing the main point before her. He must content himself with being only generally agreeable, and letting Susan have her share of entertainment, with the indulgence now and then of a look or hint for the better informed and conscious Fanny. Norfolk was what he had mostly to talk of. There he had been some time, and everything there was rising in importance from his present schemes. Such a man could come from no place, no society, without importing something to amuse. His journeys and his acquaintance were all of use, and Susan was entertained in a way quite new to her. For Fanny, something more was related than the accidental agreeableness of the parties he had been in. For her approbation, the particular reason of his going into Norfolk at all, at this unusual time of year, was given. It had been real business, relative to the renewal of a lease, in which the welfare of a large, and he believed, industrious family was at stake. He had suspected his agent of some underhand dealing, of meaning to bias him against the deserving, and he had determined to go himself, and thoroughly investigate the merits of the case. He had gone, had done even more good than he had foreseen had been useful to more than his first plan had comprehended, and was now able to congratulate himself upon it, and to feel that in performing a duty he had secured agreeable recollections for his own mind. He had introduced himself to some tenants, whom he had never seen before, had begun making acquaintance with cottages whose very existence, though on his own estate, had been hitherto unknown to him. This was aimed, and well aimed, at Fanny. It was pleasing to hear him speak so properly. Here he had been acting as he ought to do. To be the friend of the poor and oppressed, nothing could be more grateful to her, and she was on the point of giving him an approving look, when it was all frightened off by his adding a something too pointed, of his hoping soon to have an assistant, a friend, a guide in every plan of utility or charity for Everingham, a somebody that would make Everingham and all about it a dearer object than it had ever been yet. She turned away, and wished he would not say such things. She was willing to allow he might have more good qualities than she had been wont to suppose. She began to feel the possibility of his turning out well at last, but he was and must ever be completely unsuited to her, and ought not to think of her. He perceived that enough had been said of Everingham, and that it would be as well to talk of something else, and turn to Mansfield. He could not have chosen better. That was a topic to bring back her attention and her looks almost instantly. It was a real indulgence to her to hear or to speak of Mansfield. Now so long divided from everybody who knew the place, she felt it quite the voice of a friend when he mentioned it, and led the way to her fond exclamations in praise of its beauties and comforts, and by his honourable tribute to its inhabitants, allowed her to gratify her own heart in the warmest eulogium, in speaking of her uncle as all that was clever and good, and her aunt as having the sweetest of all sweet tempers. He had a great attachment to Mansfield himself. He said so. He looked forward with hope of spending much, very much, of his time there, always there or in the neighbourhood. He particularly built upon a very happy summer and autumn there this year. He felt that it would be so. He depended upon it. A summer and autumn infinitely superior to the last. As animated, as diversified, as social, but with circumstances of superiority indescribable. "'Mansfield, Southerton, Thornton, Lacey,' he continued, "'what a society will be comprised in those houses! And at Michaelmas, perhaps, a fourth may be added, some small hunting-box in the vicinity of everything so dear. For as to any partnership in Thornton, Lacey, as Edmund Bertram once good-humouredly proposed, I hope I foresee two objections, two fair, excellent, irresistible objections, to that plan.' Fanny was doubly silenced here though when the moment was past, could regret that she had not forced herself into the acknowledged comprehension of one half of his meaning, and encouraged him to say something more of his sister and Edmund. It was a subject which she must learn to speak of, and the weakness that shrunk from it would soon be quite unpardonable. When Mr. Price and his friend had seen all that they wished, or had time for, the others were ready to return and in the course of their walk back, Mr. Crawford contrived a minute's privacy, for telling Fanny that his only business in Portsmouth was to see her, that he was come down for a couple of days on her account, and hers only, and because he could not endure a longer total separation. She was sorry, really sorry, and yet in spite of this, and the two or three other things which she wished he had not said, she thought him altogether improved since she had seen him. 
He was much more gentle, obliging, and attentive to other people's feelings than he had ever been at Mansfield. She had never seen him so agreeable, so near being agreeable. His behaviour to her father could not offend, and there was something particularly kind and proper in the notice he took of Susan. He was decidedly improved. She wished the next day over. She wished he had come only for one day, but it was not so very bad as she would have expected. The pleasure of talking of Mansfield was so very great. Before they parted, she had to thank him for another pleasure, and one of no trivial kind. Her father asked him to do them the honour of taking his mutton with them, and Fanny had time for only one thrill of horror before he declared himself prevented by a prior engagement. He was engaged to dinner already both for that day and the next. He had met with some acquaintance at the Crown, who would not be denied. He should have the honour, however, of waiting on them again on the morrow, etc. And so they parted, Fanny in a state of actual felicity from escaping so horrible an evil. To have had him join their family dinner-party, and see all their deficiencies, would have been dreadful. Rebecca's cookery, and Rebecca's waiting, and Betsy's eating at table without restraint, and pulling everything about as she chose, were what Fanny herself was not yet enough inured to, for her often to make a tolerable meal. She was nice only from natural delicacy, but he had been brought up in a school of luxury and epicurism. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen the Prices were just setting off for church the next day, when Mr. Crawford appeared again. He came, not to stop, but to join them. He was asked to go with them to the garrison chapel, which was exactly what he had intended, and they all walked thither together. The family were now seen to advantage. Nature had given them no inconsiderable share of beauty, and every Sunday dressed them in their cleanest skins and best attire. Sunday always brought this comfort to Fanny, and on this Sunday she felt it more than ever. Her poor mother now did not look so very unworthy of being Lady Bertram's sister, as she was but too apt to look. It often grieved her to the heart to think of the contrast between them, to think that where nature had made so little difference, circumstances should have made so much, and that her mother, as handsome as Lady Bertram, and some years her junior, should have an appearance so much more worn and faded, so comfortless, so slatternly, so shabby. But Sunday made her a very creditable and tolerably cheerful-looking Mrs. Price, coming abroad with a fine family of children, feeling a little respite of her weekly cares, and only discomposed if she saw her boys run into danger, or Rebecca pass by with a flower in her hat. In chapel they were obliged to divide, but Mr. Crawford took care not to be divided from the female branch, and after chapel he still continued with them, and made one in the family party on the ramparts. Mrs. Price took her weekly walk on the ramparts every fine Sunday throughout the year, always going directly after morning service and staying till dinner-time. It was her public place. There she met her acquaintance, heard a little news, talked over the badness of the Portsmouth servants, and wound up her spirits for the six days ensuing. Thither they now went, Mr. Crawford most happy to consider the Miss Prices as his particular charge. And before they had been there long, somehow or other, there was no saying how, Fanny could not have believed it, but he was walking between them, with an arm of each under his, and she did not know how to prevent or put an end to it. It made her uncomfortable for a time, but yet there were enjoyments in the day, and in the view, which would be felt. The day was uncommonly lovely. It was really March, but it was April in its mild air, brisk soft wind and bright sun occasionally clouded for a minute, and everything looked so beautiful under the influence of such a sky, the effects of the shadows pursuing each other on the ships at Spithead and the island beyond, with the ever-varying hues of the sea now at high water, dancing in its glee and dashing against the ramparts with so fine a sound, produced altogether such a combination of charms for Fanny, as made her gradually almost careless of the circumstances under which she felt them. Nay, had she been without his arm, she would soon have known that she needed it, for she wanted strength for a two-hour saunter of this kind, coming, as it generally did, upon a week's previous inactivity. Fanny was beginning to feel the effect of being debarred from her usual regular exercise. She had lost ground as to health since her being in Portsmouth, and but for Mr. Crawford and the beauty of the weather, would soon have been knocked up now. The loveliness of the day and of the view he felt like herself. 
They often stopped with the same sentiment and taste, leaning against the wall some minutes to look and admire, and considering he was not Edmund, Fanny could not but allow that he was sufficiently open to the charms of nature, and very well able to express his admiration. She had a few tender reveries now and then, which she could sometimes take advantage of, to look in her face without detection and the result of these looks was that, though as bewitching as ever, her face was less blooming than it ought to be. She said she was very well, and did not like to be supposed otherwise, but take it all in all, he was convinced that her present residence could not be comfortable, and therefore could not be salutary for her, and he was growing anxious for her being again at Mansfield, where her own happiness, and his in seeing her, must be so much greater. "'You have been here a month, I think,' said he. No, not quite a month. It is only four weeks to-morrow since I left Mansfield." "'You are a most accurate and honest reckoner. I should call that a month.' "'I did not arrive here till Tuesday evening.' "'And it is to be a two-months visit, is not it?' "'Yes. My uncle talked of two months. I suppose it will not be less.' "'And how are you to be conveyed back again? Who comes for you?' "'I do not know. I have heard nothing about it yet from my aunt. Perhaps I may be to stay longer. It may not be convenient for me to be fetched exactly at the two months' end." After a moment's reflection, Mr. Crawford replied, "'I know Mansfield. I know its way. I know its faults towards you. I know the danger of your being so far forgotten, as to have your comforts give way to the imaginary convenience of any single being in the family. I am aware that you may be left here week after week, if Sir Thomas cannot settle everything for coming himself, or sending your aunt's maid for you, without involving the slightest alteration of the arrangements which he may have laid down for the next quarter of a year. This will not do. Two months is an ample allowance. I should think six weeks quite enough. I am considering your sister's health," said he, addressing himself to Susan, which I think the confinement of Portsmouth unfavourable to. She requires constant air and exercise. When you know her as well as I do, I am sure you will agree that she does, and that she ought never to be long banished from the free air, and liberty of the country. If, therefore, turning again to Fanny, you find yourself growing unwell, and any difficulties arise about your returning to Mansfield, without waiting for the two months to be ended, that must not be regarded as of any consequence, if you feel yourself at all less strong or comfortable than usual and will only let my sister know it, give her only the slightest hint, she and I will immediately come down, and take you back to Mansfield. You know the ease and the pleasure with which this would be done. You know all that would be felt on the occasion." Fanny thanked him, but tried to laugh it off. "'I am perfectly serious,' he replied, "'as you perfectly know, and I hope you will not be cruelly concealing any tendency to indisposition. Indeed you shall not. It shall not be in your power, for so long only as you positively say, in every letter to Mary, I am well, and I know you cannot speak or write a falsehood, so long only shall you be considered as well." Fanny thanked him again, but was affected and distressed to a degree that made it impossible for her to say much, or even to be certain of what she ought to say. This was towards the close of their walk. He attended them to the last, and left them only at the door of their own house, when he knew them to be going to dinner, and therefore pretended to be waited for elsewhere. "'I wish you were not so tired,' said he, still detaining Fanny after all the others were in the house. "'I wish I left you in stronger health. Is there anything I can do for you in town? I have half an idea of going into Norfolk again soon. I am not satisfied about Madison. I am sure he still means to impose on me, if possible, and get a cousin of his own into a certain mill which I design for somebody else. I must come to an understanding with him. I must make him know that I will not be tricked on the south side of Everingham any more than on the north, that I will be master of my own property. I was not explicit enough with him before. The mischief such a man does on an estate, both as to the credit of his employer, and the welfare of the poor, is inconceivable. I have a great mind to go back into Norfolk directly, and put everything at once on such a footing as cannot be afterwards swerved from. Madison is a clever fellow. I do not wish to displace him, provided he does not try to displace me. But it would be simple to be duped by a man who has no right of creditor to dupe me, and worse than simple to let him give me a hard-hearted, griping fellow for a tenant, instead of an honest man to whom I have given half a promise already. Would not it be worse than simple? Shall I go? Do you advise it?" I advise? You know very well what is right." Yes. When you give me your opinion, I always know what is right. Your judgment is my rule of right." Oh, no, do not say so. We have all a better guide in ourselves, if we would attend to it, than any other person can be. Good-bye. I wish you a pleasant journey to-morrow. 
Is there nothing I can do for you in town? Nothing. I am much obliged to you. Have you no message for anybody? My love to your sister, if you please. And when you see my cousin, my cousin Edmund, I wish you would be so good as to say that— I suppose I shall soon hear from him. Certainly. And if he is lazy or negligent, I will write his excuses myself. He could say no more, for Fanny would be no longer detained. He pressed her hand, looked at her, and was gone. He went to while away the next three hours as he could with his other acquaintance, till the best dinner that a capital inn afforded was ready for their enjoyment, and she turned into her more simple one immediately. Their general fare bore a very different character, and could he have suspected how many privations, besides that of exercise, she endured in her father's house, he would have wondered that her looks were not much more affected than he found them. She was so little equal to Rebecca's puddings and Rebecca's hashes, brought to table as they all were, with such accompaniments of half-cleaned plates, and not half-cleaned knives and forks, that she was very often constrained to defer her heartiest meal, till she could send her brothers in the evening for biscuits and buns. After being nursed up at Mansfield, it was too late in the day to be hardened at Portsmouth. And though Sir Thomas, had he known all, might have thought his niece in the most promising way of being starved, both mind and body, into a much juster value for Mr. Crawford's good company and good fortune, he would probably have feared to push his experiment farther, lest she might die under the cure. Fanny was out of spirits all the rest of the day. Though tolerably secure of not seeing Mr. Crawford again, she could not help being low. It was parting with somebody of the nature of a friend, and though in one light, glad to have him gone, it seemed as if she was now deserted by everybody. It was a sort of renewed separation from Mansfield, and she could not think of his returning to town, and being frequently with Mary and Edmund, without feeling so near akin to envy as made her hate herself for having them. Her dejection had no abatement from anything passing around her. A friend or two of her father's, as always happened if he was not with them, spent the long, long evening there, and from six o'clock to half-past nine there was little intermission of noise or grog. She was very low. The wonderful improvement which she still fancied in Mr. Crawford was the nearest to administering comfort of anything within the current of her thoughts not considering in how different a circle she had been just seeing him, nor how much might be owing to contrast, she was quite persuaded of his being astonishingly more gentle and regardful of others than formerly. And if in little things, must it not be so in great? So anxious for her health and comfort, so very feeling as he now expressed himself, and really seemed, might not it be fairly supposed that he would not much longer persevere in a suit so distressing to her? End of chapter 42 Chapter 43 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen It was presumed that Mr. Crawford was travelling back to London on the morrow, for nothing more was seen of him at Mr. Price's, and two days afterwards it was a fact ascertained to Fanny by the following letter from his sister, opened and read by her, on another account, with the most anxious curiosity. I have to inform you, my dearest Fanny, that Henry has been down to Portsmouth to see you, that he had a delightful walk with you to the dockyard last Saturday, and one still more to be dwelt on the next day, on the ramparts, when the balmy air, the sparkling sea, and your sweet looks and conversation were all together in the most delicious harmony, and afforded sensations which are to raise ecstasy even in retrospect. This, as well as I understand, is to be the substance of my information. He makes me write, but I do not know what else is to be communicated, except this said visit to Portsmouth, and these two said walks, and his introduction to your family, especially to a fair sister of yours, a fine girl of fifteen, who was of the party on the ramparts, taking her first lesson, I presume, in love. I have not time for writing much, but it would be out of place if I had, for this is to be a mere letter of business, penned for the purpose of conveying necessary information, which could not be delayed without risk of evil. My dear, dear Fanny, if I had you here, how I would talk to you! You should listen to me till you were tired, and advise me till you were tired still more. But it is impossible to put an hundredth part of my great mind on paper, so I will abstain altogether and leave you to guess what you like. I have no news for you. You have politics, of course, and it would be too bad to plague you with the names of people and parties that fill up my time, 
I ought to have sent you an account of your cousin's first party, but I was lazy, and now it is too long ago. Suffice it that everything was just as it ought to be, in a style that many of her connections must have been gratified to witness, and that her own dress and manners did her the greatest credit. My friend Mrs. Fraser is mad for such a house, and it would not make me miserable. I go to Lady Stornoway after Easter. She seems in high spirits and very happy. I fancy Lord S. is very good-humoured and pleasant in his own family, and I do not think him so very ill-looking as I did. At least one sees many worse. He will not do by the side of your cousin Edmund. Of the last-mentioned hero what shall I say? If I avoided his name entirely it would look suspicious. I will say, then, that we have seen him two or three times, and that my friends here are very much struck with his gentlemanlike appearance. Mrs. Fraser, no bad judge, declares she knows but three men in town who have so good a person, height, and air. And I must confess, when he dined here the other day, there were none to compare with him, and we were a party of sixteen. Luckily there is no distinction of dress nowadays to tell tales. But, but, but— Yours affectionately. I had almost forgot. It was Edmund's fault. He gets into my head more than does me good. One very material thing I had to say from Henry and myself. I mean about our taking you back into Northamptonshire. My dear little creature, do not stay at Portsmouth to lose your pretty looks. Those vile sea-breezes are the ruin of beauty and health. My poor aunt always felt affected, if within ten miles of the sea, which the Admiral, of course, never believed, but I know it was so. I am at your service and Henry's at an hour's notice. I should like the scheme, and we would make a little circuit, and show you Everingham in our way, and perhaps you would not mind passing through London, and seeing the inside of St. George's, Hanover Square. Only keep your cousin Edmund from me at such a time. I should not like to be tempted. What a long letter! One word more. Henry, I find, has some idea of going into Norfolk again upon some business that you approve, but this cannot possibly be permitted before the middle of next week. That is, he cannot anyhow be spared till after the fourteenth, for we have a party that evening. The value of a man like Henry on such an occasion is what you can have no conception of. So you must take it upon my word to be inestimable. He will see the Rushworths, which I own I am not sorry for, having a little curiosity, and so I think has he, though he will not acknowledge it. This was a letter to be run through eagerly, to be read deliberately, to supply matter for much reflection, and to leave everything in greater suspense than ever. The only certainty to be drawn from it was that nothing decisive had yet taken place. Edmund had not yet spoken. How Miss Crawford really felt, how she meant to act, or might act, without or against her meaning, whether his importance to her were quite what it had been before the last separation, whether, if lessened, it were likely to lessen more, or to recover itself, were subjects for endless conjecture, and to be thought of on that day and many days to come, without producing any conclusion. The idea that returned the oftenest was that Miss Crawford, after proving herself cooled and staggered by a return to London habits, would yet prove herself in the end too much attached to him to give him up. She would try to be more ambitious than her heart would allow. She would hesitate, she would tease, she would condition, she would require a great deal, but she would finally accept. This was Fanny's most frequent expectation. A house in town! That, she thought, must be impossible. Yet there was no saying what Miss Crawford might not ask. The prospect for her cousin grew worse and worse. The woman who could speak of him, and speak only of his appearance—what an unworthy attachment! To be deriving support from the commendations of Mrs. Fraser, she who had known him intimately half a year! Fanny was ashamed of her. Those parts of the letter which related only to Mr. Crawford and herself touched her in comparison slightly. Whether Mr. Crawford went into Norfolk before or after the fourteenth was certainly no concern of hers, though everything considered, she thought he would go without delay. That Miss Crawford should endeavour to secure a meeting between him and Mrs. Rushworth was in all her worst line of conduct, and grossly unkind and ill-judged, but she hoped he would not be actuated by any such degrading curiosity. He acknowledged no such inducement, and his sister ought to have given him credit for better feelings than her own. She was yet more impatient for another letter from town after receiving this, than she had been before. 
and for a few days was so unsettled by it altogether, by what had come and what might come, that her usual readings and conversation with Susan were much suspended. She could not command her attention as she wished. If Mr. Crawford remembered her message to her cousin, she thought it very likely, most likely, that he would write to her at all events. It would be most consistent with his usual kindness, and till she got rid of this idea, till it gradually wore off by no letters appearing in the course of three or four days more, she was in a most restless, anxious state. At length a something like composure succeeded. Suspense must be submitted to, and must not be allowed to wear her out and make her useless. Time did something, her own exertion something more, and she resumed her attentions to Susan, and again awakened the same interest in them. Susan was growing very fond of her, and though without any of the early delight in books which had been so strong in Fanny, with a disposition much less inclined to sedentary pursuits, or to information for information's sake, she had so strong a desire of not appearing ignorant, as with a good, clear understanding, made her a most attentive, profitable, thankful pupil. Fanny was her oracle. Fanny's explanations and remarks were a most important addition to every essay, or every chapter of history. What Fanny told her of former times dwelt more on her mind than the pages of Goldsmith, and she paid her sister the compliment of preferring her style to that of any printed author. The early habit of reading was wanting. Their conversations, however, were not always on subjects so high as history or morals. Others had their hour, and of lesser matters none returned so often, or remained so long between them, as Mansfield Park, a description of the people, the manners, the amusements, the ways of Mansfield Park. Susan, who had an innate taste for the genteel and well-appointed, was eager to hear, and Fanny could not but indulge herself in dwelling on so beloved a theme. She hoped it was not wrong, though after a time Susan's very great admiration of everything said or done in her uncle's house, and earnest longing to go into Northamptonshire, seemed almost to blame her for exciting feelings which could not be gratified. Poor Susan was very little better fitted for home than her elder sister and as Fanny grew thoroughly to understand this, she began to feel that when her own release from Portsmouth came, her happiness would have a material drawback in leaving Susan behind. That a girl so capable of being made everything good should be left in such hands distressed her more and more. Were she likely to have a home to invite her to, what a blessing it would be! and had it been possible for her to return Mr. Crawford's regard, the probability of his being very far from objecting to such a measure would have been the greatest increase of all her own comforts. She thought he was really good-tempered, and could fancy his entering into a plan of that sort most pleasantly. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Seven weeks of the two months were very nearly gone, when the one letter, the letter from Edmund so long expected, was put into Fanny's hands. As she opened and saw its length, she prepared herself for a minute detail of happiness, and a profusion of love and praise towards the fortunate creature who was now mistress of his fate. These were the contents. Mansfield Park My dear Fanny, excuse me that I have not written before. Crawford told me that you were wishing to hear from me, but I found it impossible to write from London, and persuaded myself that you would understand my silence. Could I have sent a few happy lines, they should not have been wanting, but nothing of that nature was ever in my power. I am returned to Mansfield in a less assured state than when I left it. My hopes are much weaker. You are probably aware of this already. So very fond of you as Miss Crawford is, it is most natural that she should tell you enough of her own feelings to furnish a tolerable guess at mine. I will not be prevented, however, from making my own communication. Our confidences in you need not clash. I ask no questions. There is something soothing in the idea that we have the same friend, and that whatever unhappy differences of opinion may exist between us, we are united in our love of you. It will be a comfort to me to tell you how things now are, and what are my present plans, if plans I can be said to have. I have been returned since Saturday. I was three weeks in London, and saw her, for London, very often. I had every attention from the Frasers that could be reasonably expected. I dare say I was not reasonable in carrying with me the hopes of an intercourse at all like that of Mansfield. It was her manner, however, rather than any unfrequency of meeting. 
Had she been different when I did see her, I should have made no complaint. But from the very first she was altered. My first reception was so unlike what I had hoped, that I had almost resolved on leaving London again directly. I need not particularize. You know the weak side of her character, and may imagine the sentiments and expressions which were torturing me. She was in high spirits, and surrounded by those who were giving all the support of their own bad sense to her too lively mind. I do not like Mrs. Fraser. She is a cold-hearted, vain woman, who has married entirely from convenience, and, though evidently unhappy in her marriage, places her disappointment not to faults of judgment or temper, or disproportion of age, but to her being, after all, less affluent than many of her acquaintance, especially than her sister, Lady Stornoway, and is the determined supporter of everything mercenary and ambitious, provided it be only mercenary and ambitious enough. I look upon her intimacy with those two sisters as the greatest misfortune of her life and mine. They have been leading her astray for years. Could she be detached from them? And sometimes I do not despair of it, for the affection appears to me principally on their side. They are very fond of her, but I am sure she does not love them as she loves you. When I think of her great attachment to you, indeed, and the whole of her judicious, upright conduct as a sister, she appears a very different creature, capable of everything noble, and I am ready to blame myself for a too harsh construction of a playful manner. I cannot give her up, Fanny. She is the only woman in the world whom I could ever think of as a wife. If I did not believe that she had some regard for me, of course I should not say this. But I do believe it. I am convinced that she is not without a decided preference. I have no jealousy of any individual. It is the influence of the fashionable world altogether that I am jealous of. It is the habits of wealth that I fear. Her ideas are not higher than her own fortune may warrant, but they are beyond what our incomes united could authorize. There is comfort, however, even here. I could better bear to lose her because not rich enough than because of my profession. That would only prove her affection not equal to sacrifices, which in fact I am scarcely justified in asking. And if I am refused, that, I think, will be the honest motive. Her prejudices, I trust, are not so strong as they were. You have my thoughts exactly as they arise, my dear Fanny. Perhaps they are sometimes contradictory, but it will not be a less faithful picture of my mind. Having once begun, it is a pleasure to me to tell you all I feel. I cannot give her up. Connected as we already are, and I hope are to be, to give up Mary Crawford, would be to give up the society of some of those most dear to me, to banish myself from the very houses and friends whom, under any other distress, I should turn to for consolation. The loss of Mary I must consider as comprehending the loss of Crawford and of Fanny. Were it a decided thing, an actual refusal, I hope I should know how to bear it, and how to endeavour to weaken her hold on my heart, and in the course of a few years, but I am writing nonsense. Where I refuse, I must bear it. Until I am, I can never cease to try for her. This is the truth. The only question is how. What may be the likeliest means? I have sometimes thought of going to London again after Easter, and sometimes resolved on doing nothing till she returns to Mansfield. Even now she speaks with pleasure of being in Mansfield in June. But June is at a great distance, and I believe I shall write to her. I have nearly determined on explaining myself by letter. To be at an early certainty is a material object. My present state is miserably irksome. Considering everything, I think a letter will be decidedly the best method of explanation. I shall be able to write much that I could not say, and shall be giving her time for reflection before she resolves on her answer. And I am less afraid of the result of reflection than of an immediate hasty impulse. I think I am. My greatest danger would lie in her consulting Mrs. Fraser, and I, at a distance, unable to help my own cause. A letter exposes to all the evil of consultation, and where the mind is anything short of perfect decision, an adviser may, in an unlucky moment, lead it to do what it may afterwards regret. I must think this matter over a little. This long letter, full of my own concerns alone, will be enough to tire even the friendship of a Fanny. The last time I saw Crawford was at Mrs. Fraser's party. I am more and more satisfied with all that I see and hear of him. There is not a shadow of wavering. 
He thoroughly knows his own mind, and acts up to his resolutions an inestimable quality. I could not see him and my eldest sister in the same room without recollecting what you once told me, and I acknowledge that they did not meet as friends. There was marked coolness on her side. They scarcely spoke. I saw him draw back surprised, and I was sorry that Mrs. Rushworth should resent any former supposed slight to Miss Bertram. You will wish to hear my opinion of Maria's degree of comfort as a wife. There is no appearance of unhappiness. I hope they get on pretty well together. I dine twice in Wimpole Street, and might have been there oftener, but it is mortifying to be with Rushworth as a brother. Julia seems to enjoy London exceedingly. I had little enjoyment there, but have less here. We are not a lively party. You are very much wanted. I miss you more than I can express. My mother desires her best love, and hopes to hear from you soon. She talks of you almost every hour, and I am sorry to find how many weeks more she is likely to be without you. My father means to fetch you himself, but it will not be till after Easter, when he has business in town. You are happy at Portsmouth, I hope, but this must not be a yearly visit. I want you at home, that I may have your opinion about Thornton Lacey. I have little heart for extensive improvements till I know that it will ever have a mistress. I think I shall certainly write. It is quite settled that the Grants go to Bath. They leave Mansfield on Monday. I am glad of it. I am not comfortable enough to be fit for anybody, but your aunt seems to feel out of luck that such an article of Mansfield news should fall to my pen instead of hers. Yours ever, my dearest Fanny. I never will, no, I certainly never will wish for a letter again, was Fanny's secret declaration as she finished this. What do they bring but disappointment and sorrow? Not till after Easter. How shall I bear it? And my poor aunt talking of me every hour. Fanny checked the tendency of these thoughts as well as she could, but she was within half a minute of starting the idea that Sir Thomas was quite unkind, both to her aunt and to herself. As for the main subject of the letter, there was nothing in that to soothe irritation. She was almost vexed into displeasure and anger against Edmund. "'There is no good in this delay,' said she. "'Why is not it settled? He is blinded, and nothing will open his eyes, nothing can, after having had truths before him so long in vain. He will marry her, and be poor and miserable. God grant that her influence do not make him cease to be respectable.' She looked over the letter again. "'So very fond of me! Tis nonsense all! She loves nobody but herself and her brother. Her friends leading her astray for years. She is quite as likely to have led them astray. They have all, perhaps, been corrupting one another.' But if they are so much fonder of her than she is of them, she is the less likely to have been hurt, except by their flattery. The only woman in the world whom he could ever think of as a wife. I firmly believe it. It is an attachment to govern his whole life. Accepted or refused, his heart is wedded to her for ever. The loss of Mary I must consider as comprehending the loss of Crawford and Fanny. Edmund, you do not know me. The families would never be connected if you did not connect them. Oh, write, write, finish it at once. Let there be an end of this suspense. Fix, commit, condemn yourself." Such sensations, however, were too near akin to resentment to be long guiding Fanny's soliloquies. She was soon more softened and sorrowful. His warm regard, his kind expressions, his confidential treatment touched her strongly. He was only too good to everybody. It was a letter, in short, which she would not but have had for the world, and which could never be valued enough. This was the end of it. Everybody at all addicted to letter-writing, without having much to say, which will include a large proportion of the female world at least, must feel with Lady Bertram that she was out of luck in having such a capital piece of Mansfield news as the certainty of the Grants going to Bath occur at a time when she could make no advantage of it, and will admit that it must have been very mortifying to her to see it fall to the share of her thankless son, and treat it as concisely as possible at the end of a long letter, instead of having it to spread over the largest part of a page of her own. For though Lady Bertram rather shone, in the epistolary line, having early in her marriage, from the want of other employment, and the circumstance of Sir Thomas's being in Parliament, got into the way of making and keeping correspondence, and formed for herself a very creditable, commonplace, amplifying style, so that a very little matter was enough for her, she could not do entirely without any. 
she must have something to write about, even to her niece, and being so soon to lose all the benefit of Dr. Grant's gouty symptoms and Mrs. Grant's morning calls, it was very hard upon her to be deprived of one of the last epistolary uses she could put them to. There was a rich amends, however, preparing for her. Lady Bertram's hour of good luck came. Within a few days from the receipt of Edmund's letter, Fanny had one from her aunt, beginning thus. "'My dear Fanny, I take up my pen to communicate some very alarming intelligence, which I make no doubt will give you much concern.' This was a great deal better than to have to take up the pen to acquaint her with all the particulars of the Grant's intended journey, for the present intelligence was of a nature to promise occupation for the pen for many days to come, being no less than the dangerous illness of her eldest son, of which they had received notice by express a few hours before. Tom had gone from London with a party of young men to Newmarket, where a neglected fall, and a good deal of drinking, had brought on a fever and when the party broke up, being unable to move, had been left by himself at the house of one of these young men, to the comforts of sickness and solitude, and the attendance only of servants. Instead of soon being well enough to follow his friends, as he had then hoped, his disorder increased considerably, and it was not long before he thought so ill of himself, as to be as ready as his physician to have a letter dispatched to Mansfield. This distressing intelligence, as you may suppose, observed her ladyship, after giving the substance of it, has agitated us exceedingly, and we cannot prevent ourselves from being greatly alarmed and apprehensive for the poor invalid, whose state, Sir Thomas fears, may be very critical. And Edmund kindly proposes attending his brother immediately, but I am happy to add that Sir Thomas will not leave me on this distressing occasion, as it would be too trying for me. We shall greatly miss Edmund in our small circle, but I trust and hope he will find the poor invalid in a less alarming state than might be apprehended, and that he will be able to bring him to Mansfield shortly, which Sir Thomas proposes should be done, and thinks best on every account. And I flatter myself the poor sufferer will soon be able to bear the removal without material inconvenience or injury. As I have little doubt of your feeling for us, my dear Fanny, under these distressing circumstances, I will write again very soon." Fanny's feelings on the occasion were indeed considerably more warm and genuine than her aunt's style of writing. She felt truly for them all. Tom dangerously ill, Edmund gone to attend him, and the sadly small party remaining at Mansfield were cares to shut out every other care, or almost every other. She could just find selfishness enough to wonder whether Edmund had written to Miss Crawford before this summons came, but no sentiment dwelt long with her that was not purely affectionate and disinterestedly anxious. Her aunt did not neglect her. She wrote again and again. They were receiving frequent accounts from Edmund, and these accounts were as regularly transmitted to Fanny, in the same diffuse style, and the same medley of trusts, hopes, and fears, all following and producing each other at haphazard. It was a sort of playing at being frightened. The sufferings which Lady Bertram did not see had little power over her fancy, and she wrote very comfortably about agitation and anxiety and poor invalids till Tom was actually conveyed to Mansfield, and her own eyes had beheld his altered appearance. Then a letter which she had been previously preparing for Fanny was finished in a different style, in the language of real feeling and alarm. Then she wrote as she might have spoken. He is just come, my dear Fanny, and is taken upstairs, and I am so shocked to see him that I do not know what to do. I am sure he has been very ill. Poor Tom, I am quite grieved for him, and very much frightened, and so is Sir Thomas. And how glad I should be if you were here to comfort me! But Sir Thomas hopes he will be better to-morrow, and says we must consider his journey." The real solicitude now awakened in the maternal bosom was not soon over. Tom's extreme impatience to be removed to Mansfield, and experience those comforts of home and family which had been little thought of in uninterrupted health, had probably induced his being conveyed thither too early, as a return of fever came on, and for a week he was in a more alarming state than ever. They were all very seriously frightened. Lady Bertram wrote her daily terrors to her niece, who might now be said to live upon letters, and pass all her time between suffering from that of to-day and looking forward to to-morrow's. 
Without any particular affection for her eldest cousin, her tenderness of heart made her feel that she could not spare him, and the purity of her principles added yet a keener solicitude, when she considered how little useful, how little self-denying his life had apparently been. Susan was her only companion and listener on this, as on more common occasions. Susan was always ready to hear and to sympathise. Nobody else could be interested in so remote an evil as illness, in a family above an hundred miles off, not even Mrs. Price, beyond a brief question or two, if she saw her daughter with a letter in her hand, and now and then the quiet observation of, "'My poor sister Bertram must be in a great deal of trouble.' So long divided and so differently situated, the ties of blood were little more than nothing. An attachment, originally as tranquil as their tempers, was now become a mere name. Mrs. Price did quite as much for Lady Bertram, as Lady Bertram would have done for Mrs. Price. Three or four Prices might have been swept away, any or all except Fanny and William, and Lady Bertram would have thought little about it, or perhaps might have caught from Mrs. Norris's lips the cant of its being a very happy thing, and a great blessing to their poor dear sister Price to have them so well provided for. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen At about the week's end from his return to Mansfield, Tom's immediate danger was over, and he was so far pronounced safe as to make his mother perfectly easy. For being now used to the sight of him in his suffering, helpless state, and hearing only the best, and never thinking beyond what she heard, with no disposition for alarm and no aptitude at a hint, Lady Bertram was the happiest subject in the world for a little medical imposition. The fever was subdued. The fever had been his complaint. Of course he would soon be well again. Lady Bertram could think nothing less, and Fanny shared her aunt's security till she received a few lines from Edmund, written purposely to give her a clearer idea of his brother's situation, and acquaint her with the apprehensions which he and his father had imbibed from the physician, with respect to some strong hectic symptoms, which seemed to seize the frame on the departure of the fever. They judged it best that Lady Bertram should not be harassed by alarms which, it was hoped, would prove unfounded but there was no reason why Fanny should not know the truth. They were apprehensive for his lungs. A very few lines from Edmund showed her the patient and the sick-room in a juster and stronger light than all Lady Bertram's sheets of paper could do. There was hardly any one in the house who might not have described from personal observation better than herself, not one who was not more useful at times to her son. She could do nothing but glide in quietly and look at him, but when able to talk or be talked to, or read to, Edmund was the companion he preferred. His aunt worried him by her cares, and Sir Thomas knew not how to bring down his conversation or his voice to the level of irritation and feebleness. Edmund was all in all. Fanny would certainly believe him so at least, and must find that her estimation of him was higher than ever, when he appeared as the attendant, supporter, cheerer of a suffering brother. It was not only the debility of recent illness to assist. There was also, as she now learnt, nerves much affected, spirits much depressed to calm and raise, and her own imagination added that there must be a mind to be properly guided. The family were not consumptive, and she was more inclined to hope than fear for her cousin, except when she thought of Miss Crawford, but Miss Crawford gave her the idea of being the child of good luck, and to her selfishness and vanity it would be good luck to have Edmund the only son. Even in the sick-chamber the fortunate Mary was not forgotten. Edmund's letter had this postscript. On the subject of my last, I had actually begun a letter when called away by Tom's illness, but I have now changed my mind, and fear to trust the influence of friends. When Tom is better, I shall go." Such was the state of Mansfield, and so it continued with scarcely any change till Easter. A line occasionally added by Edmund to his mother's letter was enough for Fanny's information. Tom's amendment was alarmingly slow. Easter came particularly late this year, as Fanny had most sorrowfully considered, on first learning that she had no chance of leaving Portsmouth till after it. It came, and she had yet heard nothing of her return, nothing even of the going to London which was to precede her return. Her aunt often expressed a wish for her, but there was no notice, no message from the uncle on whom all depended. She supposed he could not yet leave his son, 
but it was a cruel, a terrible delay to her. The end of April was coming on. It would soon be almost three months instead of two that she had been absent from them all, and that her days had been passing in a state of penance, which she loved them too well to hope they would thoroughly understand, and who could yet say when there might be leisure to think of or fetch her. Her eagerness, her impatience, her longings to be with them, were such as to bring a line or two of Cowper's Tyrosinium for ever before her. With what intense desire she wants her home! was continually on her tongue, as the truest description of a yearning which she could not suppose any schoolboy's bosom to feel more keenly. When she had been coming to Portsmouth, she had loved to call it her home, had been fond of saying that she was going home. The word had been very dear to her, and so it still was, but it must be applied to Mansfield. That was now the home. Portsmouth was Portsmouth. Mansfield was home. They had been long so arranged in the indulgence of her secret meditations, and nothing was more consolatory to her than to find her aunt using the same language. "'I cannot but say I much regret your being from home at this distressing time, so very trying to my spirits. I trust and hope, and sincerely wish you may never be absent from home so long again,' were most delightful sentences to her. Still, however, it was her private regale delicacy to her parents made her careful not to betray such a preference of her uncle's house. It was always, when I go back into Northamptonshire, or when I return to Mansfield I shall do so and so. For a great while it was so. But at last the longing grew stronger, it overthrew caution, and she found herself talking of what she should do when she went home before she was aware. She reproached herself, coloured, and looked fearfully towards her father and mother. She need not have been uneasy. There was no sign of displeasure, or even of hearing her. They were perfectly free from any jealousy of Mansfield. She was as welcome to wish herself there as to be there. It was sad to Fanny to lose all the pleasures of spring. She had not known before what pleasure she had to lose in passing March and April in a town. She had not known before how much the beginnings and progress of vegetation had delighted her what animation both of body and mind she had derived from watching the advance of that season which cannot, in spite of its capriciousness, be unlovely, and seeing its increasing beauties, from the earliest flowers, in the warmest divisions of her aunt's garden, to the opening of leaves of her uncle's plantations, and the glory of his woods. To be losing such pleasures was no trifle. To be losing them because she was in the midst of closeness and noise, to have confinement, bad air, bad smells, substituted for liberty, freshness, fragrance, and verdure, was infinitely worse. But even these incitements to regret were feeble, compared with what arose from the conviction of being missed by her best friends, and the longing to be useful to those who were wanting her. Could she have been at home, she might have been of service to every creature in the house. She felt that she must have been of use to all. To all she must have saved some trouble of head or hand, and were it only in supporting the spirits of her Aunt Bertram, keeping her from the evil of solitude, or the still greater evil of a restless officious companion, too apt to be heightening danger in order to enhance her own importance, her being there would have been a general good. She loved to fancy how she could have read to her aunt, how she could have talked to her, and tried at once to make her feel the blessing of what was, and prepare her mind for what might be and how many walks up and down stairs she might have saved her, and how many messages she might have carried. It astonished her that Tom's sisters could be satisfied with remaining in London at such a time, through an illness which had now, under different degrees of danger, lasted several weeks. They might return to Mansfield when they chose, travelling could be no difficulty to them, and she could not comprehend how both could still keep away. If Mrs. Rushworth could imagine any interfering obligations, Julia was certainly able to quit London whenever she chose. It appeared from one of her aunt's letters that Julia had offered to return if wanted, but this was all. It was evident that she would rather remain where she was. Fanny was disposed to think the influence of London very much at war with all respectable attachments. She saw the proof of it in Miss Crawford, as well as in her cousins. Her attachment to Edmund had been respectable the most respectable part of her character. Her friendship for herself had at least been blameless. Where was I the sentiment now? It was so long since Fanny had had any letter from her, that she had some reason to think lightly of the friendship which had been so dwelt on. 
It was weeks since she had heard anything of Miss Crawford, or of her other connections in town, except through Mansfield, and she was beginning to suppose that she might never know whether Mr. Crawford had gone into Norfolk again or not, till they met, and might never hear from his sister any more this spring, when the following letter was received to revive old, and create some new sensations. Forgive me, my dear Fanny, as soon as you can, for my long silence, and behave as if you could forgive me directly. This is my modest request and expectation, for you are so good that I depend upon being treated better than I deserve, and I write now to beg an immediate answer. I want to know the state of things at Mansfield Park, and you, no doubt, are perfectly able to give it. One should be a brute not to feel for the distress they are in, and from what I hear poor Mr. Bertram has a bad chance of ultimate recovery. I thought little of his illness at first. I looked upon him as the sort of person to be made a fuss with, and to make a fuss himself in any trifling disorder, and was chiefly concerned for those who had to nurse him. But now it is confidently asserted that he is really in a decline, that the symptoms are most alarming, and that part of the family at least are aware of it. If it be so, I am sure you must be included in that part, that discerning part, and therefore entreat you to let me know how far I have been rightly informed. I need not say how rejoiced I shall be to hear there has been any mistake, but the report is so prevalent that I confess I cannot help trembling. To have such a fine young man cut off in the flower of his days is most melancholy. Poor Sir Thomas will feel it dreadfully. I really am quite agitated on the subject. Fanny, Fanny, I see you smile and look cunning, but upon my honour I never bribed a physician in my life. Poor young man! If he is to die, there will be two poor young men less in the world, and with a fearless face and bold voice would I say to any one that wealth and consequence could fall into no hands more deserving of them. It was a foolish precipitation last Christmas, but the evil of a few days may be blotted out in part. Varnish and gilding may hide many stains. It will be but the loss of the Esquire after his name. With real affection, Fanny, like mine, more might be overlooked. Write to me by return of post, judge of my anxiety, and do not trifle with it. Tell me the real truth, as you have it from the fountain-head. And now, do not trouble yourself to be ashamed of either my feelings or your own. Believe me, they are not only natural, they are philanthropic and virtuous. I put it to your conscience whether Sir Edmund would not do more good with all the Bertram property than any other possible sir. Had the Grants been at home, I would not have troubled you, but you are now the only one I can apply to for the truth, his sisters not being within my reach. Mrs. R. has been spending the Easter with the Aylmers at Twickenham, as to be sure you know, and is not yet returned, and Julia is with the cousins who live near Bedford Square, but I forgot their name and street. Could I immediately apply to either, however, I should still prefer you, because it strikes me that they have all along been so unwilling to have their own amusements cut up, as to shut their eyes to the truth. I suppose Mrs. R.'s Easter holidays will not last much longer. No doubt they are thorough holidays to her. The Aylmers are pleasant people, and her husband away, she can have nothing but enjoyment. I give her credit for promoting his going dutifully down to Bath to fetch his mother, but how will she and the dowager agree in one house? Henry is not at hand, so I have nothing to say from him. Do not you think Edmund would have been in town again long ago but for this illness? Yours ever, Mary. I had actually begun folding my letter when Henry walked in, but he brings no intelligence to prevent my sending it. Mrs. R. knows a decline is apprehended. He saw her this morning. She returns to Wimpole Street to-day. The old lady is come. Now do not make yourself uneasy with any queer fancies, because he has been spending a few days at Richmond. He does it every spring. Be assured, he cares for nobody but you. At this very moment he is wild to see you, and occupied only in contriving the means for doing so, and making his pleasure conduce to yours. In proof he repeats, and more eagerly, what he said at Portsmouth, about our conveying you home, and I join him in it with all my soul. Dear Fanny, write directly and tell us to come. It will do us all good. He and I can go to the parsonage, you know, and be no trouble to our friends at Mansfield Park. 
it would really be gratifying to see them all again, and a little addition of society might be of infinite use to them. And as to yourself, you must feel yourself to be so wanted there, that you cannot in conscious, conscientious as you are, keep away when you have the means of returning. I have not time or patience to give half Henry's messages. Be satisfied that the spirit of each and every one is unalterable affection." Fanny's disgust at the greater part of this letter, with her extreme reluctance to bring the writer of it and her cousin Edmund together, would have made her, as she felt, incapable of judging impartially whether the concluding offer might be accepted or not. To herself individually it was most tempting to be finding herself perhaps within three days transported to Mansfield, was an image of the greatest felicity, but it would have been a material drawback to be owing such felicity to persons in whose feelings and conduct, at the present moment, she saw so much to condemn. The sister's feelings, the brother's conduct, her cold-hearted ambition, his thoughtless vanity. To have him still the acquaintance, the flirt, perhaps, of Mrs. Rushworth, she was mortified she had thought better of him. Happily, however, she was not left to weigh and decide between opposite inclinations and doubtful notions of right. There was no occasion to determine whether she ought to keep Edmund and Mary asunder or not. She had a rule to apply to, which settled everything. Her awe of her uncle, and her dread of taking a liberty with him, made it instantly plain to her what she had to do. She must absolutely decline the proposal. If he wanted, he would send for her and even to offer an early return, was a presumption which hardly anything would have seemed to justify. She thanked Miss Crawford, but gave a decided negative. Her uncle, she understood, meant to fetch her, and as her cousin's illness had continued so many weeks without her being thought at all necessary, she must suppose her return would be unwelcome at present, and that she should be felt an encumbrance. Her representation of her cousin's state at this time was exactly according to her own belief of it and such as she supposed would convey to the sanguine mind of her correspondent the hope of everything she was wishing for. Edmund would be forgiven for being a clergyman, it seemed, under certain conditions of wealth, and this, she suspected, was all the conquest of prejudice which he was so ready to congratulate himself upon. She had only learnt to think nothing of consequence but money. End of chapter 45 Chapter forty six of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. As Fanny could not doubt that her answer was conveying a real disappointment, she was rather in expectation, from her knowledge of Miss Crawford's temper, of being urged again. And though no second letter arrived for the space of a week, she had still the same feeling when it did come. On receiving it, she could instantly decide on its containing little writing, and was persuaded of its having the air of a letter of haste and business. Its object was unquestionable, and two moments were enough to start the probability of its being merely to give her notice that they should be in Portsmouth that very day, and to throw her into all the agitation of doubting what she ought to do in such a case. If two moments, however, can surround with difficulties, a third can disperse them, and before she had opened the letter, the possibility of Mr. and Miss Crawford's having applied to her uncle and obtained his permission was giving her ease. This was the letter. A most scandalous, ill-natured rumour has just reached me, and I write, dear Fanny, to warn you against giving the least credit to it, should it spread into the country. Depend upon it, there is some mistake, and that a day or two will clear it up, at any rate, that Henry is blameless, and in spite of a moment's etourie, thinks of nobody but you. Say not a word of it, hear nothing, surmise nothing, whisper nothing, till I write again. I am sure it will be all hushed up, and nothing proved but Rushworth's folly. If they are gone, I would lay my life they are only gone to Mansfield Park, and Julia with them. But why would not you let us come for you? I wish you may not repent it. Yours, etc. Fanny stood aghast. As no scandalous, ill-natured rumour had reached her, it was impossible for her to understand much of this strange letter. She could only perceive that it must relate to Wimpole Street and Mr. Crawford, and only conjecture that something very imprudent had just occurred in that quarter to draw the notice of the world, and to excite her jealousy, in Miss Crawford's apprehension, if she heard it. Miss Crawford need not be alarmed for her. She was only sorry for the parties concerned, and for Mansfield, if the report should spread so far. But she hoped it might not. 
If the Rushworths were gone themselves to Mansfield, as was to be inferred from what Miss Crawford said, it was not likely that anything unpleasant should have preceded them, or at least should make any impression. As to Mr. Crawford, she hoped it might give him a knowledge of his own disposition, convince him that he was not capable of being steadily attached to any one woman in the world, and shame him from persisting any longer in addressing herself. It was very strange. She had begun to think he really loved her, and to fancy his affection for her something more than common, and his sister still said that he cared for nobody else. Yet there must have been some marked display of attentions to her cousin, there must have been some strong indiscretion, since her correspondent was not of a sort to regard a slight one. Very uncomfortable she was, and must continue, till she heard from Miss Crawford again. It was impossible to banish the letter from her thoughts, and she could not relieve herself by speaking of it to any human being. Miss Crawford need not have urged secrecy with so much warmth, she might have trusted to her sense of what was due to her cousin. The next day came and brought no second letter. Fanny was disappointed. She could still think of little else all the morning. But when her father came back in the afternoon with the daily newspaper as usual, she was so far from expecting any elucidations through such a channel, that the subject was for a moment out of her head. She was deep in other musing. The remembrance of her first evening in that room, of her father and his newspaper, came across her. No candle was now wanted. The sun was yet an hour and a half above the horizon. She felt that she had, indeed, been three months there, and the sun's rays falling strongly into the parlour, instead of cheering, made her still more melancholy, for sunshine appeared to her a totally different thing in a town and in the country. Here its power was only a glare, a stifling, sickly glare, serving but to bring forward stains and dirt that might otherwise have slept. There was neither health nor gaiety in sunshine in a town. She sat in a blaze of oppressive heat, in a cloud of moving dust, and her eyes could only wander from the walls marked by her father's head, to the table cut and notched by her brother's, where stood the tea-board, never thoroughly cleaned, the cups and saucers wiped in streaks, the milk a mixture of moats floating in thin blue, and the bread and butter growing every minute more greasy than even Rebecca's hands had first produced it. Her father read his newspaper, and her mother lamented over the ragged carpet as usual, while the tea was in preparation, and wished Rebecca would mend it. And Fanny was first roused by his calling out to her, after humphing and considering over a particular paragraph, "'What's the name of your great cousins in town, Fan?' A moment's recollection enabled her to say, "'Rushworth, sir.' "'And don't they live in Wimpole Street?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Then there's the devil to pay among them, that's all. There.' holding out the newspaper to her, "'Much good may such fine relations do you. I don't know what Sir Thomas may think of such matters. He may be too much of the courtier and fine gentleman to like his daughter the less. But by God, if she belonged to me, I'd give her the rope's end as long as I could stand over her. A little flogging for man and woman, too, would be the best way of preventing such things.' Fanny read to herself that it was with infinite concern the newspaper had to announce to the world a matrimonial fracas in the family of Mr. R. of Wimpole Street. The beautiful Mrs. R., whose name had not long been enrolled in the lists of Hymen, and who had promised to become so brilliant a leader in the fashionable world, having quitted her husband's roof in company with the well-known and captivating Mr. C., the intimate friend and associate of Mr. R., and it was not known, even to the editor of the newspaper, whither they were gone. "'It is a mistake, sir,' said Fanny instantly. "'It must be a mistake. It cannot be true. It must mean some other people.' She spoke from the instinctive wish of delaying shame, she spoke with a resolution which sprung from despair, for she spoke what she did not, could not, believe herself. It had been the shock of conviction as she read. The truth rushed on her, and how she could have spoken at all, how she could even have breathed, was afterwards matter of wonder to herself. Mr. Price cared too little about the report to make her much answer. It might be all a lie, he acknowledged, but so many fine ladies were going to the devil nowadays that way, that there was no answering for anybody. "'Indeed, I hope it is not true,' said Mrs. Price plaintively. "'It would be so very shocking. If I have once spoke to Rebecca about that carpet, I am sure I have spoke at least a dozen times. Have not I, Betsy? And it would not be ten minutes' work.' The horror of a mind like Fanny's, as it received the conviction of such guilt, and began to take in some part of the misery that must ensue, can hardly be described. At first it was a sort of stupefaction. 
but every moment was quickening her perception of the horrible evil. She could not doubt. She dared not indulge a hope of the paragraph being false. Miss Crawford's letter, which she had read so often as to make every line her own, was in frightful conformity with it. Her eager defence of her brother, her hope of its being hushed up, her evident agitation, were all of a piece with something very bad. And if there was a woman of character in existence, who could treat as a trifle this sin of the first magnitude, who could try to gloss it over and desire to have it unpunished, she could believe Miss Crawford to be the woman. Now she could see her own mistake as to who were gone, or said to be gone. It was not Mr. and Mrs. Rushworth. It was Mrs. Rushworth and Mr. Crawford. Fanny seemed to herself never to have been shocked before. There was no possibility of rest. The evening passed without a pause of misery. The night was totally sleepless. She passed only from feelings of sickness to shudderings of horror, and from hot fits of fever to cold. The event was so shocking that there were moments even when her heart revolted from it as impossible, when she thought it could not be. A woman married only six months ago, a man professing himself devoted, even engaged, to another, that other her near relation, the whole family, both families, connected as they were by tie upon tie, all friends, all intimate together. It was too horrible a confusion of guilt, too gross a complication of evil, for human nature not in a state of utter barbarism to be capable of. Yet her judgment told her it was so. His unsettled affections, wavering with his vanity, Maria's decided attachment, and no sufficient principle on either side, gave it possibility. Miss Crawford's letter stamped it a fact. What would be the consequence? Whom would it not injure? Whose views might it not affect? Whose peace would it not cut up for ever? Miss Crawford herself? Edmund? But it was dangerous, perhaps, to tread such ground. She confined herself, or tried to confine herself, to the simple indubitable family misery which must envelop all, if it were indeed a matter of certified guilt and public exposure. The mother's sufferings, the father's, there she paused. Julia's, Tom's, Edmund's, there a yet longer pause. They were the two on whom it would fall most horribly. Sir Thomas's parental solicitude and high sense of honour and decorum, Edmund's upright principles, unsuspicious temper, and genuine strength of feeling, made her think it scarcely possible for them to support life and reason under such disgrace. And it appeared to her that as far as this world alone was concerned, the greatest blessing to every one of kindred with Mrs. Rushworth would be instant annihilation. Nothing happened the next day or the next to weaken her terrors. Two posts came in and brought no refutation, public or private. There was no second letter to explain away the first from Miss Crawford. There was no intelligence from Mansfield, though it was now full time for her to hear again from her aunt. This was an evil omen. She had, indeed, scarcely the shadow of a hope to soothe her mind, and was reduced to so low and wan and trembling a condition as no mother not unkind, except Mrs. Price, could have overlooked, when the third day did bring the sickening knock, and a letter was again put into her hands. It bore the London postmark, and came from Edmund. Dear Fanny, you know our present wretchedness. May God support you under your share. We have been here two days, but there is nothing to be done. They cannot be traced. You may not have heard of the last blow, Julia's elopement. She has gone to Scotland with Yates. She left London a few hours before we entered it. At any other time this would have been felt dreadfully. Now it seems nothing, yet it is an heavy aggravation. My father is not overpowered. More cannot be hoped. He is still able to think and act and I write, by his desire, to propose your returning home. He is anxious to get you there for my mother's sake. I shall be at Portsmouth the morning after you receive this, and hope to find you ready to set off for Mansfield. My father wishes you to invite Susan to go with you for a few months. Settle it as you like. Say what is proper. I am sure you will feel such an instance of his kindness at such a moment. Do justice to his meaning, however I may confuse it. You may imagine something of my present state. There is no end of the evil let loose upon us. You will see me early by the mail. Yours, etc. Never had Fanny more wanted a cordial. Never had she felt such a one as this letter contained. To-morrow! To leave Portsmouth to-morrow! 
She was, she felt she was, in the greatest danger of being exquisitely happy, while so many were miserable. The evil which brought such good to her! She dreaded lest she should learn to be insensible of it. To be going so soon, sent for so kindly, sent for as a comfort, and with leave to take Susan, was altogether such a combination of blessings as set her heart in a glow, and for a time seemed to distance every pain, and make her incapable of suitably sharing the distress even of those whose distress she thought of most. Julia's elopement could affect her comparatively but little. She was amazed and shocked, but it could not occupy her, could not dwell on her mind. She was obliged to call herself to think of it, and acknowledge it to be terrible and grievous, or it was escaping her, in the midst of all the agitating, pressing, joyful cares attending this summons to herself. There is nothing like employment, active, indispensable employment, for relieving sorrow. Employment, even melancholy, may dispel melancholy, and her occupations were hopeful. She had so much to do, that not even the horrible story of Mrs. Rushworth, now fixed to the last point of certainty, could affect her as it had done before. She had not time to be miserable. Within twenty-four hours she was hoping to be gone. Her father and mother must be spoken to, Susan prepared, everything got ready. Business followed business. The day was hardly long enough. The happiness she was imparting, too, happiness very little alloyed by the black communication which must briefly precede it, the joyful consent of her father and mother to Susan's going with her, the general satisfaction with which the going of both seemed regarded, and the ecstasy of Susan herself, was all serving to support her spirits. The affliction of the Bertrams was little felt in the family. Mrs. Price talked of her poor sister for a few minutes, but how to find anything to hold Susan's clothes, because Rebecca took away all the boxes and spoilt them, was much more in her thoughts. And as for Susan, now unexpectedly gratified in the first wish of her heart, and knowing nothing personally of those who had sinned, or of those who were sorrowing, if she could help rejoicing from beginning to end, it was as much as ought to be expected from human virtue at fourteen. As nothing was really left for the decision of Mrs. Price, or the good offices of Rebecca, everything was rationally and duly accomplished, and the girls were ready for the morrow. The advantage of much sleep to prepare them for their journey was impossible. The cousin who was travelling towards them could hardly have less than visited their agitated spirits, one all happiness, the other all varying and indescribable perturbation. By eight in the morning Edmund was in the house. The girls heard his entrance from above, and Fanny went down. The idea of immediately seeing him, with the knowledge of what he must be suffering, brought back all her own first feelings. He so near her, and in misery! She was ready to sink as she entered the parlour. He was alone, and met her instantly, and she found herself pressed to his heart with only these words, just articulate. "'My Fanny, my only sister, my only comfort now!' She could say nothing nor for some minutes could he say more. He turned away to recover himself, and when he spoke again, though his voice still faltered, his manner showed the wish of self-command, and the resolution of avoiding any farther allusion. "'Have you breakfasted? When shall you be ready? Does Susan go?' were questions following each other rapidly. His great object was to be off as soon as possible. When Mansfield was considered, time was precious, and the state of his own mind made him find relief only in motion. It was settled that he should order the carriage to the door in half an hour. Fanny answered for their having breakfasted, and being quite ready in half an hour. He had already ate, and declined staying for their meal. He would walk round the ramparts, and join them with the carriage. He was gone again, glad to get away even from Fanny. He looked very ill evidently suffering under violent emotions, which he was determined to suppress. She knew it must be so, but it was terrible to her. The carriage came, and he entered the house again at the same moment, just in time to spend a few minutes with the family, and be a witness, but that he saw nothing, of the tranquil manner in which the daughters were parted with, and just in time to prevent their sitting down to the breakfast-table, which, by dint of much unusual activity, was quite and completely ready as the carriage drove from the door. Fanny's last meal in her father's house was in character with her first. She was dismissed from it as hospitably as she had been welcomed. How her heart swelled with joy and gratitude as she passed the barriers of Portsmouth, and how Susan's face wore its broadest smiles, may be easily conceived. Sitting forwards, however, and screened by her bonnet, those smiles were unseen. 
The journey was likely to be a silent one. Edmund's deep sighs often reached Fanny. Had he been alone with her, his heart must have opened in spite of every resolution. But Susan's presence drove him quite into himself, and his attempts to talk on indifferent subjects could never be long supported. Fanny watched him with never-failing solicitude, and, sometimes catching his eye, received an affectionate smile, which comforted her. But the first day's journey passed without her hearing a word from him on the subjects that were weighing him down. The next morning produced a little more. Just before their setting out from Oxford, while Susan was stationed at a window, in eager observation of the departure of a large family from the inn, the other two were standing by the fire and Edmund, particularly struck by the alteration in Fanny's looks, and from his ignorance of the daily evils of her father's house, attributing an undue share of the change, attributing all to the recent event, took her hand, and said in a low but very expressive tone, "'No wonder. You must feel it. You must suffer. How a man who had once loved could desert you! But yours—your regard was new compared with—Fanny, think of me!' The first division of their journey occupied a long day, and brought them almost knocked up to Oxford. But the second was over at a much earlier hour. They were in the environs of Mansfield long before the usual dinner-time, and as they approached the beloved place, the hearts of both sisters sank a little. Fanny began to dread the meeting with her aunts and Tom, under so dreadful a humiliation and Susan to feel with some anxiety that all her best manners, all her lately acquired knowledge of what was practised here, was on the point of being called into action. Visions of good and ill-breeding, of old vulgarisms and new gentilities, were before her, and she was meditating much upon silver forks, napkins, and finger-glasses. Fanny had been everywhere awake to the difference of the country since February. But when they entered the park, her perceptions and her pleasures were of the keenest sort. It was three months, three full months, since her quitting it, and the change was from winter to summer. Her eye fell everywhere on lawns and plantations of the freshest green, and the trees, though not fully clothed, were in that delightful state, when far the beauty is known to be at hand, and when, while much is actually given to the sight, yet more remains for the imagination. Her enjoyment, however, was for herself alone. Edmund could not share it. She looked at him, but he was leaning back, sunk in a deeper gloom than ever, and with eyes closed, as if the view of cheerfulness oppressed him, and the lovely scenes of home must be shut out. It made her melancholy again, and the knowledge of what must be enduring there, invested even the house, modern, airy, and well situated as it was, with a melancholy aspect. By one of the suffering party within, they were expected with such impatience as she had never known before. Fanny had scarcely passed the solemn-looking servants, when Lady Bertram came from the drawing-room to meet her, came with no indolent step, and falling on her neck, said, "'Dear Fanny, now I shall be comfortable.'" End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen It had been a miserable party, each of the three believing themselves most miserable. Mrs. Norris, however, as most attached to Maria, was really the greatest sufferer. Maria was her first favourite, the dearest of all. The match had been her own contriving, as she had been wont with such pride of heart to feel and say, and this conclusion of it almost overpowered her. She was an altered creature, quieted, stupefied, indifferent to everything that passed. The being left with her sister and nephew, and all the house under her care, had been an advantage entirely thrown away. She had been unable to direct or dictate, or even fancy herself useful. When really touched by affliction, her active powers had been all benumbed, and neither Lady Bertram nor Tom had received from her the smallest support, or attempt at support. She had done no more for them than they had done for each other. They had been all solitary, helpless, and forlorn alike, and now the arrival of the others only established her superiority in wretchedness. Her companions were relieved, but there was no good for her. Edmund was almost as welcome to his brother as Fanny to her aunt, but Mrs. Norris, instead of having comfort from either, was but the more irritated by the sight of the person whom, in the blindness of her anger, she could have charged as the demon of the peace. Had Fanny accepted Mr. Crawford, this could not have happened. Susan, too, was a grievance. 
She had not spirits to notice her in more than a few repulsive looks, but she felt her as a spy and an intruder and an indigent niece, and everything most odious. By her other aunt, Susan was received with quiet kindness. Lady Bertram could not give her much time or many words, but she felt her, as Fanny's sister, to have a claim at Mansfield, and was ready to kiss and like her. And Susan was more than satisfied, for she came perfectly aware that nothing but ill-humour was to be expected from Aunt Norris, and was so provided with happiness, so strong in that best of blessings, an escape from many certain evils, that she could have stood against a great deal more indifference than she met with from the others. She was now left a good deal to herself, to get acquainted with the house and grounds as she could, and spent her days very happily in so doing, while those who might otherwise have attended to her were shut up, or wholly occupied, each with the person quite dependent on them at this time, for everything like comfort. Edmund trying to bury his own feelings in exertions for the relief of his brothers, and Fanny devoted to her aunt Bertram, returning to every former office with more than former zeal, and thinking she could never do enough for one who seemed so much to want her. To talk over the dreadful business with Fanny, talk and lament, was all Lady Bertram's consolation. To be listened to and borne with, and hear the voice of kindness and sympathy in return, was everything that could be done for her. To be otherwise comforted was out of the question. The case admitted of no comfort. Lady Bertram did not think deeply, but guided by Sir Thomas she thought justly on all important points, and she saw therefore in all its enormity what had happened, and neither endeavoured herself nor required Fanny to advise her to think little of guilt and infamy. Her affections were not acute, nor was her mind tenacious. After a time, Fanny found it not impossible to direct her thoughts to other subjects, and revive some interest in the usual occupations. But whenever Lady Bertram was fixed on the event, she could see it only in one light, as comprehending the loss of a daughter, and a disgrace never to be wiped off. Fanny learnt from her all the particulars which had yet transpired. Her aunt was no very methodical narrator, but with the help of some letters to and from Sir Thomas, and what she already knew herself, she could reasonably combine, was soon able to understand quite as much as she wished of the circumstances attending the story. Mrs. Rushworth had gone for the Easter holidays to Twickenham, with a family whom she had just grown intimate with, a family of lively, agreeable manners, and probably of morals and discretion to suit, for to their house Mr. Crawford had constant access at all times. His having been in the same neighbourhood Fanny already knew. Mr. Rushworth had been gone at this time to Bath, to pass a few days with his mother, and bring her back to town and Maria was with these friends without any restraint, without even Julia, for Julia had removed from Wimpole Street two or three weeks before, on a visit to some relations of Sir Thomas, a removal which her father and mother were now disposed to attribute to some view of convenience on Mr. Yates's account. Very soon after the Rushworths returned to Wimpole Street, Sir Thomas had received a letter from an old and most particular friend in London, who, hearing and witnessing a good deal to alarm him in that quarter, wrote to recommend Sir Thomas's coming to London himself, and using his influence with his daughter, to put an end to an intimacy which was already exposing her to unpleasant remarks, and evidently making Mr. Rushworth uneasy. Sir Thomas was preparing to act upon this letter, without communicating its contents to any creature at Mansfield, when it was followed by another, sent express from the same friend, to break to him the almost desperate situation in which affairs then stood with the young people. Mrs. Rushworth had left her husband's house. Mr. Rushworth had been in great anger and distress to him, Mr. Harding, for his advice. Mr. Harding feared there had been at least very flagrant indiscretion. The maid-servant of Mrs. Rushworth, senior, threatened alarmingly. He was doing all in his power to quiet everything, with the hope of Mrs. Rushworth's return, but was so much counteracted in Wimpole Street by the influence of Mr. Rushworth's mother, that the worst consequences might be apprehended. This dreadful communication could not be kept from the rest of the family. Sir Thomas set off, Edmund would go with him, and the others had been left in a state of wretchedness, inferior only to what followed the receipt of the next letters from London. Everything was by that time public beyond a hope. The servant of Mrs. Rushworth the mother had exposure in her power, and supported by her mistress was not to be silenced. 
The two ladies, even in the short time they had been together, had disagreed, and the bitterness of the elder against her daughter-in-law might, perhaps, arise almost as much from the personal disrespect with which she herself had been treated, as from sensibility for her son. However that might be, she was unmanageable. But had she been less obstinate, or of less weight with her son, who was always guided by the last speaker, by the person who could get hold of and shut him up, the case would still have been hopeless, for Mrs. Rushworth did not appear again, and there was every reason to conclude her to be concealed somewhere with Mr. Crawford, who had quitted his uncle's house as for a journey on the very day of her absenting herself. Sir Thomas, however, remained yet a little longer in town, in the hope of discovering and snatching her from Father Vice, though all was lost on the side of character. His present state Fanny could hardly bear to think of. There was but one of his children who was not at this time a source of misery to him. Tom's complaints had been greatly heightened by the shock of his sister's conduct, and his recovery so much thrown back by it, that even Lady Bertram had been struck by the difference, and all her alarms were regularly sent off to her husband, and Julia's elopement, the additional blow which had met him on his arrival in London, though its force had been deadened at the moment, must, she knew, be sorely felt. She saw that it was. His letters expressed how much he deplored it. Under any circumstances it would have been an unwelcome alliance, but to have it so clandestinely formed, and such a period chosen for its completion, placed Julia's feelings in a most unfavourable light, and severely aggravated the folly of her choice. He called it a bad thing, done in the worst manner, and at the worst time, and though Julia was as yet more pardonable than Moriah, as folly than vice, he could not but regard the step she had taken as opening the worst probabilities of a conclusion hereafter like her sister's. Such was his opinion of the set into which she had thrown herself. Fanny felt for him most acutely. He could have no comfort but in Edmund. Every other child must be racking his heart. His displeasure against herself, she trusted, reasoning differently from Mrs. Norris, would now be done away. She should be justified. Mr. Crawford would have fully acquitted her conduct in refusing him. But this, though most material to herself, would be poor consolation to Sir Thomas. Her uncle's displeasure was terrible to her. But what could her justification or her gratitude and attachment do for him? His stay must be on Edmund alone. She was mistaken, however, in supposing that Edmund gave his father no present pain. It was of a much less poignant nature than what the others excited, but Sir Thomas was considering his happiness as very deeply involved in the offence of his sister and friend, cut off by it as he must be from the woman whom he had been pursuing with undoubted attachment and strong probability of success, and who in everything but this despicable brother would have been so eligible a connection. He was aware of what Edmund must be suffering on his own behalf, in addition to all the rest, when they were in town. He had seen or conjectured his feelings, and having reason to think that one interview with Miss Crawford had taken place, from which Edmund derived only increased distress, had been as anxious on that account as on others to get him out of town, and had engaged him in taking Fanny home to her aunt, with a view to his relief and benefit no less than theirs. Fanny was not in the secret of her uncle's feelings, Sir Thomas not in the secret of Miss Crawford's character. Had he been privy to her conversation with his son, he would not have wished her to belong to him, though her twenty thousand pounds had been forty. That Edmund must be forever divided from Miss Crawford did not admit of a doubt with Fanny, and yet, till she knew that he felt the same, her own conviction was insufficient. She thought he did, but she wanted to be assured of it. If he would now speak to her with the unreserve which had sometimes been too much for her before, it would be most consoling. But that, she found, was not to be. She seldom saw him, never alone. He probably avoided being alone with her. What was to be inferred? That his judgment submitted to all his own peculiar and bitter share of this family affliction, but that it was too keenly felt to be a subject of the highest communication. This must be his state. He yielded, but it was with agonies, which did not admit of speech. Long, long would it be ere Miss Crawford's name passed his lips again, or she could hope for a renewal of such confidential intercourse as had been. It was long. They reached Mansfield on Thursday, and it was not till Sunday evening that Edmund began to talk to her on the subject. Sitting with her on Sunday evening, a wet Sunday evening, the very time of all others, when, if a friend is at hand, the heart must be opened, and everything told. 
No one else in the room except his mother, who, after hearing an affecting sermon, had cried herself to sleep. It was impossible not to speak. And so, with the usual beginnings hardly to be traced as to what came first, and the usual declaration that if she would listen to him for a few minutes he should be very brief, and certainly never tax her kindness in the same way again, she need not fear a repetition, it would be a subject prohibited entirely, he entered upon the luxury of relating circumstances and sensations of the first interest to himself, to one of whose affectionate sympathy he was quite convinced. How Fanny listened! with what curiosity and concern, what pain and what delight, how the agitation of his voice was watched, and how carefully her own eyes were fixed on any object but himself, may be imagined. The opening was alarming. He had seen Miss Crawford. He had been invited to see her. He had received a note from Lady Stornoway to beg him to call, and regarding it as what was meant to be the last, last interview of friendship, and investing her with all the feelings of shame and wretchedness which Crawford's sister ought to have known, he had gone to her, in such a state of mind, so softened, so devoted, as made it for a few moments impossible to Fanny's fears that it should be the last. But as he proceeded in his story, these fears were over. She had met him, he said, with a serious— certainly a serious, even an agitated air. But before he had been able to speak one intelligible sentence, she had introduced the subject, in a manner which he owned had shocked him. "'I heard you were in town,' said she. "'I wanted to see you. Let us talk over this sad business. What can equal the folly of our two relations?' I could not answer, but I believe my looks spoke. She felt reproved. Sometimes how quick to feel! With a graver look and voice she then added, I do not mean to defend Henry at your sister's expense." So she began. But how she went on, Fanny, is not fit—is hardly fit to be repeated to you. I cannot recall all her words. I would not dwell upon them if I could. Their substance was great anger at the folly of each. She reprobated her brother's folly, in being drawn on by a woman whom he had never cared for, to do what must lose him the woman he adored but still more the folly of poor Maria, in sacrificing such a situation, plunging into such difficulties under the idea of being really loved by a man who had long ago made his indifference clear. Guess what I must have felt! To hear the woman whom no harsher name than folly given, so voluntarily, so freely, so coolly to canvass it, no reluctance, no horror, no feminine, shall I say, no modest loathings! This is what the world does. For where, Fanny, shall we find a woman whom nature had so richly endowed? Spoilt! Spoilt! After a little reflection he went on with a sort of desperate calmness. I will tell you everything, and then have done for ever. She saw it only as folly, and that folly stamped only by exposure. The want of common discretion, of caution, his going down to Richmond for the whole time of her being at Twickenham, her putting herself in the power of a servant, it was the detection, in short. Oh, Fanny, it was the detection, not the offence, which she reprobated. It was the imprudence which had brought things to extremity, and obliged her brother to give up every dearer plan, in order to fly with her." He stopped. "'And what,' said Fanny, believing herself required to speak, "'what could you say?' "'Nothing. Nothing to be understood. I was like a man stunned. She went on, began to talk of you. Yes. Then she began to talk of you, regretting, as well she might, the loss of such a—there she spoke very rationally. But she always has done justice to you." "'He has thrown away,' said she, "'such a woman as he will never see again. She would have fixed him. She would have made him happy for ever." "'My dearest Fanny, I am giving you, I hope, more pleasure than pain by this retrospect of what might have been, but what never can be now. You do not wish me to be silent? If you do, give me but a look, a word, and I have done." No look or word was given. "'Thank God,' said he. We were all disposed to wonder, but it seems to have been the merciful appointment of Providence that the heart which knew no guile should not suffer. She spoke of you with high praise and warm affection, yet even here there was alloy, a dash of evil, for in the midst of it she could exclaim, "'Why would not she have him? It is all her fault. Simple girl! I shall never forgive her. 
Had she accepted him as she ought, they might now have been on the point of marriage, and Henry would have been too happy and too busy to want any other object. He would have taken no pains to be on terms with Mrs. Rushworth again. It would all have ended in a regular standing flirtation, in yearly meetings at Southerton and Everingham. Could you have believed it possible? But the charm is broken. My eyes are opened." "'Cruel,' said Fanny, "'quite cruel. At such a moment to give way to gaiety, and to speak with lightness, and to you! Absolute cruelty!" "'Cruelty, do you call it? We differ there. No, hers is not a cruel nature. I do not consider her as meaning to wound my feelings. The evil lies yet deeper. In her total ignorance, unsuspiciousness of there being such feelings, in a perversion of mind, which made it natural to her to treat the subject as she did. She was speaking only as she had been used to hear others speak, as she imagined everybody else would speak. Hers are not faults of temper. She would not voluntarily give unnecessary pain to any one, and though I may deceive myself, I cannot but think that, for me, for my feelings, she would— Hers are not faults of principle, Fanny, of blunted delicacy and a corrupted, vitiated mind. Perhaps it is best for me, since it leaves me so little to regret. Not so, however. Gladly would I submit to all the increased pain of losing her, rather than to have to think of her as I do. I told her so." "'Did you?' "'Yes. When I left her, I told her so.' "'How long were you together?' Five and twenty minutes. Well, she went on to say that what remained now to be done was to bring about a marriage between them. She spoke of it, Fanny, with a steadier voice than I can. He was obliged to pause more than once as he continued. "'We must persuade Henry to marry her,' said she and what with honour, and the certainty of having shut himself out for ever from Fanny, I do not despair of it. Fanny he must give up. I do not think that even he could now hope to succeed with one of her stamp, and therefore I hope we may find no insuperable difficulty. My influence, which is not small, shall all go that way, and when once married and properly supported by her own family, people of respectability as they are, she may recover her footing in society to a certain degree. In some circles, we know, she would never be admitted, but with good dinners and large parties there will always be those who will be glad of her acquaintance, and there is, undoubtedly, more liberality and candour on those points than formerly. What I advise is that your father be quiet. Do not let him injure his own cause by interference. Persuade him to let things take their course. If by any officious exertions of his she is induced to leave Henry's protection, there will be much less chance of his marrying her than if she remain with him. I know how he is likely to be influenced. Let Sir Thomas trust to his honour and compassion, and it may all end well. But if he get his daughter away, it will be destroying the chief hold." After repeating this, Edmund was so much affected that Fanny, watching him with silent but most tender concern, was almost sorry that the subject had been entered on at all. It was long before he could speak again. At last, "'Now, Fanny,' said he, "'I shall soon have done. I have told you the substance of all that she said. As soon as I could speak, I replied that I had not supposed it possible, coming in such a state of mind into that house, as I had done, that anything could occur to make me suffer more but that she had been inflicting deeper wounds in almost every sentence. That, though I had, in the course of our acquaintance, been often sensible of some difference in our opinions, on points, too, of some moment, it had not entered my imagination to conceive the difference could be such as she had now proved it. That the manner in which she treated the dreadful crime committed by her brother and my sister, with whom lay the greater seduction I pretended not to say, but the manner in which she spoke of the crime itself, giving it every reproach but the right, considering its ill consequences only as they were to be braved or overborne by a defiance of decency and impudence in wrong, and last of all, and above all, recommending to us a compliance, a compromise, an acquiescence, in the continuance of the sin, on the chance of a marriage which, thinking as I now thought of her brother, should rather be prevented than sought, all this together most grievously convinced me that I had never understood her before, and that as far as related to mind, it had been the creature of my own imagination, not Miss Crawford, that I had been too apt to dwell on for many months past. That perhaps it was best for me, I had less to regret in sacrificing a friendship, feelings, hopes, which must at any rate have been torn from me now. 
and yet that I must and would confess that could I have restored her to what she had appeared to me before, I would infinitely prefer any increase of the pain of parting for the sake of carrying with me the right of tenderness and esteem. This is what I said, the purport of it, but as you may imagine, not spoken so collectedly or methodically as I have repeated it to you. She was astonished, exceedingly astonished, more than astonished. I saw her changed countenance. She turned extremely red. I imagined I saw a mixture of many feelings, a great though short struggle, half a wish of yielding to truths, half a sense of shame, but habit, habit carried it. She would have laughed if she could. It was a sort of laugh, as she answered, A pretty good lecture, upon my word. Was it part of your last sermon? At this rate you will soon reform everybody at Mansfield and Thornton Lacey, and when I hear of you next, it may be as a celebrated preacher in some great society of Methodists, or as a missionary into foreign parts." She tried to speak carelessly, but she was not so careless as she wanted to appear. I only said in reply that from my heart I wished her well, and earnestly hoped that she might soon learn to think more justly, and not owe the most valuable knowledge we could any of us acquire, the knowledge of ourselves and of our duty, to the lessons of affliction, and immediately left the room. I had gone a few steps, Fanny, when I heard the door open behind me. "'Mr. Bertram,' said she. I looked back. "'Mr. Bertram,' said she with a smile but it was a smile ill-suited to the conversation that had passed, a saucy, playful smile, seeming to invite, in order to subdue me. At least, it appeared so to me. I resisted. It was the impulse of the moment to resist, and still walked on. I have since, sometimes, for a moment, regretted that I did not go back. But I know I was right. And such has been the end of our acquaintance. And what an acquaintance has it been! How have I been deceived, equally in brother and sister deceived! I thank you for your patience, Fanny. This has been the greatest relief. And now we will have done." And such was Fanny's dependence on his words, that for five minutes she thought they had done. Then, however, it all came on again, or something very like it, and nothing less than Lady Bertram's rousing thoroughly up could really close such a conversation. Till that happened, they continued to talk of Miss Crawford alone, and how she had attached him, and how delightful nature had made her, and how excellent she would have been had she fallen into good hands earlier. Fanny, now at liberty to speak openly, felt more than justified in adding to his knowledge of her real character by some hint of what his brother's state of health might be supposed to have in her wish for a complete reconciliation. This was not an agreeable intimation. Nature resisted it for a while. It would have been a vast deal pleasanter to have had her more disinterested in her attachment. But his vanity was not of a strength to fight long against reason. He submitted to believe that Tom's illness had influenced her, only reserving for himself this consoling thought, that considering the many counteractions of opposing habits, she had certainly been more attached to him than could have been expected, and for his sake been more near doing right. Fanny thought exactly the same, and they were also quite agreed in their opinion of the lasting effect, the indelible impression, which such a disappointment must make on his mind. Time would undoubtedly abate somewhat of his sufferings, but still it was a sort of thing which he could never get entirely the better of, and as to his ever meeting with any other woman who could, it was too impossible to be named but with indignation. Fanny's friendship was all that he had to cling to. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen Let other pens dwell on guilt and misery. I quit such odious subjects as soon as I can, impatient to restore everybody, not greatly in fault themselves, to tolerable comfort, and to have done with all the rest. My Fanny, indeed, at this very time, I have the satisfaction of knowing, must have been happy, in spite of everything. She must have been a happy creature in spite of all that she felt or thought she felt for the distress of those around her. She had sources of delight that must force their way. She was returned to Mansfield Park. She was useful. She was beloved. She was safe from Mr. Crawford, and when Sir Thomas came back, she had every proof that could be given in his then melancholy state of spirits, of his perfect approbation and increased regard and happy as all this must make her, she would still have been happy without any of it, for Edmund was no longer the dupe of Miss Crawford. It is true that Edmund was very far from happy himself. 
He was suffering from disappointment and regret, grieving over what was, and wishing for what could never be. She knew it was so, and was sorry. But it was with a sorrow so founded on satisfaction, so tending to ease, and so much in harmony with every dearest sensation, that there are few who might not have been glad to exchange their greatest gaiety for it. Sir Thomas, poor Sir Thomas, a parent, and conscious of errors in his own conduct as a parent, was the longest to suffer. He felt that he ought not to have allowed the marriage, that his daughter's sentiments had been sufficiently known to him to render him culpable in authorising it, that in so doing he had sacrificed the right to the expedient, and been governed by motives of selfishness and worldly wisdom. These were reflections that required some time to soften, but time will do almost everything and though little comfort arose on Mrs. Rushworth's side for the misery she had occasioned, comfort was to be found greater than he had supposed in his other children. Julia's match became a less desperate business than he had considered it at first. She was humble and wishing to be forgiven, and Mr. Yates, desirous of being really received into the family, was disposed to look up to him and be guided. He was not very solid, but there was a hope of his becoming less trifling, of his being at least tolerably domestic and quiet. And at any rate, there was comfort in finding his estate rather more, and his debts much less than he had feared, and in being consulted and treated as the friend best worth attending to. There was comfort also in Tom, who gradually regained his health, without regaining the thoughtlessness and selfishness of his previous habits. He was the better for ever for his illness. He had suffered, and he had learned to think, two advantages that he had never known before. And the self-reproach, arising from the deplorable event in Wimpole Street, to which he felt himself accessory, by all the dangerous intimacy of his unjustifiable theatre, made an impression on his mind which, at the age of six and twenty, with no want of sense or good companions, was durable in its happy effects. He became what he ought to be useful to his father, steady and quiet, and not living merely for himself. Here was comfort indeed, and quite as soon as Sir Thomas could place dependence on such sources of good, Edmund was contributing to his father's ease by improvement in the only point in which he had given him pain before—improvement in his spirits. After wandering about and sitting under trees with Fanny all the summer evenings, he had so well talked his mind into submission as to be very tolerably cheerful again. These were the circumstances and the hopes which gradually brought their alleviation to Sir Thomas, deadening his sense of what was lost, and in part reconciling him to himself though the anguish arising from the conviction of his own errors in the education of his daughters was never to be entirely done away. Too late he became aware how unfavourable to the character of any young people must be the totally opposite treatment which Maria and Julia had been always experiencing at home, where the excessive indulgence and flattery of their aunt had been continually contrasted with his own severity. He saw how ill he had judged, in expecting to counteract what was wrong in Mrs. Norris by its reverse in himself clearly saw that he had but increased the evil, by teaching them to repress their spirits in his presence, as to make their real disposition unknown to him, and sending them for all their indulgences to a person who had been able to attach them only by the blindness of her affection and the excess of her praise. Here had been grievous mismanagement, but bad as it was, he gradually grew to feel that it had not been the most direful mistake in his plan of education. Something must have been wanting within, or time would have worn away much of its ill effect. He feared that principle, active principle, had been wanting, that they had never been properly taught to govern their inclinations and tempers by that sense of duty which can alone suffice. They had been instructed theoretically in their religion, but never required to bring it into daily practice. To be distinguished for elegance and accomplishments, the authorised object of their youth, could have had no useful influence that way, no moral effect on the mind. He had meant them to be good, but his cares had been directed to the understanding and manners, not the disposition, and of the necessity of self-denial and humility he feared they had never heard from any lips that could profit them. Bitterly did he deplore a deficiency which now he could scarcely comprehend to have been possible. 
Wretchedly did he feel that with all the cost and care of an anxious and expensive education, he had brought up his daughters, without their understanding their first duties, or his being acquainted with their character and temper. The high spirit and strong passions of Mrs. Rushworth especially, were made known to him only in their sad result. She was not to be prevailed on to leave Mr. Crawford. She hoped to marry him, and they continued together till she was obliged to be convinced that such hope was vain, and till the disappointment and wretchedness arising from the conviction rendered her temper so bad, and her feelings for him so like hatred, as to make them for a while each other's punishment, and then induce a voluntary separation. She had lived with him to be reproached as the ruin of all his happiness in Fanny, and carried away no better consolation in leaving him than that she had divided them. What can exceed the misery of such a mind in such a situation? Mr. Rushworth had no difficulty in procuring a divorce, and so ended a marriage contracted under such circumstances as to make any better end the effect of good luck not to be reckoned on. She had despised him, and loved another, and he had been very much aware that it was so. The indignities of stupidity, and the disappointments of selfish passion, can excite little pity. His punishment followed his conduct, as did a deeper punishment, the deeper guilt of his wife. He was released from the engagement to be mortified and unhappy, till some other pretty girl could attract him into matrimony again, and he might set forward on a second, and it is to be hoped, more prosperous trial of the state, if duped, to be duped at least with good humour and good luck, while she must withdraw with infinitely stronger feelings to a retirement and reproach which could allow no second spring of hope or character. Where she could be placed, became a subject of most melancholy and momentous consultation. Mrs. Norris, whose attachment seemed to augment with the demerits of her niece, would have had her received at home, and countenanced by them all. Sir Thomas would not hear of it, and Mrs. Norris's anger against Fanny was so much the greater, from considering her residence there as the motive. She persisted in placing his scruples to her account, though Sir Thomas very solemnly assured her, that had there been no young woman in question, had there been no young person of either sex belonging to him to be endangered by the society, or hurt by the character of Mrs. Rushworth, he would never have offered so great an insult to the neighbourhood, as to expect it to notice her. As a daughter, he hoped a penitent one, she should be protected by him, and secured in every comfort, and supported by every encouragement to do right, which their relative situations admitted. But farther than that he would not go. Maria had destroyed her own character, and he would not, by a vain attempt to restore what never could be restored, be affording his sanction to vice, or in seeking to lessen its disgrace, be anywise accessory to introducing such misery in another man's family, as he had known himself. It ended in Mrs. Norris's resolving to quit Mansfield, and devote herself to her unfortunate Maria, and in an establishment being formed for them in another country, remote and private, where shut up together with little society, on one side no affection, on the other no judgment, it may be reasonably supposed that their tempers became their mutual punishment. Mrs. Norris's removal from Mansfield was the great supplementary comfort of Sir Thomas's life. His opinion of her had been sinking from the day of his return from Antigua. In every transaction together from that period, in their daily intercourse, in business or in chat, she had been regularly losing ground in his esteem, and convincing him that either time had done her much disservice, or that he had considerably overrated her sense, and wonderfully borne with her manners before. He had felt her as an hourly evil, which was so much the worse, as there seemed no chance of its ceasing but with life, she seemed a part of himself, that must be borne for ever. To be relieved from her, therefore, was so great a felicity, that had she not left bitter remembrances behind her, there might have been danger of his learning almost to approve the evil which produced such a good. She was regretted by no one at Mansfield. She had never been able to attach even those she loved best, and since Mrs. Rushworth's elopement, her temper had been in a state of such irritation as to make her everywhere tormenting. Not even Fanny had tears for Aunt Norris not even when she was gone for ever. 
That Julia escaped better than Maria was owing in some measure to a favourable difference of disposition and circumstance, but in a greater to her having been less the darling of that very aunt, less flattered and less spoilt. Her beauty and acquirements had held but a second place. She had been always used to think herself a little inferior to Maria. Her temper was naturally the easiest of the two, her feelings, though quick, were more controllable, and education had not given her so very hurtful a degree of self-consequence. She had submitted the best to the disappointment in Henry Crawford. After the first bitterness of the conviction of being slighted was over, she had been tolerably soon in a fair way of not thinking of him again. And when the acquaintance was renewed in town, and Mr. Rushworth's house became Crawford's object, she had had the merit of withdrawing herself from it, and of choosing that time to pay a visit to her other friends, in order to secure herself from being again too much attracted. This had been her motive in going to her cousin's. Mr. Yates's convenience had had nothing to do with it. She had been allowing his attention some time, but with very little idea of ever accepting him and had not her sister's conduct burst forth as it did, and her increased dread of her father and of home on that event, imagining its certain consequence to herself would be greater severity and restraint, made her hastily resolve on avoiding such immediate horrors at all risks, it is probable that Mr. Yates would never have succeeded. She had not eloped with any worse feelings than those of selfish alarm. It had appeared to her the only thing to be done. Maria's guilt had induced Julia's folly. Henry Crawford, ruined by early independence and bad domestic example, indulged in the freaks of a cold-blooded vanity a little too long. Once it had, by an opening undesigned and unmerited, led him into the way of happiness. Could he have been satisfied with the conquest of one amiable woman's affections? Could he have found sufficient exultation in overcoming the reluctance, in working himself into the esteem and tenderness of Fanny Price, there would have been every probability of success and felicity for him. His affection had already done something. Her influence over him had already given him some influence over her. Would he have deserved more, there can be no doubt that more would have been obtained especially when that marriage had taken place, which would have given him the assistance of her conscience in subduing her first inclination, and brought them very often together. Would he have persevered, and uprightly, Fanny must have been his reward, and a reward very voluntarily bestowed, within a reasonable period from Edmund's marrying Mary. Had he done as he intended, and as he knew he ought, by going down to Everingham after his return from Portsmouth, he might have been deciding his own happy destiny. But he was pressed to stay for Mrs. Fraser's party. His staying was made of flattering consequence, and he was to meet Mrs. Rushworth there. Curiosity and vanity were both engaged, and the temptation of immediate pleasure was too strong for a mind unused to make any sacrifice to right. He resolved to defer his Norfolk journey, resolved that writing should answer the purpose of it, or that its purpose was unimportant, and stayed. He saw Mrs. Rushworth, was received by her with a coldness which ought to have been repulsive, and have established apparent indifference between them for ever. But he was mortified. He could not bear to be thrown off by the woman whose smiles had been so wholly at his command. He must exert himself to subdue so proud a display of resentment. It was anger on Fanny's account. He must get the better of it, and make Mrs. Rushworth Maria Bertram again, in her treatment of himself. In this spirit he began the attack, and by animated perseverance had soon re-established the sort of familiar intercourse, of gallantry, of flirtation which bounded his views, but in triumphing over the discretion which, though beginning in anger, might have saved them both, he had put himself in the power of feelings on her side more strong than he had supposed. She loved him. There was no withdrawing attentions avowedly dear to her. He was entangled by his own vanity, with as little excuse of love as possible, and without the smallest inconstancy of mind towards her cousin. To keep Fanny and the Bertrams from a knowledge of what was passing became his first object. Secrecy could not have been more desirable for Mrs. Rushworth's credit than he felt it for his own. When he returned from Richmond, he would have been glad to see Mrs. Rushworth no more. All that followed was the result of her imprudence, and he went off with her at last, because he could not help it. 
regretting Fanny even at the moment, but regretting her infinitely more, when all the bustle of the intrigue was over, and a very few months had taught him, by the force of contrast, to place a yet higher value on the sweetness of her temper, the purity of her mind, and the excellence of her principles. That punishment, the public punishment of disgrace, should in a just measure attend his share of the offence, is, we know, not one of the barriers which society gives to virtue. In this world, the penalty is less equal than could be wished. But without presuming to look forward to a juster appointment hereafter, we may fairly consider a man of sense like Henry Crawford to be providing for himself no small portion of vexation and regret vexation that must rise sometimes to self-reproach, and regret to wretchedness, in having so requited hospitality, so injured family peace, so forfeited his best, most estimable and endeared acquaintance, and so lost the woman whom he had rationally as well as passionately loved. After what had passed to wound and alienate the two families, the continuance of the Bertrams and Grants in such close neighbourhood would have been most distressing. But the absence of the latter, for some months purposely lengthened, ended very fortunately in the necessity, or at least the practicability, of a permanent removal. Dr. Grant, through an interest on which he had almost ceased to form hopes, succeeded to a stall in Westminster, which, as affording an occasion for leaving Mansfield, an excuse for residence in London, and an increase of income to answer the expenses of the change, was highly acceptable to those who went, and those who stayed. Mrs. Grant, with a temper to love and be loved, must have gone with some regret, from the scenes and people she had been used to. But the same happiness of disposition must in any place and any society secure her a great deal to enjoy. And she had again a home to offer Mary. And Mary had had enough of her own friends, enough of vanity, ambition, love, and disappointment, in the course of the last half-year, to be in need of the true kindness of her sister's heart, and the rational tranquillity of her ways. They lived together. And when Dr. Grant had brought on apoplexy and death, by three great institutionary dinners in one week, they still lived together. For Mary, though perfectly resolved against ever attaching herself to a younger brother again, was long in finding among the dashing representatives, or idle heir-apparents who were at the command of her beauty and her twenty thousand pounds, any one who could satisfy the better taste she had acquired at Mansfield, whose character and manners could authorise a hope of the domestic happiness she had there learnt to estimate, or put Edmund Bertram sufficiently out of her head. Edmund had greatly the advantage of her in this respect. He had not to wait and wish with vacant affections, for an object worthy to succeed her in them. Scarcely had he done regretting Mary Crawford, and observing to Fanny how impossible it was that he should ever meet with such another woman, before it began to strike him whether a very different kind of woman might not do just as well, or a great deal better whether Fanny herself were not growing as dear, as important to him in all her smiles and all her ways, as Mary Crawford had ever been, and whether it might not be a possible and hopeful undertaking to persuade her that her warm and sisterly regard for him would be foundation enough for wedded love. I purposely abstain from dates on this occasion, that every one may be at liberty to fix their own, aware that the cure of unconquerable passions, and the transfer of unchanging attachments, must vary much as to time in different people. I only entreat everybody to believe that exactly at the time when it was quite natural that it should be so, and not a week earlier, did Edmund cease to care about Miss Crawford, and become as anxious to marry Fanny as Fanny herself could desire. With such a regard for her indeed, as his had long been, a regard founded on the most endearing claims of innocence and helplessness, and completed by every recommendation of growing worth, what could be more natural than the change? Loving, guiding, protecting her, as he had been doing ever since her being ten years old, her mind in so great a degree formed by his care, and her comfort depending on his kindness, an object to him of such close and peculiar interest, dearer by all his own importance with her, than any one else at Mansfield, what was there now to add, but that he should learn to prefer soft light eyes to sparkling dark ones? And being always with her, 
and always talking confidentially, and his feelings exactly in that favourable state which a recent disappointment gives, those soft light eyes could not be very long in obtaining the pre-eminence. Having once set out, and felt that he had done so, on this road to happiness, there was nothing on the side of prudence to stop him, or make his progress slow. No doubts of her deserving, no fears from opposition of taste, no need of drawing new hopes of happiness from dissimilarity of temper. Her mind, disposition, opinions, and habits wanted no half-concealment, no self-deception on the present, no reliance on future improvement. Even in the midst of his late infatuation, he had acknowledged Fanny's mental superiority. What must be his sense of it now, therefore? She was, of course, only too good for him. But as nobody minds having what is too good for them, he was very steadily earnest, in the pursuit of the blessing, and it was not possible that encouragement from her should be long wanting. Timid, anxious, doubting as she was, it was still impossible that such tenderness as hers should not, at times, hold out the strongest hope of success, though it remained for a later period to tell him the whole delightful and astonishing truth. His happiness in knowing himself to have been so long the beloved of such a heart, must have been great enough to warrant any strength of language in which he could clothe it to her or to himself. It must have been a delightful happiness. But there was happiness elsewhere which no description can reach. Let no one presume to give the feelings of a young woman on receiving the assurance of that affection of which she has scarcely allowed herself to entertain a hope. Their own inclinations ascertained, there were no difficulties behind, no drawback of poverty or parent. It was a match which Sir Thomas's wishes had even forestalled. Sick of ambitious and mercenary connections, prizing more and more the sterling good of principle and temper, and chiefly anxious to bind by the strongest securities all that remained to him of domestic felicity, he had pondered with genuine satisfaction on the more than possibility of the two young friends finding their natural consolation in each other, for all that had occurred of disappointment to either and the joyful consent which met Edmund's application, the high sense of having realised a great acquisition in the promise of Fanny for a daughter, formed just such a contrast with his early opinion on the subject, when the poor little girl's coming had been first agitated, as time is for ever producing between the plans and decisions of mortals for their own instruction and their neighbour's entertainment. Fanny was indeed the daughter that he wanted. His charitable kindness had been rearing a prime comfort for himself. His liberality had a rich repayment, and the general goodness of his intentions by her deserved it. He might have made her childhood happier, but it had been an error of judgment only, which had given him the appearance of harshness, and deprived him of her early love. And now, on really knowing each other, their mutual attachment became very strong. After settling her at Thornton Lacey with every kind attention to her comfort, the object of almost every day was to see her there, or to get her away from it. Selfishly dear as she had been to Lady Bertram, she could not be parted with willingly by her. No happiness of son or niece could make her wish the marriage. But it was possible to part with her, because Susan remained to supply her place. Susan became the stationary niece, delighted to be so, and equally well adapted for it by a readiness of mind, and an inclination for usefulness, as Fanny had been by sweetness of temper, and strong feelings of gratitude. Susan could never be spared, first as a comfort to Fanny, then as an auxiliary, and last as her substitute. She was established at Mansfield, with every appearance of equal permanency. Her more fearless disposition and happier nerves made everything easy to her there. With quickness in understanding the tempers of those she had to deal with, and no natural timidity to restrain any consequent wishes, she was soon welcome and useful to all. And after Fanny's removal, succeeded so naturally to her influence over the hourly comfort of her aunt, as gradually to become, perhaps, the most beloved of the two. In her usefulness, in Fanny's excellence, in William's continued good conduct and rising fame, and in the general well-doing and success of the other members of the family, all assisting to advance each other, and doing credit to his countenance and aid, Sir Thomas saw repeated, and for ever repeated reason to rejoice in what he had done for them all, and acknowledge the advantages of early hardship and discipline, and the consciousness of being born to struggle and endure. 
With so much true merit and true love, and no want of fortune or friends, the happiness of the married cousins must appear as secure as earthly happiness can be. Equally formed for domestic life, and attached to country pleasures, their home was the home of affection and comfort. And to complete the picture of good, the acquisition of Mansfield living, by the death of Dr. Grant, occurred just after they had been married long enough to begin to want an increase of income, and feel their distance from the paternal abode an inconvenience. On that event they removed to Mansfield, and the parsonage there, which under each of its two former owners Fanny had never been able to approach but with some painful sensation of restraint or alarm, soon grew as dear to her heart, and as thoroughly perfect in her eyes, as everything else within the view and patronage of Mansfield Park had long been. End of chapter 48 End of Mansfield Park by Jane Austen